The Fredorian Destiny, Book Two of the Everin Chronicles, written by Adair Hart, narrated by Michael Pauley. The Story So Far Dr. Albert Snowden and his niece, Emily, along with Jay Bierman and Sanjay Chandrakar, were abducted by an alien race known as the Crotovore while driving at night on a lone stretch of highway outside Columbus, Ohio. The Crotovore had been jumping through space-time rifts, abducting apex predators and sticking them in virtual simulations, and Dr. Snowden and the others were no exception. When the Crotovore ship sustained damage prior to their last rift jump, the virtual simulations powered down, and the apex predators were set free to roam the ship. Of the four humans, only Dr. Snowden and Emily were visited by a space and time traveling being known as Everin before the virtual simulation powered down. Once they were all out of the virtual simulation, Everin planned to take them to his ship. In addition to having to deal with the Apex Predators on the loose, they had to contend with a space mercenary group known as the Blood Boars. The Blood Boars had landed on the Crotovore ship in search of salvage opportunities and had noticed Everin's ship. There were some casualties. Sanjay was killed by one of the Blood Boars. Jay lost his arm to another Blood Boar. Everin was eventually able to get Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Jay to his ship. Jay remained on board for a month to regenerate his arm and was then dropped off back on Earth. Dr. Snowden and Emily were dropped off on Earth as well, with the promise of a visit from Everin three months later. This book takes place on Everin's return. Everin's Technology Torvada His ship that can travel through time and space Universal Interface Card, UIC a credit card sized device carried on his belt that allows access to any technological system. Augmented Reality Interface, ARI, an interface that only he can see around him. Utility Handle, a hilt like device carried on his belt that can extend morphable matter in any shape, typically extended into a baton or staff. Illumination Orbs, small orbs on his belt that provide lighting and can hover. Projection Orb, an orb that allows projections to be sent to it from remote sources, such as Everin's ring or the Torvada. Ring, a ring that can provide holographic projection and also scan. Prologue Everin must die. The thought echoed in Ciros's mind as he gazed out a shielded window on his ship. He had hunted Everin for thousands of years, and Everin always seemed to be one step ahead of him. With a clenched jaw and bald fists, he vowed Everin would pay for killing his wife and children, and for the genocide of his people. Ciros was a well-built, white-skinned, pale humanoid, wearing a black, lightly armored suit that had silver lines running over it. His slicked back silver hair appeared immobile in its presentation. He was the founder of Ciros Industries, a city-building corporation that specialized in getting new member civilizations of the Kriegen Star Empire up to speed on the latest city designs and technology. Some planets just wanted to advance by themselves. Others went in completely and traded future stocks in their industries for it. Ciro's Industries replication technology and ownership of a powerful resource allocation company were a perfect marriage. Ciro's exhaled slowly as he looked down at the planet. Hydralis was one of those civilizations that wanted to jump right in. Today was the final negotiation. He mused about his good fortune in finding them. The Hydralins were still low-tech but possessed a breathtaking capacity for mathematics. He knew they were a young and information-hungry race and would be willing to give up some future shares of whatever they decided to pursue in exchange for advancement now. What the Hydralins did not know 
was that he built the corporation to fund his efforts to track Everin across the vast swath of the Kriegan Star Empire. A soft beep rang out. Ciro's turned to his desk and saw a notification light blinking. He ran a hand through his hair as he sat down at his chair. It was an encrypted message. Placing his hand on the biometric scanner on his desk caused a light green glow to envelop his hand, and after a moment, he removed it. He looked down at his hand and interacted with a small menu that displayed on the bottom of his palm. A screen appeared on the upper part. The message decrypted and showed it was from the Bounty Hunters Guild on Kriegus, the current homeworld of the Kriegan Star Empire. His heartbeat ramped up as he read the message. It was short and read, Location, Kriegus, Bounty, Everin, Dr. Albert Snowden, Emily Snowden, Status, Procurement in Progress, Hunter, Creole Jewel. He narrowed his eyes and spun around in his chair to face the window. A wave of anger and excitement shot through him, making him shudder. The noble Everin. The great Dr. Snowden. The heroic Emily. One thought emblazoned itself on his mind. Revenge. Chapter 1 Everin was coming today. Dr. Snowden relaxed in his recliner and stared at the ceiling. It was almost 6 p.m. His nerves pulsated from all the excitement. The abduction experience was still fresh in his mind, even though it was three months ago. There were a lot of unanswered questions he wanted to ask Everin. He had wrestled with the experience in his mind over and over. Some days he did not think it actually happened and then he would see a non-human at work or out on the street. At least he was now sleeping better, but he was still adjusting to the new reality he was in. The smell of a warm dinner caressed his nose. His attention turned to Emily as she bounded into the living room. She had been a whirlwind of activity in the kitchen while making dinner. He had tried to help, but she kicked him out. Uncle Albert, are you trying to take a nap? Dr. Snowden grinned. I couldn't even if I wanted to. Just sitting here thinking things through is all. He will come. Stop worrying. Can you set the table? Asked Emily with a smile. Dr. Snowden smirked. Sure. As long as you don't kick me out again. Emily put a hand on her hip and stared at Dr. Snowden. All right, all right, I'm moving said Dr. Snowden. He stood and then followed Emily into the kitchen. It did not take him long to set the table, and once done, he sat down at his usual spot and began bouncing his right knee. Uncle Albert, you're shaking the house. Dr. Snowden sighed as he extended his legs and crossed his arms. He wished he were as calm as Emily was. She took the abduction hard for the first few weeks back. Now it seemed like it did not even register with her. She had moved on and was enjoying life again. The knocks echoed out from the curtain-covered sliding glass doors behind him. His heartbeat raced as he jumped out of his chair and turned around. A big smile crept onto his face as he peeked out the side of the curtains and saw Everin standing on the other side. Emily, he's here! He pushed the curtains to the side, unlocked the doors, and slid them open. Everin! Everin moved his head back and smiled at Dr. Snowden while extending his hand. Dr. Snowden, how are you doing? Dr. Snowden shook Everin's hand with gusto and gestured for Everin to come in. He had missed the somewhat emotionally distant voice of Everin. Much better now that you're here. Come in. Come in. Everin nodded at Dr. Snowden and stepped into the dining room. He looked around and focused on Emily. Everin, it's so good to see you, said Emily, as she rushed over and gave Everin a bear hug. Everin half grinned as Emily released her grip. Likewise, you both appear to be in good health, and it smells delicious in here. Dr. Snowden closed the door behind Everin and gestured for him to have a seat at the table. 
Please sit down. We're just about to eat. Everin slid out the chair nearest the glass doors and sat. He eased back into his chair and laced his fingers. Dr. Snowden noted that Everin's outfit was slightly different. The forearm pieces were bigger and more complex looking. There was also a small device mounted on the top of both his shoulders. Everin's hair still looked like it was sculpted and unmoving. Dr. Snowden went into the kitchen and helped Emily bring over the various bowls of food and pitchers to the table. After the table was filled, he and Emily sat down. Everin looked at the feast before him. You must have spent a lot of time on this. Uncle Albert at least set the table, said Emily. She took Everin's plate and filled it up with a heaping of food. She placed it before Everin and then poured iced tea into his glass. Feel free to begin. Everin nodded and then took a bite of the meatloaf. He closed his eyes and hummed. You outdid yourself, Emily. This is fantastic. He wagged his finger in the air. There is a hint of spice to it. Thanks. Ever since the abduction, we've been craving spicy food, said Emily. Interesting, said Everin, as he narrowed his eyes and chewed slower. Dr. Snowden furrowed his eyebrows and tilted his head. You know, I never saw you eat or drink anything on the Crotovor ship. I do not require sustenance. That does not mean I cannot smell or taste, however. I do enjoy a good meal. Emily glanced at Dr. Snowden, then back at Everin. Well, the meatloaf is actually Uncle Albert's recipe with a bit of a recent twist, believe it or not. He was just too nervous to be useful in the kitchen today. Dr. Snowden snorted. Everin leaned forward and scrutinized Dr. Snowden. You are troubled. Dr. Snowden filled up his plate while glancing at Everin. I'd be lying if I said it's been easy these last three months. I have so many questions to ask you. I'm still troubled by the whole thing. Well then, it is a good thing I came when I did. We're both glad you're here, said Emily, as she took a sip of her iced tea. She scanned the room. Where's V? Everin pointed up and to the left. V shimmered into view. Hello, Dr. Snowden and Emily. It is great to see you two again, said V. Dr. Snowden jerked his head back. V, you sound different. Everin has upgraded my voice synthesizer. It has slightly less of a digital rasp and slightly more of a masculine human tone. Jay helped me to select it. Everin has also expanded my social routines. I now have a flexible arm that can be extended as needed in this mode, and my body mode has been upgraded as well. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened. Wow, that's quite a few changes. How is Jay? Everin laced his fingers as he relaxed back into his chair. We will get to that shortly. I updated V's media database with every type of media from Earth's history I could find. The arm was added based on the events on the Crotovore ship. The arm ends in a four-pronged claw, so he can now carry small objects, like my Universal Interface Card or UIC, as needed. He has changed significantly. However, there are some kinks I need to work out, especially the slaying routines. He tends to get them mixed up even though the data is correct. I apologize for my kinkiness, said V. Dr. Snowden and Emily laughed. V's lights dimmed for a moment. I see. I used it in one context, but it was interpreted in another. Oh, he didn't mean anything by it, said Dr. Snowden as he extended his hand toward V. V's lights brightened. It is quite okay. Well, I love your new upgrades, said Emily. V's lights brightened even more. Thank you, Emily. Everin shook his head and half smiled while picking up his fork. I have a few things to discuss with you both. Before I do, though, how has your experience been these last three months? Dr. Snowden dipped his head and glanced at Emily, then at Everin. Well... The biggest issue for both of us, he said, 
waving his finger between himself and Emily, deals with these virtual simulation memories. Although we were only in there for three weeks, the virtual simulation put a year's worth of memories in our heads. Will those memories ever fade away now that we are no longer in there? Like, maybe the nanobots will remove them or something. Everin narrowed his eyes for a moment. I am afraid not. They are real memories. You will always have them. Have they caused either of you any issues? He took a bite off his plate. Emily looked down as she shifted on her chair and then sighed. Mine was right after we got back. She looked up at Everin. It happened on the quad at my college. I saw Jennifer, my girlfriend in the virtual simulation. I walked up to her and put my arm around her, and then kissed her on the neck. She turned around in surprise and pushed me away. She then walked away, looking back every now and then in disgust at me. I realized then that I had a false memory. Dr. Snowden recalled when Emily came home that day. She had been devastated. He had met Jennifer in the virtual simulation, and she and Emily were a good couple. Almost too good. Although the situation happened immediately after they had come back, it still haunted Emily. He could see it in her eyes. Apparently, in the real world, Jennifer had a boyfriend. Emily not only had to suffer the clash of memories, but had to deal with the social ramifications from the event. He had tried to console her but he knew it was something she would need to resolve herself. This was the first time since that event that she had mentioned Jennifer, so maybe opening up to Everin about it was therapeutic for her. Everin put his hand on his chin. I see. I am sorry to hear you had to deal with that. As time progresses, the real-world memories will take precedence. Emily's eyes dulled as she took a bite from her plate. I assume you have had a similar experience, asked Everin, tilting his head toward Dr. Snowden. Dr. Snowden nodded. I did, but it didn't involve another woman. Mine dealt with my close friend, Dr. Bryson. Ah, I remember you mentioned his name when we first met. Dr. Snowden exhaled. Yeah, well, in the real world, he'd been trying to have a kid with his wife, they had some issues conceiving. In the virtual simulation, they had a healthy baby boy, so a few weeks after you dropped us off, I saw him in a busy hallway and asked him how his kid was doing. He gave me a dirty look and walked away. He shook his head. To make matters worse, some people in the hallway knew of his issues, and they gave me dirty looks as well. I tried to explain later to him in private that I meant no harm and was just kidding. He said it wasn't an issue, but he avoids me now. Everin leaned forward, putting his left hand over his right fist with his chin resting on both hands. I am sorry to hear that as well. He may just be stressed out. I am sure he will come around if he is a true friend. On another topic... Have the nanobots caused any issues for you? Emily put her hand on the back of her neck. None for me, although I had a situation on the volleyball court where I sprained my ankle at the beginning of a game. I sat out for the rest of the game, but when a ball bounced past me, I jumped up and retrieved it. Everyone stared at me, and I realized my ankle had already repaired itself. I fell to the ground in surprise, but I don't think anyone bought it. On the upside, I used to have sinus trouble this time of year, but have had none so far. So you have adjusted quickly to them if they repaired you that quickly. Dr. Snowden glanced at Emily, then at Everin. I'm not sure I want them out. I have energy and can think clearer than I can ever recall. I've even lost weight. I wear my glasses now to keep up appearances, but I don't need them, even though they are prescribed. I sleep smell and taste better. I can even walk up the stairs without getting winded. Everin half grinned. Yes, those are good side effects of having them. 
the nanobots will adjust the light coming into your eye regardless of the glasses you wear. However, you both will need to deal with another unintentional side effect that is not obvious short term. Emily finished chewing a bite and swallowed hard. She sat up straight and glanced at Dr. Snowden before tilting her head at Everin. And what would that be? Your aging has slowed by roughly ninety percent. You will age approximately five weeks for every actual year that passes. A flash of excitement shot through Dr. Snowden. He licked his lips as he sat up on the edge of his chair. This was the last thing he expected to hear. The thought of longevity was enticing. He circled his left hand in front of him. So, as long as we have these nanobots inside us, we age slowly. That is correct. I would assume if they were taken out, you would age normally again. The downside of not aging as fast as others is that it will be noticeable by others. That level of attention is not something you would like. It sounds like the safe thing to do is take them out, said Emily. Dr. Snowden adjusted in his seat. Well, wait a minute, he said, motioning his hand downward. Let's think about this some before we make any hasty decisions. For me, though, I don't want them out. Everin turned to Emily. And you? Emily paused while drawing her lips flat. I'm not sure. I need to think about it. Everin nodded. Very well. I have something to show you. He interacted with his augmented reality interface, or ARI. V flew above the empty fourth seat at the table and projected a holographic display below him. It showed a crotivore with majestic garb wrapped around its body. The crotivore's eyes blinked slowly. Hello. I am Matriarch Dezukar. Dr. Snowden's heart raced at the sight of a crotivore. They were hard to forget. He wondered if the Universal Translator had adapted from the unusual speech pattern he had heard on the Crotovore ship, since her voice was not as high-pitched or garbled as he remembered. He rubbed his sweating hands and heard Emily inhale sharply. Apparently, she was feeling apprehensive as well. I apologize on behalf of the Crotovore for the experience you went through. We had rules in place to avoid sentient species being used for research. The scientists on that ship went rogue after deciding they would never get home. I hope you can forgive us, said Dezukar. She motioned to her side at Everin. Everin has provided us with the data from the ship. He said he can contact you even though you are in the past and would be long dead from our perspective. We have given him a device to remove the nanobots circulating in your body. It is the least we can do. Please accept our deepest apologies. She placed her hands over each of her four smaller eyes, then covered her two main eyes, then lowered them. The projection shut off. Wow. An apology, said Emily. A few moments of silence passed. Everin turned toward Dr. Snowden. Dr. Snowden. Dr. Snowden shook his head and exhaled. Sorry, I was just thinking about things from their perspective. I was thinking that to them, we must have been pretty disgusting looking. Nonetheless... You can take the nanobots out if we wanted them out. I can, should you or Emily choose to do so. I have another projection to show you, though. Emily took a sip of her iced tea and looked at Everin. From who? Jay, said Everin, as he smiled and tapped at his ARI. Dr. Snowden jerked his head back. Jay, did he stay on your ship for a month? Everin swiped his hand across his ARI. He did. Here is his short recorded message for you both. V projected a display showing Jay sitting in a hot tub. In the projection, V stood in body mode within arm's reach of Jay outside the hot tub. Doc! Emily! Everin said he got you both back to Earth! 
Hope you're doing well, said Jay. He put his beer down on the edge of the hot tub. Everin said he's going to take me back when my arm is fully regenerated, but I should wait until he has visited you before trying to make contact. Whenever that is, he has my address and contact information. Give me a shout. We can grill out and catch up and shit. Several women called out to Jay in the background. Jay smiled. <laughs> yeah, well, looks like it's time for V's next lesson in human culture. Catch you later, man. The projection vanished. Dr. Snowden cocked his head. I don't remember a hot tub on the Torvata. My hollow room. It can transform energy into matter. Jay availed himself to it for the month he was around. Dr. Snowden chuckled. So the women were just holograms, then? <laughs> that doesn't surprise me at all, <laughs> said Emily, giggling. Everin pursed his lips while staring at his plate. He then looked at Dr. Snowden. There is another matter related to why you were abducted. It appears a device on your car called the Crotivore. Called them? Yes. A signal was sent out that would have been easily detected by them, but not by anything on Earth. I had the Crotivore check it while I was visiting, and they said it was an emergency beacon. I do not understand how it got on your car, though. Emily gestured toward Dr. Snowden. Uncle Albert usually handles all the car stuff, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't us. Everin nodded. I concur. Someone, or something, put it there. I have added it to my list of things to investigate. Dr. Snowden finished a bite of his meatloaf and waved his fork in a circle in front of him. How do you plan to do that? By checking on your car at various intervals in the past and seeing when the signal is present and when it is not, I can narrow it down from there. That will take some time to do, however. Emily pursed her lips. What if we see you or the Torvata back then? You will not. I will be in stealth mode high above the planet. Dr. Snowden cleared his throat. So, if you do this in your future sometime, does that mean your surveillance has already happened in our past? Possibly. There are many variables. It would be tied to my future, but your past. If my future changes, your past changes. Given the nature of this universe, nothing is set in stone. Dr. Snowden was always fascinated about the concept of time travel, to have experienced it and to discuss the finer points with someone who does it often was exhilarating for him. He took a long, measured breath and looked at Everin. I have... Emily reached out and grabbed Dr. Snowden's hand. Dr. Snowden glanced at her and nodded. We have a question to ask you. Everin tilted his head at them. Yes, you may travel with me, he said as he dove back into his plate for another bite. Dr. Snowden sat in stunned silence. His eyes lit up, and a big smile crept across his face. He glanced at Emily, then back at Everin. How do you know I was going to ask that? I did not. V, however, calculated an 86% chance you would ask. He also calculated how you would ask. Your hesitation, breathing, and physical support from Emily moved it to 98%. I have given it thought already and, since I enjoyed your company previously, agree to try it out. You're seriously okay with that, then? asked Dr. Snowden. Of course. Both of you have already proven yourself to be of sound mind. It is refreshing to have a different perspective on things. I will warn you, though. The places I go are not always the safest. Danger is ever-present. Dr. Snowden nodded. We understand it might not always be safe. I do hope not every trip is like the Crotovore ship, though. Everin leaned back into his chair. That was definitely not a typical trip for me. However, with that said, where I go does tend to have a bit of adventure to it. After we are done here, 
Grab whatever you want to put in your room. You do not need clothes, food, or the like. The Torvata will furnish those for you. How will the Torvata furnish clothes for us? said Emily. Dr. Snowden could see Emily was worried about fashion choices. Everin half grinned. V will show you around your rooms and the ship, including the matter replicators in your room, which will allow you to create any type of clothing you wish. Emily looked around the room. Speaking of which, where'd he go? Everin crooked his thumb at the backyard. He is in the Torvata, preparing your rooms and gear. Dr. Snowden harumped. I didn't even see him leave. He used his new arm to open the sliding door enough to go out, then closed it back. He is quite stealthy. I guess, said Dr. Snowden. Looking at Everin's cleared plate, he wondered what happened to the things Everin did consume, as he did not need food or drink. A smile flickered on and off his face. He was going to get to travel with Everin. Through space. Time. And beyond. What would happen with his day job? If they ever decided that traveling wasn't for them, maybe Everin could take them back to a minute after they left. He would need to ask Everin about that at some point. For now... His mind was reeling with the possibilities. Care for seconds? And wow, you eat really fast, said Emily, standing up. Everin nodded at Emily. You do broccoli justice, but I am done. On another note, the Torvata is in your backyard. It is stealthed, but you should see the tip of the ramp sticking out past the shield. Head on in when ready. V and I will be waiting. Sound good? More than good, said Dr. Snowden. Works for me, said Emily. Oh, before I forget, you two will need these, said Everin, as he stood up. He reached to his side and pulled out two pen-like objects from a container on his belt. He handed one to Emily, then one to Dr. Snowden. These are your personal support devices, or PSDs as I refer to them. After the Crotovore ship event, I decided to make some upgrades and adjustments across the board. This was the result of one of those adjustments. The PSDs have a range of functionality such as scanning, augmented reality mode, and the like. I would suggest you familiarize yourself with them. They will enhance your survivability by quite a bit. V can show you the finer points if you have any questions, and you can test them out in the hollow room. Whoa, said Emily as she flipped the PSD around in her hand. Dr. Snowden looked at the PSD and saw four physical buttons lined up with a small digital screen underneath them. He pressed the top button, and the end of the PSD lit up briefly. The PSD split in half, with the right side extending out. A thin material connected to the left half. A display appeared on the material. There were many icons on the displays with names like Scan, Light, and Communications. His jaw dropped as he glanced at Everin. I don't even know what to say. Everin wheeled around to go out the sliding glass doors. Part of your journey with me will be learning how to use it. Just do not press and hold the green button on the bottom and point it at someone unless you want to stun them. It is a shortcut to the stun beam. It is off by default, so you will need to learn how to activate and use it. One last thing. Think about where you would want to go. He slid open the glass doors and walked out, closing them when he was outside. Dr. Snowden pressed the top button, and his PSD snapped back into a pen shape. He put it in his pants pocket and stood. Emily stood and placed her PSD in her pocket as well. Dr. Snowden walked over to Emily and hugged her. I can't believe it. We get to go. At least now you can stop worrying said Emily, grinning. Dr. Snowden stepped back and nodded. He helped Emily clear the table and kitchen in record time. They then went their separate ways. A half hour later, they met back in the dining room. Dr. Snowden had a small backpack slung over his shoulder. Emily had a suitcase on wheels behind her. Everin said we wouldn't need clothes, said Dr. Snowden. It's not clothes in there, just some sentimental things, said Emily with softened eyes. You're bringing Mr. Smith, aren't you? Maybe, said Emily, 
with her face turning a slight shade of red. Dr. Snowden grinned. Emily had been given the stuffed tiger as a kid by Dan. Although she did not sleep with it anymore, she kept it close. He suspected there were several other things Dan gave her in there. He missed his brother, and knew how much Dan would have loved to go on an adventure like this. Okay. We ready? Let's do it, said Emily. Hmm. We better shut everything off. You get the upstairs, I'll get downstairs, said Dr. Snowden. Emily bounded up the stairs as he turned off the lights in the living room and kitchen. Leaving on just the light in the dining room, he double-checked the other rooms on the ground floor and headed back to the dining room. Emily had already come back down, as there were only three rooms upstairs. Now we can go, said Dr. Snowden. He walked over to the sliding glass doors and opened them. He watched Emily go out and reflected on the journey ahead of them. Chapter 2 When they were both outside, Dr. Snowden turned to lock the sliding glass doors. They proceeded a bit into the backyard where they saw the tip of the ramp. Dr. Snowden cautiously moved his hand above it and watched his hand disappear. He glanced at Emily, walked forward, and found himself on the ramp. Emily appeared beside him, and they walked up the ramp and into the ship together. When they entered... Everin stood in front of the replicator tables directly ahead of them. V, in body mode, stood next to him. With outstretched hands, Everin said, Welcome back to the Torvata. I apologize for sneaking out. That was not cool, said V. Emily laughed. It's okay. Acknowledged. Dr. Snowden cocked his head back when he saw V. His body had more armored plastic-like coverings over the skeletal structure, which made the arms and legs more pronounced. The coverings were a light gray, with black borders on them. There were smaller, dark blue coverings around the neck and wrists that looked like they had more complex designs etched in. V's face had a covering that looked like it was lifted off a mannequin. Everin half-smiled. V, take their things to their rooms. As for you two, you get the high-level tour. Acknowledged, said V. He took Dr. Snowden's backpack and Emily's suitcase and then went into the first door to the left of the entrance. Everin walked to the right of the entrance with Dr. Snowden and Emily in tow. As you recall, each side has three doors. They lead to dimensional regions that are a part of the ship and, as you have seen, do not take up space in this reality other than a doorway. Dimensional mechanics, right? asked Dr. Snowden. You remembered. Excellent. Everin pointed to the first door. That is the medical lab. You may remember it from when the crawl was in there. It can handle most small crises and is very advanced in terms of what it can do. Dr. Snowden felt a pang of sadness at the mention of the crawl. He wondered how she was doing, then realized she was long dead. They had traveled to the past to drop her off. He wished she could be with them, but knew she was where she needed to be. Getting used to time travel and how relative it was would be a challenge. He had seen the value of the medical lab that day and hoped he would never need to use it. He pointed to a countertop along the side with a rubber-like top. What's that? A matter replicator. You will find them in various configurations across the ship. They are similar in function to the ones you saw on the Crotovore ship. Ah, I see. Everin walked a bit to the right and pointed to the second door. That leads to several research labs. It is where I spend most of my time and your PSDs were developed in there. It has work areas, research areas, and a large data bank you can peruse. Dr. Snowden, I suspect you will find the planar cartography lab of great interest. Dr. Snowden glanced at Everin, then looked into the room. It looked like a large hub, with side rooms attached. 
He really wanted to see the planner cartography lab. Given that the Torvada had holographic technology, it should be pretty high-tech. One thing he had on his list was to check out some of the planetary systems he had been researching. What information would they show? Everin walked a bit more to the right and pointed to the third door. That leads to various maintenance centers. By default, it is inaccessible to anyone but me or V. That is more for your protection than ours. Now, to the left side. He walked to the left side of the entrance and pointed to the first door. This is the general living quarters of the ship and has all the necessary conveniences. Your rooms are in there. Dr. Snowden noticed that the medical lab, research lab, and living quarters were the only entrances not covered by a white shield preventing anyone from looking in. Everin walked a bit to the left and pointed to the next door. This is the hollow room you saw in Jay's video. Anything within the ship's database can be recreated there. Emily, I know you like to run, so you could create a track or trail to run on in there if you wanted to. V can show you how to use them. Wouldn't I hit the wall? asked Emily. You actually never leave the center of the room once it starts. It is also good for simulations, learning, and experiencing any location the Torvata has been to. There are some system programs that came with the ship. They taught me how to use it. You both should try it out at some point, and yes, Dr. Snowden, there are some educational programs that cover dimensional mechanics, said Everin. Dr. Snowden's eyes lit up. Between this and the planner cartography lab, he was not sure how he would be coaxed off the Torvada, at least for a while anyways. The opportunities being provided were not lost on him. How could anyone ever want to leave this paradise of information? He tilted his head. When you say, came with the ship, does that mean you bought the Torvata somewhere? No, a stripped-down version of it was given to me by a very old friend when I came to this plane. I have enhanced it since, but there are older systems built in that I am still learning about, such as the Universal Translator. I continue to upgrade it as the need arises. That's a pretty nice friend, said Emily. Yes. I miss our conversations. Do you mean universe when you say plain? asked Dr. Snowden. No, but I understand your confusion. Your universe is but one of many that exist in a multiverse. That multiverse has a core and exists in a plane. There are many other planes out there, and I travel between them. Dr. Snowden's lips parted as he stared at Everin. So, the planar cartography lab isn't just for stellar cartography. It can show other universes and planes, too? Yes. However, for now I have locked it to this timeline in this universe. From your perspective, it will only show stellar cartography of places I have been. Dr. Snowden shook his head. I have so much to learn but at least now I have an opportunity to do so. Everin nodded and then pointed to the last door on the left. The final door leads to a large conference room. Very useful, and I suspect we will be using it quite a bit. Let me show you to your rooms. He walked through the living quarters door. Dr. Snowden and Emily followed him. It reminded Dr. Snowden of a large lobby of a hotel, Doorways lined the sides and were broken up periodically by what appeared to be matter replicators. The center of the room had a large seating area composed of couches, tables, and chairs. They walked to the first two doors on the right wall. The doors had a white shield in front of them. A console stood out to the side of each door. Dr. Snowden, yours is the first door on the right, and Emily, yours is the one to the left of it. The rooms are spacious, more so than you are probably expecting. Just place your hand on the console by the door, and the door will turn transparent. Once inside, put your hand on the inner console, and it will go back to the white shield. V has already placed both your items in your rooms. Get settled in. 
then meet me in the conference room when ready, said Everin. Dr. Snowden rubbed his chin while looking at Emily. He watched her go into her room, and then he went into his. The room resembled a luxury suite at a hotel. In front of him was a short hallway leading to a large room. To his right was a smaller room with what looked like a storage area. He walked into the large room and stared at the scale of it. It was much larger than he expected, about the size of his house. The Torvada definitely didn't skimp on living quarters. He took in the scent of a freshly cleaned room. It reminded him of the carpet cleaner powder he and Emily used to clean their carpets. To the right were two rooms, and to his left there was one. The main room had several couches and chairs, along with the smaller area with a dining table and replicator pads. Walking to the right, he peered into the first room, noting it was a grand bathroom. In the room next to it was a large bed with several tables and a desk. He walked across the main room to the other door and peeked in. It looked like a study area, with several workstations, a work table, and some other items he could not identify. He suspected he would be spending some time in that room. There was a balcony, but he figured it was probably a hologram. He walked back to the bedroom and saw his backpack sitting on a chair near the bed. It looked inviting and drew him over, where he then sat on the edge. He tapped it with his hands and noted it was soft to the touch. With a flick of his feet, he kicked off his shoes and then lay down. The spotless ceiling stared down at him as he put his hands behind his head. He could get used to this. He wondered what Emily thought of the rooms as he pulled his PSD out of his pants pocket and then opened it, revealing that it was about 7.10 p.m. He thought about going and checking on Emily, or seeing Everin, but the bed felt too relaxing to get off of. He closed his PSD and put it on the small table to the side. It was not long before he was fast asleep. About ten hours later, he slowly opened his eyes. Everin and Emily were standing over him. He rubbed his eyes and sat up on the edge of his bed. What time is it? Emily pulled out her PSD and tapped the second button. A holographic display shot out the end. According to the PSD, it's 5 a.m. You had a good night's rest. Dr. Snowden noted that the top button expanded the PSD and the second button shot the same display out as a projection. Everin had mentioned that the bottom button was a shortcut to the stun beam. He wondered if that shortcut was programmable, or if the third button was for that. He would need to play with it some. Everin half-smiled while gesturing at Dr. Snowden. I am glad you slept well. The bed has a neural effect that allows you to sleep better. There is no rush. When you are cleaned up, I will be in the conference room. He nodded and walked out of the room. Dr. Snowden surveyed the room, then looked at Emily. You are awfully chipper this morning. I ran in the hollow room. That room is so cool. So it's really lifelike. Oh yeah. I ran along a road near the ocean. I could smell it with a light wind around me. It felt a bit like the virtual simulation, although more real, if that makes sense. Dr. Snowden nodded. Well, I'll leave the running to you. I'm going to get rigged around, then meet you two in the conference room. Emily squeezed his shoulder, then left the room. It did not take him long to get cleaned up. When he reached the Torvada's main room, he noticed how quiet it was. He walked to the conference room entrance and went in. Everin sat at the head of the table, facing the entrance, with Emily seated to his left and V to his right. Looking to his left, Dr. Snowden saw a counter with various gadgets on it and several replicator pads. Emily had a cup of coffee in front of her. She pointed to another cup in front of the seat next to her. I got you a cup of coffee. Dr. Snowden smiled and sat next to her noting that the seats were wide and comfortable. He grabbed the coffee cup and inhaled deeply before taking a sip. He closed his eyes and hummed. Just the way I like it. Everin nodded. I am glad you like it. Now that we are all here, we can discuss where to go. Before we do, let me lay out some guidelines. 
anywhere with low technology needs to be carefully considered. Also, any place inhospitable to human life would require some preparation, although we can still go either in suits or to observe from the roof or in the bridge. Wherever we go, we also need to take into consideration our appearances. Got it. Emily, what do you think? asked Dr. Snowden as he turned toward her. Emily drummed her fingers on the table and paused before speaking. Being a history major, you know I will want to do something historical. There are so many events I would love to see. That would definitely require a change of clothing. Dr. Snowden, said Everett. Well, I thought about it quite a bit in the last three months. I would like to see this Cregan Star Empire you mentioned in this time period. You said they dominated this region of space, so I wanted to see what they were about and how they view Earth, if at all. May I suggest something? asked V, raising a finger. Sure, go ahead, said Dr. Snowden, gesturing at V. V tapped at a table console, which spawned a holographic display that shot up from the middle of the table, showing a solar system with one of the planets highlighted. Kriegus, the Kriegan homeworld, is having a cultural exhibition event. Approximately 1,300 civilizations are participating, and it occurs once every 4.6 years. If you wanted to meet not only the Kriegans, but also members of their empire, this would be an efficient route to do so. He moved his fingers around the table console, and a new holographic display of a galactic region appeared, with green dots sporadically populating it. You can see all the civilizations participating here. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened as he pointed at the holographic display. Okay, that's where I want to go. Emily giggled. It seems we're going to this event. Maybe we can do historical next, then. Sounds good to me. Everin, that okay? asked Dr. Snowden. Everin half smiled. Of course. One thing to note. Their day is twenty-six hours long, so it may be a minor adjustment for you. We can go as we are, since diversity will be everywhere and we should fit in. He gestured at V. V, set the coordinates, but wait until we are on the bridge to go. Acknowledged. They exited the conference room, and V walked up the left side ramp to the front of the ship. Everin walked over to the elevator-looking structure Dr. Snowden had seen earlier at the end of the entrance area. Dr. Snowden, Emily, I would like to show you something before we go. He tapped on the console, and the door slid open. He gestured for Dr. Snowden and Emily to enter. Dr. Snowden glanced sidelong at Emily, then walked into the elevator. Emily followed him in, with Everin taking up the rear. Dr. Snowden noticed immediately how spacious it was. He figured it was dimensional mechanics at play, similar to how the rest of the Torvato worked. The engineering that must be required to support that boggled his mind. Everin touched the interior console, and the door closed. After a moment, the doors reopened, and Dr. Snowden noted that they were on the roof. He stared out into the abyss of space punctuated by pinpoints of light. The images he had seen from his work did not compare to this. He reached out to the side of the elevator and steadied himself as he looked at Everin. Everin gestured for them to exit the elevator. Do not worry. There are guardrails along the sides, and you can breathe due to the Torvada's shielding. You will not float off into space. Dr. Snowden stepped out, taking his time to look around. He had read that the smell of space was similar to steak and sweaty feet, and was thankful he did not have to experience that. Looking to his right, Earth caught his eye. He rushed over to the waist-high, light blue shielding and gazed at Earth. Emily and Everin walked over to him. Everin waved a hand at Earth. You are a planet, in all its glory. Dr. Snowden moved his head slowly from side to side, taking in the view. 
he could see the continents and cloud cover. This was not something he had expected to see right away, but he was not complaining. He initially thought this was a rare opportunity, but maybe it would be routine after traveling with Everin for a while. He licked his lips as his eyes misted. It's... Uh, it's... So beautiful. Emily grabbed Dr. Snowden's arm and laid her head on it. That's so cool. They stood for a few minutes, soaking up the image before them. Everin laid a hand on Dr. Snowden's shoulder. You did not get the opportunity to see Earth like this when I returned you home from the Crotovore ship. Seeing it up here versus through a screen is a different experience. Is it what you expected? Dr. Snowden nodded. Yeah. Seeing it through the screen was like watching it on TV. This is... a lot more impactful than I expected. It makes our problems seem so petty. I have read of the overview effect but never imagined I would be feeling it. Thank you. He grinned and looked at Everin, then back at Earth. Everin half smiled. There will be many opportunities to see stellar phenomena up close like this. The roof is a good observation spot. You are free to come out here whenever you wish. Dr. Snowden pursed his lips and looked down and around. I've been meaning to ask, though. Why are we not floating? I noticed that when you picked us up from the abduction. The Torvada's shielding is made of energy that your physics would call exotic. It prevents external matter from interaction, unless it is weakened at a point to allow interaction, such as the ramp. By default, the only weakened points are areas where thrust is needed. So we could fly into the sun and stand outside? Yes, although there would be some complications. Weakening the shield for thrust in that environment would be dangerous. Also, external matter outside can react unpredictably to the shielding, so some caution is needed. Now, are you ready for Kriegis? I am. As Emily would say, let's do it. Emily stepped back and swatted Dr. Snowden's arm. I don't sound like that. Dr. Snowden laughed as they headed back to the elevator. Once back in the Torvada, they headed to the command area. Everin sat in his command chair, and Dr. Snowden and Emily sat in the U-shaped seating to the right. V was at the front console, busy working on it. A portal, similar to the one that Dr. Snowden saw when Everin took them home from the Andromeda galaxy, appeared outside the Torvada. They flew through the portal, and after a few moments, they appeared near a planet. Dr. Snowden noted that every time they used the portal or time-traveled, they were in space. He wondered if there was a rule for that. Looking out the window, he could see various ships, satellites, and other things he did not recognize. The seat of an empire was before him. What would the various aliens be like? Would they know of Earth, or did it go by another name? There were a lot of questions he hoped to get answered. Traveling like this was all he thought about for three months. Getting to see Earth from the roof was a great way to begin the journey. A big grin crept onto his face as he imagined what he would learn. V. Locate a communication satellite, said Everin. Acknowledged. V tapped at several panels on the main console, and the front screen zoomed in on a satellite with a highlighted green border. Satellite located. Take us next to it, and engage the interface beam, said Everin. Acknowledged. I got this. Dr. Snowden chuckled, and Emily giggled. The front screen zoomed back out, and the Torvada flew toward the satellite. Dr. Snowden noticed that the various ship designs he was seeing were all over the place. He figured with so many alien races, that was to be expected. Most were elongated, but some had large spherical designs. 
It made him wonder what type of technology was used to provide thrust and power, or what the Torvada used, even. The Torvada pulled up next to the satellite that was highlighted earlier. A metal rod extended out of one of the panels on the side. A blue beam shot out of it and connected with the satellite, causing the front screen to change to a generic user interface. Dr. Snowden wondered if this was what Everin's ARI was like. V. Download current information and locate an attending species that is close to human. Determine what credentials are required and register us per any requirements, said Everin. Acknowledged. Emily turned to face Everin. That's a lot to do just to visit the planet. It is. However, this is Kriegis, the seat of an empire. It is heavily secured. They do not let just anyone on. Then again, there are not many that can access information in this manner to speed up the process. The satellite has already registered this access attempt, so there will be a response. We should be gone by then, however, said Everett. This made sense to Dr. Snowden. He wondered if they would be discovered when they went below, but figured with thirteen hundred other civilizations attending, they could blend in. Half of them probably did not know the other half. He had seen some ship designs that seemed to be related. One of the larger ones had a similar design aesthetic to the satellite, and it looked menacing. Probably some type of law enforcement ship. Credentials replicated, said V. Good. Let us see who we are going to be now, said Everin, as he got up to get the credentials. He walked around to the back of the ship near the ship entrance. He returned to where Dr. Snowden and Emily were sitting and handed each of them a credential pass. Looks like we are Fedorians. Dr. Snowden looked at the pass. It had unusual designs on it and was razor thin. It was about the size of a credit card, and the back of it had an unusual texture. He flopped it around. So, we just carry this around? It will bind to any clothing material so you can just place it anywhere on your shirt, said Everin. Dr. Snowden placed his on the top left of his shirt. Emily looked at the credential pass, put it on her right arm, then looked at Everin. Who are these? Fredorians were impersonating. Everin gestured at the front screen. V. Show the Fredorian profile. Acknowledged. The front screen showed a male and female human on the left side, with white and gold one-piece suits. A belt separated the top half from the bottom. They had on black boots and a thin, flat, metallic, collar-like device. To the right of them were various statistics about the Fredorians. Dr. Snowden scrutinized the screen. They definitely look very human. Everin tilted his head. It appears they are human. Interesting. You mean as in from Earth? Yes. V. Bring up the timeline of their history. Acknowledged. The front screen changed to a chronological timeline of Fredorian events. Everin moved his hands around the ARI, causing the timeline to scroll. It would seem any human that was abducted from Earth and freed from enslavement was put on Fedoria. They began as a refugee planet provided by the Kriegans. Dr. Snowden's eyes fixated on the enslavement period, highlighted in light green on the screen. They would need a lot to make that worth their while, but I guess that would explain all the alien abductions you hear about. Everin looked at his ARI and pressed a button on it. The front screen showed a document. Humans from Earth served many purposes, it seems. They were used for manual labor, medical research, food, and other activities. The Kriegans outlawed slavery roughly five hundred years ago. I am guessing at that point they were dumped to Fredoria. That sounds brutal. For an advanced civilization, they sure took a long time, said Emily, glancing at Everin. They probably viewed humans and other races as inferior said Everin. Dr. Snowden's face turned light red at the thought that humanity had been a slave race. 
He had always imagined that an advanced race would have been enlightened and helped others when a civilization became space-ready. He shook his head. A soft red light blinked at the top right. What's that? asked Emily, pointing to the red light. V flicked a finger on the console, and a new display popped up on the screen. It showed a ranking of the top twenty civilizations and their incidents with law enforcement. Fedorians were highlighted as number three. The screen then zoomed into the list of incidents. Wow, that's a lot of charges. These Fedorians seem a bit rough, said Dr. Snowden. Yes, we will need to be careful. The credentials will be discovered in time. Their systems are quite advanced. We should have at least three days, though, or more, depending on how deeply they investigate this. However, credentials are usually only checked upon entry or when trying to go somewhere secure. I am not expecting it to be scanned often. The satellite only has basic access. Once we are down there, I will check out their systems in more detail and update the passes. I do not want to do too much to trip anything at this point, however said Everin. He gestured at V. It looks like V has found us a port to land in near the event. Dr. Snowden, if you can refrain from fighting, we should be okay. Emily laughed. The only time he would fight is if someone threatened his nap. Dr. Snowden snorted. V. Disengage stealth mode. Acknowledged. Dr. Snowden was impressed that V could find the Fedorians create passes, and locate a port to land at, all under a minute. This was an advanced civilization, and their tech was not even close to the Torvadas. It gave him a new appreciation of what the Torvada brought to the table. He wished that the Fedorians had a better reputation, but it would only be for a few days. They had a rough history. The Torvada descended to the planet and broke cloud cover. Dr. Snowden got up and walked to the front of the ship. He watched as they approached the ground. He could see the port they were going to, and it was connected to a large dome that appeared to have arched entrances equidistant to each other at the base. It was the largest constructed building he had ever seen. It looked like it spanned miles and miles. As they drew near to the port, he could see the port was busy. Aliens were everywhere, along with ships, cargo, and other things he could not make out. The dock authority is requesting credentials. Sending now, said V. He touched the main console, and the front screen showed a landing pad below, with the screen putting a green outline around it. We have been cleared for landing pad A-772. Dr. Snowden gripped the front guardrail as the Torvada landed on the landing pad. Careful, Uncle Albert. You might break the railing said Emily. Dr. Snowden snorted as he let go of the railing. Just excited is all. Glad we have the universal translator, or we wouldn't know what anyone is saying. Everin stood up and nodded at Dr. Snowden. Yes, but bear in mind, it just translates speech, not mannerisms. Let us see what awaits us. They walked to the entrance and down the ramp of the Torvada. A purple-skinned humanoid rushed over to them, with the machine hovering to his right and two humanoid robots behind him. The head stood out to Dr. Snowden, as it had a cone shape on the back end curving upward. The robots appeared to be heavily armored with various weaponry attached to them. The humanoid alien had on a golden light armored suit with an open-face helmet, a sidearm on the side, and what appeared to be some type of weapon attached to the forearms. He gestured at them. I'm the dock manager for this landing pad. Your credentials, please. They showed the dock manager their passes, which the hovering robot scanned. The dock manager then tapped at his forearm and scrutinized a display that appeared over it. Fedorian, huh? He gestured at them, and the two robots stepped forward. A beam shot out encasing Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Everin. The dock manager nodded. No weapons, good, and no illegal contraband. You might surprise me after all. Your ship can remain here for eight days. If it is still here at that time, it will be moved to the holding yard, 
Standard fees apply for retrieval. Any questions? Not at the moment. Thank you for your time, said Everin, bowing. The dock manager smirked. His forearm display beat, and he looked around. The robots behind him angled their arms and moved in sync with the dock manager's gaze. They shot a light beam into the air. The dock manager pressed a button on his belt, and V, who had been stealthed, lit up in a red bullseye. The dock manager narrowed his eyes and turned to Everin. No flying civilian robots of any type are allowed, especially stealthed ones. My apologies. It is our first time here. V. Body mode, said Everin, gesturing toward the ship. Acknowledged, said V. He flew into the Torvada and, after a few moments, exited in body mode. He bowed his head to the dock manager. I apologize for the inconvenience. My intent was not to deceive. Uh-huh. I'm sure you didn't know. You all are definitely Fedorian, said the dock manager as he shook his head. Okay, you're cleared to go. I registered your robot. Make sure it doesn't get lost. Because you are Fedorian, and I emphasize this. No fighting. Enjoy your brief visit. With that, the dock manager turned and walked away with his robot entourage in tow. Real friendly guy, said Dr. Snowden. He did not seem friendly, said V. I was being sarcastic, V. That guy seemed like he was in a hurry. Given how populated this area looks, I can see why. Was that a Cregan? asked Dr. Snowden. Everin extended a hand toward the walkway leading away from the landing pad. He was. Shall we? Dr. Snowden sighed as he looked at Everin. Well, guess we have a general idea of what they think of Fedorians. Everin half smiled. As with any civilization, not all would hold that view. They went up the walkway to a landing strip that ringed the dome. Everin pointed to a large arch farther down the strip. That is an entrance to the city interior. They walked in silence toward the arch. Dr. Snowden was absorbing everything around him. Although the first Cregan he met was short with them, he was still happy to be here. He noticed the various aliens on the landing pads and saw the dock manager rushing from landing pad to landing pad. He looked like he could barely keep up with the ships coming and going. Wonder why this isn't automated for such an advanced civilization? Probably because it would be easy to hack. Much harder with a living being. An automated system would be trivial to bypass by more advanced societies, especially those with strong AI. A decentralized system might be better. Wonder what language they program in, said Emily. Dr. Snowden jerked his head back. Ah, oh, when did you get all technical? Emily paused as she studied the ground. I don't know. The thought just popped in my head. Everin narrowed his eyes and then scanned Emily with his ring. Are you feeling okay? Emily half grinned. I'm fine. Really. I don't know why I said that. It just made sense. I see. Interesting, said Everin. He nodded and they continued walking. Dr. Snowden looked up at the gateway as they approached it and saw the hustle and bustle of the crowds as they entered and left. When they got to the entrance, he noticed there were two security booths, but they were not checking passes. When they crossed through the gateway, they walked through a light shielding. He figured it must be some type of automated scanning mechanism. It made sense to him. He was still adjusting to the smells. The smells seemed to pulse. Sometimes there was a foul odor, then a pleasant one. It struck him that maybe not all aliens can sweat, or if they did, it may have a different scent than what he would expect. The multitude of colors also stood out to him. So, where to first? asked Everin. Dr. Snowden smiled big. Everywhere. They visited many different exhibits over the course of the day but four of them stood out to Dr. Snowden. 
Each exhibit was civilization-specific and contained the history, marvels, and advancements of that civilization. He liked the first exhibit. It was from a humanoid race known as the Parul. They looked human, but had red skin and unusual bone-like ridges on their body. They did not know of Fredoria, but were more than happy to show him and the others around. He marveled at how advanced their world was with its single government. They had conquered poverty and most diseases, and their technology was leaps and bounds ahead of Earth's. Their deep voices were comforting, although he found it odd on the females. The second exhibit was from the Kumo Ritten. They were also humanoid in form and short, but had feathers and a head that reminded him of an eagle. They had wings on their backs, and he was surprised they could fly, given their size. Their world was heavily forested with vast oceans. Like the Parul, they did not know of Fredoria, but were more than happy to show him and the others around. They were advanced like the Parul. He was beginning to sense there was a technological threshold that a planet had to reach to become a member of the Kriegan Star Empire. He noted that the Kumo Ritten had nailed down traveling in their solar system and to other ones. He wanted to know more of the technology, but they only had general descriptions. The third exhibit was the most unusual for him. The Huzal reminded him of three-foot-tall centipedes, but without the large mandibles of centipedes on Earth. He noted that Emily was nervous during that exhibit. He remembered when a bumblebee got caught in her hair and she could not sleep for days. She just did not like bugs in any form. The Huzal were probably her nightmare come true. The Huzal were friendly, however, and showed them around. Their planet was mostly jungle and was much larger than Earth. He guessed that the higher gravity had a hand in their evolution. They were the first among the other species on their planet to evolve to sentience. Apparently there were two other species, but they were wiped out in their long history, leaving the planet to the Huzal. He found it interesting that there was a primate-like creature on their planet at one point. The Huzal eventually drove them to extinction and were horrified when they ventured out into space and discovered that almost every race they encountered was humanoid. The Huzal, like the others, did not know of Fedoria and were very advanced. The fourth and last exhibit that stood out to him was from the Gungrelix, a plant-like creature that appeared to be a moving mass of vines under a wood-like carapace. He wondered how fast they could move if they needed to. He didn't see a mouth or a set of eyes, but figured maybe they used other senses or the features were covered from view. Like the Huzal, they evolved as the dominant species, but only after a struggle with a reptile-like humanoid species. They were also horrified when they ventured out into space. They knew of Fredorians and seemed to have a lot of respect for them. When he asked them about it, they told him they respected any race willing to take what they believed to be theirs. They then discussed the recent war Fredoria had been involved in. That did not surprise him, given what he knew of the Fredorians. He did enjoy the Gungrelix, though. They were very outgoing. The Gungrelix talked in the official Cregan language through a device that was attached to one of their vines. He liked their heavy Eastern European-sounding accent. After the Gungrelix exhibit, they walked over to a sectioned-off open area with blue grass, Dr. Snowden and Emily sat on a bench while Everin scanned the crowd. Everything okay? asked Dr. Snowden. Everin nodded. It is. We are being watched, however. Emily scanned the crowds. I don't see anything. And that is what they want. Come, we can do one more. Then we should find a place to rest for the night and get dinner, said Everin. They wandered the streets for a bit, arriving near a large exhibit building with dark red symbols etched on black walls. Dr. Snowden's skin crawled when he noticed a reptilian humanoid smile at him as they approached it. The head reminded him of a short-nosed alligator. The reptilian was human-sized and seemed more muscular than an average human. The dark gray scales with various hues seemed to sparkle under the waning suns. It was the bright yellow eyes that blinked horizontally that caught his attention. Come in and see the wonder that is 
Drodalia, said the reptilian. Everin put his hand on Dr. Snowden's shoulder. You three go ahead. I will find us accommodations for the night. If you need me, you know how to contact me. You sure? I am. Dr. Snowden nodded. Okay. Be safe. He watched as Everin walked off. Something was bothering Everin. Whatever it was, it was clear Everin wanted to handle it alone. He faced the reptilian. After you. They followed the reptilian into the exhibit building and then stopped inside a large, circular foyer area, with a large entrance to the main exhibit ahead of them. The reptilian went off to the side to a table, scattering its contents as if searching for something. Dr. Snowden's nostrils flared at what smelled like burnt flesh. He cupped his nose and coughed. He saw Emily had noticed it as well. The smell here is powerful, said V. Dr. Snowden shook his hand and head at V. V cocked his head to the side. Is everything okay, Dr. Snowden? The reptilian turned to face them. Your robot servant is just verbalizing what it senses. No offense has been taken. I apologize for the smell. Some species can't stand it, and some love it. I suspect your species would hate it. V is not our robot servant. He is part of our crew, said Emily. V nodded at Emily. Thank you, Emily. Emily smiled at V. Well, regardless, said the reptilian as he walked over to them with a device in his hands. I still need to scan credentials before we can proceed. Dr. Snowden showed the reptilian his credential pass. The reptilian scanned it and then checked his device. He stepped back with widened eyes. You're Fredorian. Dr. Snowden jerked back his head with widened eyes. This was the first visceral reaction he had seen from being known as Fredorian. Right? Is that an issue? The reptilian narrowed its eyes and then checked Emily's and V's credential passes. Depends on if you have come to start trouble or not. Dr. Snowden contorted his face. Not at all. We just wanted to see your exhibit. The reptilian eyed them for a bit, cocking his head as he smiled. You are unusual for a Fredorian. Nonetheless, I am Cesares, and I will be your guide. Follow me, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. You will have to excuse the other Drodalians, who may not be as welcoming as me. They followed Cesares through the entrance and into the main exhibit hall. Dr. Snowden saw it was set up similar to the other exhibits. There were various sections such as technology, history, cuisine, and the like. Cesares led them to the beginning of the history section, which spanned the length of the main exhibit's right wall. It was apparent they put a big focus on it. The history section was divided into smaller sections, with each section having its own hologram and representing an era in Drodalian history. Cesares walked them most of the way through it. They were quiet for the most part and listened to Cesares speak. They got to the point in the history section that detailed the Drodalian's first off-world colony. Cesares turned toward them. I'm sure you already know how this turned out. Dr. Snowden nodded his head at Cesares. Cesares' eyes flared. No comment, then. Ha. Huh. Curious. V stepped forward. They know what was done, and know it is a sensitive subject among Drodalians. They are merely being polite by not commenting on it. Cesares took a breath and blinked slowly. Really? Usually Fredorians have a lot to say about it. Let's move on. He turned around and continued on down to the next section. Dr. Snowden shrugged at V. Emily put her hand on V's shoulder while looking at him with a half-grin. Cesares took them through the rest of the history section. 
Dr. Snowden was fascinated by how they evolved from a state similar to Earth to one where they were now a star-spanning race. He was initially shocked at the brutality shown toward the Drodalians by the Fredorians. The Drodalians' first off-world colony was on a planet that the Fredorians had claimed as their own. The Drodalians did not know of Fredoria at the time, and their colony was massacred. In turn, they wiped out the first Fedorian outpost set up there, and it erupted into a war lasting over two hundred years. The Kriegans had stepped in and awarded the planet to the Fedorians. The hologram also had a listing of the savagery committed against the Drodalians by the Fedorians, ranging from being impaled on spikes to torn apart when fed to vicious animals. It was sickening to Dr. Snowden. But what made him more uncomfortable was that he could easily see Earth doing this to a race they were at war with. He did not dismiss that these details were from the Drodalian perspective. It might be very different from the Fedorian perspective. The Fedorians were definitely human. The reasons given for the atrocities seemed unsatisfactory to Dr. Snowden. He understood why Cesares hesitated about them being there. They reached the end of the historical section. Cesares then led them to the technology section. Dr. Snowden was impressed by their technology. Compared with the other exhibits he had seen, the Drodalians were slightly more advanced. He wondered if Earth would ever get there. He was startled out of his thoughts by Cesares. Like our compressed space technology advancements? asked Cesares. I do. Wish we had it, said Dr. Snowden. Cesares blinked slowly. Fedoria does have it. How else would you have gotten here? He tilted his head. Come, let me show you the ambassadorial chambers. Dr. Snowden realized he messed up. It was difficult playing a Fredorian when he knew so little about them, especially around the Drodalians. He looked at Emily, who shrugged her shoulders. Cesares led them to the back of the exhibit hall and into a large room with a conference table in the middle. He gestured for them to sit as he walked to the front of the table. After they were all sitting, Cesares interacted with the console built into the table. The door to the conference room closed shut. You can speak freely here. I have turned on the privacy filters for the room. So, what species are you exactly? We are Fedorian, said Emily. Cesares blinked rapidly. You insult my intelligence. One, you do not smell like a Fedorian. Two, you do not act like any Fedorian I have ever seen. And I have been to Fedoria. Three, perhaps the most important of all, the credentials you carry were flagged as false. Dr. Snowden glanced at Emily and then sighed. Okay, okay, we're not Fedorian. We should have had at least three days, though, before it would be an issue. Why is it flagged false now? Cesares smiled. I'm not sure where you got that three-day number from, but someone reported your credentials as false. The other exhibits you visited probably never heard of Fedoria, or, if they did didn't trust the credentials system enough to check. We do here at our embassy for obvious security reasons, given our history. Now, back to my original question. What species are you? Dr. Snowden looked down, then glanced at Emily. Emily dipped her head and looked at Cesares. We're human. From Earth. Cesares placed his scaly hands together in front of him as if in contemplation. He then accessed a table console, pecking at it as his eyes narrowed. A hologram of the galactic map appeared before them. Fedorians call themselves humans, but they are not from what you call Earth. I am not familiar with that planet. Do you have its coordinates? They are from Earth, from what I know, said Dr. Snowden. Do you have Earth's coordinates? V faced Cesares. I can enter the coordinates. 
Cesares gestured toward a table console in front of V. Go ahead. V interacted with the console, and the map changed to the solar system Earth was in. Earth was highlighted in green. The words, Protected Planet PP-176S appeared above it. There were several other lines of text next to Earth. Dr. Snowden inspected the hologram. That's it. It's called Earth, though, not Protected Planet PP-176S. Cesares leaned back into his chair with a smug smile. Ah, very interesting. I have heard of this planet. Well, before I explain, let me say this. You are not in any trouble here, so don't look worried. I know of your Earth only because it has ties to Fedoria. I know it as PP-176S, though. Why is it showing us that? asked Emily. Cesares tapped at the table console, and the solar map zoomed out, showing the solar system as one dot among others. Several colored regions appeared. Earth was in a massive blue region. The blue region is the Cregan Star Empire. If you notice, your system is on the edge of that and several other colored regions. Those other regions are home to various unstable groups. As Earth is low-tech, it cannot join the Cregan Star Empire. But the Cregans believe Earth has future potential. That is why they protect your planet. We know humans were abducted from Earth for various reasons. Then the Cregans outlawed it, said Dr. Snowden. Cesares grimaced. Yes, but it is a little more complex than that. Before Earth became a protected planet, it was routinely raided by said unstable groups. Nothing major, but enough for a burgeoning trade of humans on the black market both inside and outside Cregan space. A group on Earth calling themselves the Helians was finally able to stop it. The Cregans took notice and agreed to a deal with them. Their tech was sufficiently advanced. But as the planet was not, the best they could do was form a protection treaty. As slavery was deemed illegal around that time in the Cregan Star Empire, they relocated any human within their borders that had been taken against their will to Fedoria. Who are these Helians? asked Dr. Snowden. Cesares tilted his head. You don't know of them? They are a highly advanced group that spoke on behalf of your planet. They said they protected it against alien incursions. They don't look quite human, though. They are winged and have glowing eyes. Your planet had some strange characteristics among your species. There were reports of unusual humans being captured, some able to overpower their captors. Regardless, the Cregan Star Empire decided to work with the Helians. They haven't always been fair to your kind. From what I have heard, they still allow the black market to continue under the radar in return for technology. Dr. Snowden shook his head. They sounded like angels to him. He could see how with advanced tech and their appearance, they could probably infiltrate and do what they wanted. He swallowed hard as he thought about the humans taken on the black market. It did not seem right. Emily shifted in her seat. Why didn't the Cregans just take the slaves back to Earth? Cesares blinked at Emily. With all the knowledge and technology they had seen? If it was one or two, maybe. Several hundred thousand. Not so much. Several hundred thousand? How is that even possible? said Dr. Snowden, as he sat on the edge of his seat. He had thought at worst it would be a few hundred a year. Cesares touched the table console. The map changed to a digital document. Cesares looked up at it, then swiped his hand across the console. The document flipped through several pages. On one of the pages was a date showing 1534. According to these logs, 
The Helians stated that roughly 200,000 humans had been abducted prior to signing the Protection Treaty. Makes you wonder how they know that number, said Dr. Snowden. Yes, they seem deceptive to me, as most humans do. Fedoria still takes in humans, and their society has grown considerably. They are what Earth would be if it had similar technology. I am surprised you are here, though. Protected planet natives are rare, unless they have been abducted, and even then, they would not be on this planet. How did you get here? asked Cesares. Dr. Snowden took off his glasses and rubbed his forehead. Emily ran her hands along the sides of her face. V glanced at them both, then spoke. They are traveling as guests of our host. He is away doing business at the moment. They are here of their own free will. Cesares nodded, leaning forward on the table. Well then, I would suggest asking the Fedorian ambassador to reset your status. If you go back to Earth with a revoked status, you will be put on a bounty list. You would then be pursued by Cregan hunters. Speaking of which... The Fedorian ambassador is outside. Her name is Andia Kiggs. Dr. Snowden's heartbeat increased as he gripped the edge of the table. What? They know you are here, and I have confirmed that for them. I thought you didn't like Fedorians, said Dr. Snowden. I don't. However, with every species... There is a wide variety of subcultures and personalities. I have worked with Andia before in negotiations. She can be trusted. She is not typical for a Fedorian. Oddly enough, you share her mannerisms. She could have just sent her guard to arrest you, but she didn't. I suspect she is curious and wants to see for herself. My advice is to be honest with her. As for your host, I would suggest you contact him and make him aware of the situation, said Cesares. That's a good idea, said Dr. Snowden, as he opened his PSD and tapped at the communications icon. It opened a screen showing icons for Emily and Everin. He pressed on Everin. Mm. Says he is not available. V. V paused, then faced Dr. Snowden. He is busy at the moment. He did not want to disrupt your visit here, so he left a message for me to relay that he would be out of contact for a bit. For his sake, I hope that is all it is. Others may not be as understanding as me about this. I have enjoyed our conversation. It is rare I talk to anyone from a protected planet said Cesares, as he stood up. He walked to the entrance of the room and opened the door. He gestured for them to go through. Andia awaits you at the entrance. They got up and walked to the entrance. Dr. Snowden extended a hand to Cesares. Sorry for the deception, and thanks for keeping it on the down low. Cesares eyed Dr. Snowden's hand and tilted his head. Down low. Emily chuckled. He means thanks for not making it publicly known. Also, we shake hands as a courtesy when leaving on Earth. Cesares nodded and shook Dr. Snowden's hand. He then shook Emily's hand. Strange custom. On our world, extending a hand is a challenge to fight. Shaking it is an acceptance. Fedorians don't shake hands as a courtesy. They slap their fists to their chest. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened. Yeah, this is just saying goodbye. No fighting required here. I'm not trying to live up to the Fedorian stereotype. Hopefully we can talk again sometime. Cesares nodded. Dr. Snowden and Emily proceeded to the entrance. Dr. Snowden thought about their encounter. These Dordalians seemed to be okay. 
It made him think maybe the Fredorians were the aggressors with them. Of course, it could also be that Cesares framed it that way. He guessed he would find out the other side when talking with this Andia Kiggs person. They reached the entrance and walked outside. A medium-sized humanoid woman with piled-up brunette hair and a stern look on her face approached them. She wore a loose-fitting white and gold outfit with blue lines on it, segmenting it. To her sides were two advanced-looking armored guards. The woman put her right fist over her chest with her arm at a forty-five-degree angle. "'I am Andia Kiggs, Prime Ambassador of Fedoria. We have a lot to talk about.' Chapter 3 Ciros placed his hands behind him as he wondered where his second-in-command, Andrax, was. Andrax burst into the room. His light green skin stood out against the typical tan and white garb that was the Ciros Industries theme. He carried with him a tablet device along with a headpiece that had a translucent arced visor across his big black eyes and bald thin head. He rushed up to the large command desk between him and Ciros. Preparations for the meetings are almost done. Ciros turned his head to the side without turning around. Andrax, how long have we known each other? Sir? How long have we known each other? Andrax tilted his head at Ciros. Since Ciros Industries was founded a very long time ago. Ciros sighed. He turned around and put both hands together with his fingers touching at the fingertips. You will be handling these negotiations. I have a personal matter to attend to. Andrax paused, then blinked rapidly. But, sir, they expect you, not me. I don't have the gravitas that you bring to negotiations. Ciros's eyes flashed. What did you bring me just now? On your tablet. Andrax looked at his tablet. All the points for the meeting and how we need to position ourselves. Ciro smiled. So, you have to prep me for the meeting. It would be easier for you to do it. I trust that you can. They will accept you. And I will communicate it to them here shortly. Andrax looked at the ground as if in contemplation, then looked back at Ciros. May I ask what this personal matter is that is more important than this meeting? This negotiation is a big milestone for the company. It's rare to find a species that will advance as quickly as the Hydralians are projected to. Ciros nodded and sat in his large executive chair. Because you have known me for so long... You deserve an explanation. Please, sit. Ciro's gestured at one of the chairs in front of his desk. He liked Andrax, and had hand-picked him to be his right-hand man. Andrax's race was Ildoran, a race known for its ability to remember and recall information with a high level of detail. Their home planet fell prey to slavers, and for those who did escape, they were scattered and found work wherever they could in the Cregan Star Empire. He had met Andrax at an entertainment center, where Andrax served drinks. His ability to work without requiring any type of device amazed Ciros. The only reason they would use one is to give to others who needed information and did not possess their memory abilities. Ciros offered Andrax employment, and any other Ildorian who wanted to work was welcome to come. He also liberated their planet. The Eldorian worshipped him as a hero. Andrax placed the tablet-like device he was carrying on the desk and sat down. Ciros ran a hand through his hair. I got a report earlier today from the Bounty Hunters Guild. Someone I have been looking for has arrived on the Kriegis. It has been a long time, but he has shown up. Andrax tilted his head. 
how do they know it is the person you are looking for? I have given devices to various groups over this quadrant of the galaxy to detect a certain pattern. They have detected it and are actively trying to procure the target. But they will not succeed. Andrax smirked. I'd be surprised if they caught whoever it is you're looking for. We could set a squad of Covendrin mercenaries to get whoever this person is. They can deliver. Ciros laced his fingers and eased back into his chair. Actually, I will need you to reach out to them and arrange a meeting. Andrax drew his lips flat. So you're going to handle this yourself, then? Yes. Andrax sighed. Can I at least ask who this person is that can draw you away at a moment's notice? Why is this person so important to you? Ciros paused as he clenched his jaw. An image of his wife and children faded in and out of his mind. What I am about to tell you does not leave this room. Understood. Andrax nodded as he sat on the edge of his chair. Of course. Ciro smiled, and his eyes softened. You're one of the few I count as a friend. You are also efficient at what you do. There is a chance. I may not come back from this. If that is the case, I am entrusting the company to you. I will make the necessary legal arrangements before I go. Andrak swallowed hard. I am honored that you trust me enough to run the company and appreciate you consider me a friend. Every Ildorian under your employ is honored to work for you. I hope you're planning on coming back. Ciro sighed and tilted his head. I do. But who I seek is powerful. He is not like you or me. He is a mass murderer on a scale that is unfathomable. He has tools at his disposal that are unconventional, and his murderous ways are what caused me to come to this region of the galaxy. He makes what the slavers did to Ildoria pale in comparison. Andrax gulped. Ciro's gestured with his right hand. I will need you to prepare my ship and coordinate my meeting with the Covendron Mercs. I will make the arrangements I mentioned for the Hydralis meeting and conditional company transfer. Andrax nodded. It will be done. Is there anything else you require of me? Ciro shook his head. No. Time is of the essence, however. Andrax stood up and walked toward the room exit. He paused, and then turned around. If I might ask, what is the name of this being you seek? Ciros's blood churned as he exhaled sharply through his nose with downturned lips. He glanced at his desk, then slowly raised his head. He bore a gaze through Andrax. Everin. Everin meandered toward one of the busy food courts. When he arrived, he scanned the crowd. He narrowed his eyes at a bench near an alleyway, then walked over to it and sat. After ten minutes, a voice echoed out from the alleyway. Psst! Hey! Everin! Is that you? Everin stood up and walked to the entrance of the alleyway. After surveying it, he proceeded down it. At the end, a small device sat on the ground. He picked it up and flipped it around in his hand. A gravelly voice rang out from behind him. Don't turn around. I have a Tyralean wide-beam phaser pointed at you. Keep walking and take the first door on the right. I assure you, this is not necessary. I just wish to talk, said Everin. Talk? You're my payday. Not sure why everyone thought you were so hard to catch. Pretty simple to me. Now shut up and keep going, said the voice behind him. 
Everin walked to the end of the alleyway, where a dull orange door stood out on his right. Walk past the door, then turn around, said the voice behind him. Everin walked slightly past the door and turned around. A male humanoid wearing black clothing underneath a patchwork of light armor stood before Everin. The scratched armor pieces had silver and orange borders on them. A brown bandolier with various pouches crossed the chest, and a dark gray metallic helmet covered the face. The man opened the door and waved Everin in. Everin proceeded through the door and into a large storage room. Storage racks lined the sides, and the center of the room was empty, with a chair in the back part of the room. Don't move, said the man, as he yanked Everin's utility handle off. Not sure what this is, but it's mine now. The man instructed Everin to sit in the chair while he placed some equipment on one of the storage rack shelves. Everin sighed and walked over to the chair and sat down. The man put the utility handle into one of the pouches on his bandolier. He then walked to the halfway point of the room while eyeing Everin cautiously and laid a device at the base of the left and right walls. The devices lit up a reddish transparent field between them that segmented the room into two areas. He then took two square devices and tossed one to each side of him up near the ceiling. The man took off his helmet and turned to face Everin. The face had multiple hues of green scales. He had small, beady eyes, a thin neck, and several gills on the side of his face. You have been captured by the infamous Creole Jewel, and you are in a safe house that's been soundproofed, so don't get any ideas about shouting. The field in front of you is a motion sensor. You cross it, and you get zapped. You really should be thankful that it was me, and not one of those other filthy bounty hunters. If it was one of them, you probably would be dead. Everin eyed Creole. I see. Why did you spare me? Creole cocked his head. Because I'm efficient and not stupid. A dead bounty means no pay. The bounty issuer wants visual proof it is you before being sent in, and you must be alive to respond to them. I don't understand why this step is needed. Everin nodded. Not sure why you need to do visual proof either. May I ask a few harmless questions? Creole laughed as he fiddled with the equipment he had put on the storage shelf earlier. Sure, why not? Since you asked all polite-like. You'll be talking to the bounty issuer yourself here in a few anyways. Everin put his right hand on his chin, with a finger extended a little past the right part of his lip. How much did they put out for me? Creole gave Everin a strained look. Most low-level scum go for twenty thousand credits. More important people can go from one hundred thousand to five hundred thousand. Yours is five million. That is unheard of for a bounty. Sounds like a lot. Whoever this is must really want me. Not a person. This is a corporate-issued bounty from Ciro's Industries. I don't know why they want you, and I don't care. All that matters to me is I get paid, said Creel, as he turned back to the equipment. Cregans only allow state-sponsored bounty hunting. It would be illegal for an individual to issue one, much less a corporation. They don't publicize it to the Cregans. They use proxies and the black market, which everyone knows who they are for. There are also those in power who look the other way if it's discovered for the right price. Everin relaxed into the chair with his hands laced in front of him. Interesting. So, if you do this visual proof, but do not deliver, what happens? Creel spoke without looking up. I don't get anything for my effort, then. That's laughable, though. Creel pressed a button on the device he was working on, and it lit up with blue and orange lights. He grabbed an orb from his pouch and held it near the device. The orb lit up. Now we can get this visual proof out of the way. 
What a pain in the ass. Creel tossed the orb into the air, where it hovered. He activated the device on the shelf, and a light coalesced around the orb, ending in the shape of a female Ildoran. She had on a crisp black and gold uniform. Ciro's Industries, Bounty Agency, how may I help you? said the Ildoran. This is Creole Jewel. This bounty requires visual proof. The bounty is Everin. The Eldoran tapped at a console in front of her, and with wide eyes said, Oh, okay. Note on bounty says Ciros personally wants to do it, patching him through. Creel clenched his fist several times and paced around. The Eldoran disappeared, and Ciros appeared. Boost your signal, Creel. I can't see anything except blobs, said Ciros. Creel went to the device and adjusted it. Can you see now? Ciro's looked around and immediately fixated on Everin. It is you. So we meet again. Everin leaned forward with clasped hands just below his chin and studied Ciro's. I am not sure we have met. Ciro's walked up to the motion field and studied Everin. He then turned to face Creel. Creel. Did you read the bounty profile on Everin? Yeah, said Creel. Then you didn't read the special notes section very well. Where are his wrist and ankle constraints? asked Ciro's. I didn't think they were necessary. He's behind a zapping motion sensor field, and when I transfer him, I will have my Tyralian wide beam phaser covering him. I don't see the issue, said Creel. Ciro sighed and looked at Everin and tilted his head. His utility handle is missing as well. Where is it? Creel tapped his chest. If you mean that thing on his side, I have it here. Ciro dipped his head and put his hand on his forehead while massaging his temples. Well... I will give you a hundred thousand for providing the opportunity to at least talk to Everin. Even getting that is difficult. Your reputation may take a hit, though. Creole's face contorted. What are you talking about? Once this is over, I'm flying him right over. Ciro's faced Creole. Here's why you won't. First... Those constraints dampen his movement significantly. They were custom-built specifically for Everin. They lock up his legs and arms. You should have procured them before attempting this. Second, you have his utility handle on your chest. If you read the special notes section, you would know why that is a bad idea. He turned to Everin. You may as well get it over with. I would like to talk with you afterward, however. Everin nodded. I am sorry for this, Creel. He interacted with his ARI, causing blue electricity from the utility handle to envelop Creel. Creel shouted out in surprise and then slumped to the ground, unconscious. Everin stood up and approached the motion-sensing shield eyeing the two zappers just outside it on opposite walls. He extended his right arm through the shield and angled it. The zappers fired, with both beams bouncing off Everin's shield and hitting each other. They exploded, and the motion-sensing field dissipated. Everin reached down and rolled Creole over. He grabbed his utility handle and put it back on his belt while looking around the room, and then focused on Ciro's. That is taken care of. I have some questions for you. Ciro scrutinized Everin, then waved a dismissive gesture at him. Likewise. Go ahead. Why do you have a bounty on me? Ciro laughed. You are kidding me, right? After all that you've done? I am not sure what you are referring to. Ciro tilted his head as he looked at Everin. He paused before speaking. Hmm. Could it be? He peered closer at Everin. I know you are traveling with Dr. Snowden and Emily. 
I had your credentials flagged false when Creole reported you to me. I had hoped to just come pick you all up, but it appears you split up, and now the credentials are valid somehow. Have you forgotten what happened on Celius Prime? I have never been there. Ciros drew his lips flat. Well then, that explains a lot. It would seem this is your first time meeting me. How ironic. When you meet me next, it will most likely be me meeting you for the first time. That would explain how you knew so much about me back then, given the available information of this time period. He shook his head. Time travel and its quirks. So you met a future possible version of me, said Everin. Ciro smirked. Several times. You escape me every time. I suspect you will this time, too. Otherwise, those future meetings from your perspective will never occur. I wonder, though, if I were to capture you now, if that would cause those meetings to disappear, thus changing my own timeline. Anything is possible. Time travel is complex. It appears you know this already. You still have not explained what it is I did to you, said Everin. Ciros exhaled sharply through his nose. Well, for starters, the amount of lives you take is staggering. You're a mass murderer on a scale I have never seen before. You travel through time. That is established. You make changes in the timeline. However, when you make changes, it causes things in the future to change. Whole civilizations can blink out of existence. I suspect you don't even give it a second thought, or even care. I studied the rifts since you mentioned it to me in one of our previous meetings, and although they do the same thing as you, they do not have a consciousness. You do. You willingly interfere in the timeline. I can't do anything with the rifts just yet. I can, however, do something about you. Everin looked at the ground, then back at Ciro's. Yes, those things can happen. You are wrong, however. I do consider what impacts my presence can do. I do not think you are hunting me because I time travel. Ciro's chuckled. <laughs> You're right. I am Antigulin, the last of my race. Thanks to you. The Antigulin civilization was one of the casualties of one of your timeline changes due to something you will do in your future, or have already done in your past, I don't know which. Thankfully, my area of research was temporal shielding. I was able to apply it to my ship. One day, I stepped out of my ship, and my world was a desert. My race gone, my family, friends, loved ones, all gone. Took me a while to piece together what happened. A race that shouldn't have existed destroyed my civilization before it had time to develop, and I believe you were responsible for it. Ciro smiled. Don't worry. The planet that race lived on is no more. Ciro's cleared his throat and licked his lips. You must be stopped. I am sorry to hear that. However, since you mentioned it to me, I will make a note to stay away from Antigulan space, said Everin. It won't matter. We have already had this discussion. The fact that we have means nothing changes by you knowing about it. However, not all is lost if I can capture you now, even if it changes my past, said Ciro's. Everin half grinned. I can feel the vibration of a group coming this way. I will not be here when they arrive. Your attempt to stall me was unsuccessful. However, 
Before I go, two things. One, the timeline can be changed as you know. And two, what happens in this timeline is of little consequence to the universe. Cyrus's eyes widened. Are you implying there are other timelines? Everin pulled out his utility handle and extended it into a baton. Something for you to think about. Cyrus's face contorted in anger. No! You always do this! You leave me with some obscure reference and then run away! My apologies, then, said Everin, as he extended his baton to the hollow orb. It shuddered. Then the image of Cyrus dissipated. Everin grabbed the orb and studied it, then put it away in the side tray on his utility belt. He picked up the motion sensors and then pulled off a data device from Creole's limp body. With one final look around, he exited the building. Chapter 4 Dr. Snowden Emily and V stood outside the Drodalian exhibit with Andia Kiggs. I'm Dr. Snowden. He put his right hand across his chest, then motioned at Emily. This is my niece, Emily, and the robot is our friend, V. Pleased to make your acquaintance. We should head to a less, said Andia as she looked around, public place. She pointed to a small ship nearby. Let's take my ship to the Fedorian Embassy. Dr. Snowden drew his lips flat and cocked his head, then glanced at Emily and V. Guess we have no choice, then. He was not too worried about going with Andia, as they had V, and he hoped Everin would come if there was any serious trouble. Together they followed Andia and her guards to the ship. Dr. Snowden noted it was small and had a hatch door on the backside. It reminded him of a sports utility vehicle without wheels. As they approached the ship, the hatch door raised. One of the guards walked in while the other motioned for them to step in. They followed Andia into the ship. The interior reminded Dr. Snowden of a cargo airplane. There were benches along the sides with cabinet-like structures before the piloting area jutting out forming a natural doorway to the front of the ship. The two guards had taken their seats up front already, so he sat down next to V. Emily and Andia had sat down opposite them. The hatch door closed. He looked out the window on the door as the ship took off and verified that the ship was a flying craft. Andia cleared her throat. So... Your Fedorians, I hear. Dr. Snowden nodded. May as well be honest, since we aren't fooling anyone, apparently. No, we're from Earth. The credentials are forged. Andia tilted her head. Yes, I know. I validated your credentials when they were reported to us, since Cregans tend to be a bit overhanded when dealing with things like this. "'especially if it concerns Fredorians.' "'Someone reported us?' asked Emily. "'Yes. Shortly after you arrived. "'It wasn't until Cesaris notified me that I was aware of it. "'Be glad I got to you first, said Andia. "'She narrowed her eyes. "'How is it you speak fluent Cregan?' "'Emily shrugged. "'We learn fast.' Andia tilted her head at Emily. Unlikely. You speak it better than I do, and I have spoken it for a long time. Why do you choose to use Fedorian credentials, given our tumultuous relations with the Cregans and our less-than-stellar image? V raised his hand. It was my decision to use Fedorian credentials. I was unaware of difficulties in Cregan and Fedorian relations outside of the many incidents recorded. We were aware of the Cregan perception of Fedorians as troublemakers. However, given that you are human, it was the logical choice. Andia half smiled. Well, in that regard, my robot friend, you chose well. However, 
Visitors from Fedoria usually don't get a good reaction from those who know of us. The Gungrolicks seem to like Fedoria, said Emily. The Gungrolicks, said Andia, as she studied Emily. We don't deal with them much, but they have stood with us before on political matters. She looked at a device on her wrist. It's about dinner time. Have any of you had anything to eat? Emily shook her head. No, but I could use a burger about now. Dr. Snowden nodded in agreement. Not sure what is safe to eat here. Andia nodded. I'm not sure what a burger is, but we can kill two dashiliks with one stone. We can discuss your situation and have dinner. If you will excuse me, I need to head to the front for a bit. Dr. Snowden nodded as he eased back into his seat. He reflected on the situation. Everin was off doing who knows what. They had visited five different exhibits and learned more about Fedoria. Then there was Andia. She seemed to be very calm and collected. He did not know if they were in trouble or not, but Andia's friendly banter seemed to indicate they were not. She was also easy on the eyes. He had been hungry when they went to the Drodalian exhibit, but the smell of burnt flesh turned his stomach. Hopefully the Fedorians can do better. The ship landed on a pad on top of a building. The hatch door opened, and Andia walked by Dr. Snowden, Emily, and V. Follow me. They followed Andia out of the ship. Dr. Snowden took a look around and could see far in every direction. It was easy for him to see the different exhibits as they were, for the most part, different in how they appeared, sometimes drastically. Other small ships like the one they came in were flying around. There were several other buildings similar to the one they were on, so he figured this must be some type of embassy grouping. Emily tugged on his arm. He turned and saw Andia motioning for them to go into a door on the side of the small roof building. They walked through the door. Once inside, Andia led them down a ramp to a large hall. Several people were milling about and turned to stare at them as they entered the hall. Andia walked past them and into one of the large rooms that hung off the side. Dr. Snowden noticed the amount of guards present. The guards had on body armor with some advanced-looking weaponry. Emily tugged his arm again, and he realized he was doing more sightseeing than following. They walked into the room Andia had went in. It was large and had a circular table in the middle. There were seats scattered around it, and between each seat on the table were black semi-translucent strips, which stood out from the white table. Andia indicated for them to sit. Dr. Snowden eyed the seats and took the nearest one. Emily sat to his left, and V to his right. Andia sat across from them. Andia interacted with the table console. This place is secure. You can talk freely. There is a console on the table you can use to select food items. Dr. Snowden glanced at Emily, then at the table console. There were a myriad of options and menus. He messed around with the options, finally selecting a spicy rice dish with what appeared to be chunks of chicken in a thick sauce. With drawn-down lips, he tapped at the console. Well, here goes. The black strip to his right on the table retracted toward the center of the table, and a tray rose up with his food. He noted that the sauce was a slightly different color than pictured. His eyes widened as he looked at Emily. Well, that's different. Emily rested her chin on her left hand. That looks like Indian food. You hate Indian food. Dr. Snowden paused as he looked at the dish. He inhaled as the smell of hot spices flooded his nostrils. Emily was right. He was not sure why he selected it, but he seemed to have a craving for something spicy, so he had selected the nearest thing that looked like it. Emily selected a spicy, burger-like food item and purple fries from the menu options. Her food appeared, and she tasted one of the fries. It's actually not bad. Tastes a bit like a sweet potato with pepper. Andia smiled, then glanced at V. Do you want anything? I suppose you don't eat, but we have various fluids your robotic body might like. 
I do not require sustenance. Thank you for your inquiry, Andia Kiggs, Prime Ambassador of Fredoria. Andia grinned as she pulled a salad with some orange meat on it in front of her. You can just call me Andia. That will be fine. No need to be so formal. She turned to Dr. Snowden and Emily. Now, how did you get here from Earth? Dr. Snowden swallowed his bite and then looked at Andia. It's a long story. Maybe we should wait until Everin arrives before we say anything. Andia nodded. Suit yourself. Enjoy your dinner while we wait, then. Dr. Snowden cast a sidelong glance at Emily and drew his lips to one side. They continued eating in silence until a woman in a tan-colored robe walked into the room. She stood beside Andia and whispered in her ear. Andia nodded and looked at them. This is my assistant. She tells me your friend Everin has arrived and is on his way in. After a few minutes, Everin entered the room and stood behind Dr. Snowden and Emily, placing a hand on each of their shoulders. So, did I miss anything? Emily gestured at Dr. Snowden. Other than me and Uncle Albert craving spicy food, not much. Everin narrowed his eyes as he looked at Dr. Snowden. I see. Dr. Snowden turned around and studied Everin. Everin's outfit looked dirtied and he doubted Everin really went looking for a place for them to stay. He waved to his seat past V. Just waiting on you to get here before saying anything. Everin walked over to the seat past V and sat down. A wise precaution. However, in this case, not necessary. You can speak honestly with Andia. She is to be trusted. Andia jerked her head back. I don't believe we've met. But thank you for the kind words. We have not, but you have an admirable service record. You also did not put my friends into a holding cell. I was asking Dr. Snowden how they came here from Earth, said Andia, as she dipped her head toward Dr. Snowden. Everin accessed the table console and then looked up and around. He focused on Dr. Snowden and circled a hand at him. I see. Dr. Snowden, go ahead. Dr. Snowden extended a hand out, palm down. Okay. To keep it short, Everin and V saved me and Emily from an alien abduction, and now we travel with him. An alien abduction? Human slavery was outlawed over five hundred years ago. Do you know which race they were? asked Andia as she clenched her jaw. They called themselves the Crotovore, said Emily, shooting a look at Everin. Andia tapped at the table console. She shook her head. Not seeing them in the system. Oh, actually, said Emily, wagging a finger. They came through Creek in space. We saw their last visual log that said they were attacked. Everin said it was most likely the Cregans that did it. And this was recent? asked Andia, placing her hand on her chin and a finger over her lips. About three months ago, said Dr. Snowden, glancing at Everin. Everin half smiled. You do not need to check with me after every statement. Please, be honest with Andia. He looked at V. Did you not drink or eat anything? V turned his head toward Everin. I did not take in any sustenance. Everin put a hand on V's shoulder. V, it is customary when invited to dinner to have something, even if you do not need or require it. For example, said Everin, as he faced Dr. Snowden, I will have what he had. The black strip nearest Everin pulled back, and a plate with spicy rice and chicken-like chunks appeared. Everin pulled the plate in front of him, then motioned at V. V accessed the table console, and the black strip near him pulled back. A glass with silver liquid came up. He nodded at Everin. This will suffice. I apologize. Please continue, Andia, said Everin, nodding. Andia opened her mouth slightly ajar as if to say something. 
She glanced to the side, then turned toward Dr. Snowden. Was the ship very large? Yeah. We were just glad to get off it in one piece. If it wasn't for Everin and V, we wouldn't be sitting here, said Dr. Snowden. I can transfer the image of the ship from my databanks to the table if you wish to see it, said V. Andia nodded at V and gestured toward the table console near him. V's fingers flew over the table console, and an image of the Crotovor vessel appeared in the center of the table. This was their ship. Andia scrutinized the display. The Dirnaz incident. I read about it. That display matches what was reported in the Dirnaz system. A large ship coming out of nowhere is very unusual, especially one of that size. It fought a pitched battle until a Kriegan dreadnought arrived. It then disappeared. And you were all on it? Dr. Snowden swallowed his bite. Yeah. Once Everin got us home, he came back three months later to check up on us, and we asked to travel with him. He said yes and asked where we wanted to go. Since he had mentioned the Kriegan Star Empire when we were on the Crotovor ship, I wanted to see what that was. V then suggested we come to this event as a way of meeting many cultures, and here we are. Andia smiled and took a bite out of her salad. A very interesting journey, if not a bit rough. It is unusual to see anyone from a protected planet, though. Dr. Snowden nodded. Yeah, that's what Cesara said. We didn't mean to cause any trouble. We were just curious. Well, we're human after all, said Andia grinning and nodding as she gestured at Dr. Snowden. Dr. Snowden and Emily had finished most of their meal and relaxed back into their chairs. Dr. Snowden had enjoyed the food, and also enjoyed talking with Andia. He could see why she was Prime Ambassador. She was easy to talk to, and had a reassuring tone when she spoke. "'Did you enjoy your meals?' asked Andia. "'It was surprisingly good.' I haven't had a burger like that in a long time, although I'm not sure it was beef, said Emily. Everin nodded. It probably was not. Did you find accommodations for the night? asked Dr. Snowden. I did. How was the Drodalian exhibit? asked Everin. Dr. Snowden adjusted himself in his chair as he turned toward Everin. Enlightening, to say the least. I think you would have liked Cesares, our tour guide. Friendly fellow. I will say, though, it smelled horrible in there. Everin pursed his lips at Andia, causing Dr. Snowden to look at her. Andia was grimacing. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened. Did I say something wrong? Andia shifted her mouth to the side. No, you would have no way of knowing. That smell you encountered was most likely roast human. Jordalians consider humans a delicacy, something they look forward to when coming to Kriegis. No doubt they got them from the black market. Dr. Snowden watched Emily dry heave. He rubbed the goosebumps on his arm. It dawned on him why Cesara said it was unusual for a Fredorian to be there. Although history had some role... It was the consumption of humans that would have really stood out. It also explained all the sizing up the other Drodalians did when they were there. That's disgusting. How can the Kriegans allow that? They feign ignorance, but the black market is strong here. You can get pretty much anything for the right price. I don't know where they get the humans and have protested but the Drodalians are held in higher regard than Fredoria. It didn't used to be like that in the past, though. We are still seen as a slave race, said Andia. Dr. Snowden noticed Emily wipe her mouth. It would appear she was done eating, but so was he. His appetite was gone. Everin cleared his throat and faced Andia. On another note... How are the preparations for the full partner trade agreements with the Kriegans going? What do you mean? asked Andia. The Acheron. 
Did you not find the crystals for it and activate it, then give it to the Cregans in exchange for a full trade partnership? asked Everin, with narrowed eyes. The Archeron, said Andia, as she chuckled. No one knows where the Archeron crystals are. If something like that was occurring, trust me, I would know. I don't even know what we would do if that happened. Everin nodded his head. Probably things like ask for a new Cregan Ranger program and better representation within the Senate. Andia narrowed her eyes. Those are awfully specific. You know something I don't? Emily tilted her head at Andia. What exactly is the Archeron? It was a device that allowed the Cregans to receive messages from the Great Selector. The base of it is on the ancient Cregan homeworld, but it's missing three crystals. No one knows where they are, and they have spent a lot of resources looking for them. If they were found, getting a full partner trade agreement would be easy to do, said Andia, gesturing at Everin. And also all those other things you mentioned— the Emperor would grant literally whatever we want, within reason, of course. It is a lost cause, though. The Great Selector? asked Emily. Sorry to ask so many questions. Andia smiled. It's okay. I forget you probably wouldn't know about that. I figured if you learned to speak Cregan as well as you do, you may have studied other aspects of Cregan culture— the Great Selector is a being made of some type of light in the form of a ball with tendrils coming off it that supposedly guided the evolution of the Cregans. They believe they are a chosen race, superior to all other humanoids. So they think it's a god, said Dr. Snowden. Yes. Five thousand years ago, the Cregans fled their ancient homeworld in three colony ships, which were built based on a warning received through the Archeron. The Cregans prepared a defense for an invasion from space, but the threat was portals opening everywhere on and around the planet, bringing forth abominations that ravaged their world. I'm curious now. Why all the interest? Everin eased back into his chair and laced his fingers. Just curious is all. He glanced around the room at everyone, and finally back to Andia. It would appear we have a new purpose. Find the Archeron crystals and assemble the Archeron. Then get Fredoria a full trade partnership. Andia laughed. Well, I would certainly like that if you did. But if the Cregans can't find it, I don't suspect you would fare any better. Do you know where the Archeron crystals are? I do not, but I believe we can find them. Andia shot an incredulous look at Dr. Snowden and Emily. Dr. Snowden figured she was trying to figure out if Everin was really being serious. If Everin believes he can find it, he probably can. Andia ran her fingertips across her chin and then glanced back up at Everin. What makes you think you will succeed where others have failed? Everin smiled. My ship is unique, and the technology at our disposal is more advanced than that of those who would have tried before. On top of that, we might be able to find information that would otherwise be hard to obtain. Andia shook her head. And you're doing this just to help Fedoria out? Everin paused as he looked at the table, then met Andia's gaze. Not quite. Since you are involved, it will not hurt to tell you that we can travel in time. When V told me who he was with, I looked you up in my ship's database. This event was a major milestone in human history, and you are associated with it. I do not have all the details on it, just a short summary that it occurred and you were involved. The Fredorians present the Archeron to the Emperor— and I am guessing it is you who does that. Andia stared at Everin for a few moments. That's quite a story. While I like the sound of this Fedorian destiny, 
I'm not sure I believe your explanation. You want me to believe you are time travelers here to set the record straight? Everin smiled. I did not know we would be involved until this point, as there was no mention of us in the summary. We will leave tomorrow morning, and even if you do not believe my previous answer, I still request you come with us. Andia turned her head and paused before speaking. Why? Per Cregan protocol, we need official sponsorship for this mission if an audience with the Emperor is required. I am thinking it must be for Dorian's sponsorship. Andia narrowed her eyes. This situation is very unusual. I am sorry, but I am not buying that you are time travelers or that you have a list of human events from across time. I will need to think about it. For now, you can all stay here tonight. The embassy has more than enough guest rooms. The kitchen is also open all night, so if you want anything, just head on over to it. My assistant will show you to your rooms, and if you need directions, just press the bright panels on the wall. A virtual intelligence will help you. Any questions? Dr. Snowden glanced around at the others. None here. He thought it was interesting that Andia did not even flinch at the mention of time travel. He remembered the first time he heard Everin talk about it, and to an advanced civilization, that concept would probably have been well researched. Everin raised a finger. I suspect you doubt our intent. Have the Cregans do a full scan on my ship. They might be surprised at the results. He interacted with the table console. It is on landing pad A-772. A full scan, huh? said Andia, chuckling. She looked at her table console. That may take a bit. Very well. I will see everyone here tomorrow morning. Andia's assistant escorted them to their rooms. Dr. Snowden wanted to check out the embassy, but he was tired. More tired than he could recall feeling. Maybe it was his body adjusting to all the activity or the twenty-six hour day. He passed out when he got to his room. A beam of sunlight peeked through the window, waking him up eight hours later. He sat up on the edge of his bed and stretched. He noticed the room he was in seemed less advanced than the Torvada's room, but he was not sure many could compare with that. As he cleaned up and put on his clothes, his PSD vibrated and then lit up. The PSD made him feel more secure, and he was getting used to it. Pressing the middle button this time instead of the top button caused a holographic display of Emily to shoot out the end. "'About time you got up. We're back in the room we were in last night having breakfast,' said Emily. He noted she seemed excited this morning. He navigated the hallways, eventually arriving at the room. When entering the room, he saw that Andia, Everin, Emily, and V were already seated, and Andia's assistant stood to the side of Andia. Andia's lightly armored brown suit caught his eye. It surprised him in that he had not seen an out-of-shape Fedorian since his arrival at the embassy. Andia had a sidearm and multiple pouches across the suit. He noticed on Kriegis that light-armored suits tended to be the norm more than the exception. He got the feeling she was looking forward to this. After picking an open seat and looking around... He accessed the table console and picked a dish that looked like eggs and bacon. The black strip pulled back, and he took the plate off it and placed it in front of him. The eggs were blue, and the bacon looked like beef jerky. He wondered briefly what animal they came from before digging in. So, what now? Andia pointed at Everin. I'm going with you. I had the full scan done last night on his ship. According to the results, your ship doesn't exist. That's impossible. I'm not sure what tech is being used, but it is clearly more advanced than the Kriegans. I still don't believe in this Fedorian destiny or time travel business, but it will be nice to do something other than attend meetings all day. I have cleared my schedule for this. Andia's assistant whispered something in Andia's ear. Andia nodded. 
My assistant is against this for the official record. Everin eyed Andia. It might be dangerous. I'm a Fedorian, working on the Cregan homeworld. My job is dangerous by its very definition. I have some time off coming up, so moving it up won't be an issue. May as well use it for something that might turn out to be interesting. Everin nodded at Andia. My ship, the Torvada, has all the amenities someone of your position is used to. Then it is settled, said Andia. She looked at Dr. Snowden. Once you are done, I am going to contact Valia to Cross, a powerful senator who can get us an audience with the Emperor should we succeed. Dr. Snowden nodded and then proceeded to wolf down his breakfast. He put the plate back on the opened black strip, and it disappeared as the black strip closed up. If you're ready, I am. Andia tapped at the table console and then turned around to face a large screen behind her. The head and shoulders of an elder Cregan woman appeared on screen. She had silver ribbons intertwined in her hair, making her purple hair falling off her curved, cone-shaped head stand out. Andia, it is good to see you. I have read your request and seen the ship scan reports, which I find hard to believe, and find it intriguing, said the senator. Thank you, Senator Cross. We are honored by your presence. I have with me those who seek the lost Archeron crystals, said Andia. She pointed to Everin. This is Everin, and his crew of Dr. Snowden, Emily Snowden, and V said Andia, as she pointed at them in turn. They believe they can find them, and plan to begin immediately. I will be accompanying them. I wish you well on your journey, Andia, said Senator Cross. She faced Everin. I would suggest you start by visiting the information broker in the Gulvin Rim. Andia jerked her head back. The Gulvin Rim? That's a lawless place. Senator Crass smiled. Yes, and many have gone there to speak with the information broker without success. I suspect he will talk with you. Why is that? asked Everin. You aren't Cregan. Nonetheless, I am sending an inspector and a ranger. They should serve you well. They will be there within the hour. They will not be necessary, said Everin, meeting Senator Cross's gaze. I insist. Andia shot Everin a look, then faced Senator Cross. That will be fine, Senator. We will let you know the moment we find anything. Senator Cross closed her eyes and bowed her head. Safe journeys to you all. The screen flickered off. Andia turned to Everin. What was that about? Everin met Andia's gaze. How well do you know this senator? Enough to know she has a lot of power. She has never been a true friend to Fredoria, but she understands the possibility of this venture. Everin narrowed his eyes. I see. She wants to keep tabs on our progress. There might be some value in that. He glanced at V. Once the inspector and ranger come, we can go. V, head to the ship and bring it to this landing pad. Acknowledged, said V. He stood up and walked out of the room. Dr. Snowden noticed the change in Everin's body language. It was apparent Senator Cross rubbed Everin the wrong way. He did not notice anything unusual about the senator, but he was still new to everything. Everin could surely read alien body language much better than he could. Emily had walked to one of the large rectangular windows and was looking out. He walked up and stood beside her. Pretty amazing where we are, huh? Emily smiled as she pushed a stray strand of hair out of her face. It's so hard to believe. We're looking at the morning on an alien planet. It's so cool. Dr. Snowden laughed. <laughs> it is. 
And now we get to find lost artifacts. Now that is cool. Emily half grinned at Dr. Snowden. It's so weird to hear you say something is cool. Maybe feeling like I'm in my twenties is having an effect on my vocabulary, said Dr. Snowden as he bumped Emily. Emily smiled and put her arm around Dr. Snowden. Dr. Snowden thought again about how nice it was having her here. She was getting to share in the experience, one that would have seemed ridiculous only three months ago. As he looked out the window, he thought about how much Dan would have loved to see this. A grin crept onto his face as he looked down at Emily, who had put her head on his arm. He knew he could never fill Dan's role in Emily's life but he would try to be there for her when needed. An hour later, a Cregan in a two-tone blue and silver robe with elaborate markings and a lightly armored Cregan walked into the room. The Cregan in the robe stepped forward. I am Inspector Silva Gahajorn, here to fulfill the role of observer on this mission. I will ensure Cregan law is observed and followed. The armored Cregan stepped forward and placed his right arm palm down across his chest in a straight line. Ranger Rakar Ho Jador, reporting for duty. Dr. Snowden noted Rakar's silver armor. Although it appeared somewhat thin, it was scuffed, like it had seen battles. It was thicker than Andia's armor. Rakar had a weapon of some type slung behind him, with smaller sidearms on his thighs. Dr. Snowden saw no helmet, but figured Rakar probably did not wear them to a first introduction, or maybe there was some technology that spawned it that he couldn't see. He noticed Rakar's boots had a thick sole, and the gauntlets on his arms were also larger than the rest of the other armor pieces. On Rakar's shoulders were two mounted devices. His belt looked like it was part of the upper body armor and had several pouches on it. The purple skin of the Cregan stood out to Dr. Snowden again. He wondered why their skin was purple. Rikar's head had small ridges on the backward cone part of the head he saw on the other Cregans, but they were not as pronounced as the ridges on Silva. Rikar was definitely younger than Silva, probably in his early thirties, assuming Cregans age the same as humans. Maybe that was why Rikar looked formidable to him. He noted that Silva had a belt and a small sidearm hanging off it. He had a large metallic forearm device, and a metallic badge stood out on the sleeve of his right arm. Andia saluted Rakar with a Fedorian salute. At ease, Rakar. This is a civilian venture, so you don't need to be so formal. This may be a civilian venture, but I expect Cregan protocols to be observed, said Silva raising a finger. Andia smirked. We will try to observe them, but this is a Fedorian mission. Whatever you say, I'm merely here to observe and report. Andia drew her lips flat and narrowed her eyes as she shook her head. Dr. Snowden could see Andia did not care much for Silva. He wondered if it was due to their relations, or something more personal. Do either of you need to get gear, or are you both ready to go? asked Andia. Rikar crooked his thumb behind him. We have a supply container outside the room. That is all we will need. Yes, we came prepared per Cregan protocol, said Silva, tilting his head with his lips drawn to the side. Andia sighed. Fine. Let me introduce you to the crew we will be going out with. She pointed to Everin and to the others in turn. This is Everin. He is providing transport for this mission. Next to him are V and Dr. Snowden and his niece, Emily. Now, I have a few things to wrap up, so give me about fifteen minutes and we can head out. Everin walked up to Rakar and extended his hand. Rakar shook it and dipped his head. I hope to serve you well. Everin tilted his head at Rakar. I am sure you will. What do you think of this venture? Rakar glanced around, then turned back to Everin. If you can find the Archeran crystals, 
it will be monumental. We wouldn't be here as a species if the Archeron hadn't spoken to us. I am excited to have the opportunity to be part of a crew that might actually find the crystals. I read the results of the recent scan on your ship. It's clear your technology is superior to our own. Everin nodded. What do you think of Senator Cross? Be honest. Rikar cocked his head back and looked at Andia. Andia gestured for him to speak. Well, we've not had the best of relationships. I'm not sure why she selected me, but I am glad to be here. It beats being in the Ranger Reserve. Everin eyed Rikar for a few moments, then nodded. He then walked up to Silva. What do you think of this venture? Silva cocked his head. To be honest, uh, I think it's a waste of time. It seems every week someone has found them, but no proof. We get these requests to provide support for them all the time. However, none of them have come from a prime ambassador. Regardless of my opinion, you can be assured I will assist in any way, assuming everything is legal. Everin nodded. What do you think of Senator Cross? She is a credit to our species, and an example that all Cregans should follow, said Silva, giving Rakar a sidelong glance. I see, said Everin. Dr. Snowden noted the pattern Everin was doing. It appeared these two Cregans had two very different views of this trip. Maybe it was a job thing. Silva had mentioned that these types of requests were routine. He hoped Silva wouldn't turn out to be a thorn in their side. Rikar, on the other hand, was enthusiastic and genuinely interested in the trip. He was not sure why they needed a ranger, or what they were exactly, but guessed it must be a Cregan policy to have one. After a bit, Andia looked up from her table console in triumph. Detail work is done. Let's move. They headed up to the landing pad and then exited the building to arrive at the Torvada ramp. Dr. Snowden chuckled when he saw Silva, Rikar, and Andia staring at the Torvada as they walked up the ramp. He figured they probably had never seen anything like it. He noticed the other alien ships when they first arrived, and none of them looked remotely close to the Torvada. That is an interesting looking ship. It's going to be cramped, said Rikar as he scrutinized the Torvada. You might be surprised, said Dr. Snowden, half grinning. Rikar glanced at Dr. Snowden and nodded. Once inside, Everin motioned to V, who was waiting for them at the top of the ramp. Take them to their rooms. Acknowledged. Once you are all settled in, please come to the front of the ship. V will show you where it is, said Everin. Dr. Snowden smiled as he saw Silva, Rikar, and Andia do a double-take when they walked into the living quarters entrance. They were probably trying to figure out how it could exist. He remembered back to his first time going through that door. They would most likely be impressed by the rooms as well. He followed Everin and Emily to the front of the ship. Everin sat in his command chair while Dr. Snowden and Emily sat in the right U-shaped seating area. Dr. Snowden turned to face Everin. So, what was that really all about with the senator? Everin smiled. Noticed that, did you? The senator wants to keep tabs on us. For what reason, I do not know. Whatever it is, I suspect there is a hidden agenda. Rikar seemed pretty nice, said Emily. He is. He seems honorable. I do not know what the strained relationship with the senator is about, but if he has one, then he may provide a useful balance to Silva, said Everin. Silva seems like he might be trouble, said Dr. Snowden. Everin shook his head. I am not sure about that. Regardless of his personal view, I suspect he has Cregan interests at heart and will not tolerate corruption. That may work in our favor. At the very least, 
Any group wishing to interfere will know our whereabouts due to his reporting, and we can maybe see who we are dealing with. We will need to be cautious. Dr. Snowden could not see that, but he would trust Everin's judgment. Ten minutes later, V walked up, followed by Silva, Rakar, and Andia. Everin motioned for them to sit in the left U-shaped seating area. They took their seats. This ship is amazing. How are those rooms possible? asked Andia. Dimensional mechanics, said Dr. Snowden, smiling. Andia shook her head. I've heard of that, but it was theoretical. I wouldn't believe it, but I just saw it. For Doria could use something like that. Everin smiled at Andia. I am sure they could. The Empire could use it as well, said Silva. Everin pursed his lips and narrowed his eyes. I am sure they would use it for peaceful purposes. Now, this information broker, what do we know of him? Andia tapped at her tablet. He is supposedly on an asteroid station deep in the Galvin Rim. The place is a free-for-all for those who exist outside the law. It's a perfect spot for someone like him. And a perfect spot to get killed, said Silva. Ricard snorted. Not with a ranger present. Everin nodded at Andia. Do you have the coordinates? Yes. Everin gestured at V, who walked over to Andia and looked at her tablet. Coordinates acquired. Take us there. Acknowledged. The Torvada lifted off and soared into space. The front screen split into two parts. The left side showed outside, while the right side showed a galactic map. The map zoomed to the coordinates Andia gave. It showed blank space. Interesting. It does not show up at all. We will need to find it if it has moved, said Everin. If you're using the standard Cregan maps as a source, it won't show up. But it's there said Andia. Silva sighed. That is at least a ten-day journey, and that's using a compressed space drive. We will be there in a few moments, said Everin. Once the Torvado was a fair distance from Kriegis, it shot out a gold beam, and a portal appeared in front of the ship, which the Torvada flew through. After a short trip through the semi-transparent tunnel, they exited into space with nothing around them. What was that? asked Silva, with widened eyes. That was your estimate being done in five seconds. V, scan for the asteroid station, said Everin. Acknowledged. After a few minutes, a green highlighted object appeared faintly in the right front window. Take us in. Acknowledged. The Torvada took off toward the asteroid station. Dr. Snowden chuckled as he saw the astonished faces on Silva, Ricard, and Andia. They were trying to figure out Everin and this ship, and the portal probably made it harder. He recalled being in their shoes and wondered if this is how Everin felt when he had picked them up. He turned back to look at the front screen. Chapter 5 After a few minutes, the Torvada approached the outskirts of the asteroid station. Dr. Snowden noted it looked like a hollowed-out asteroid with large thrusters on every side, except for a massive hole that appeared to function as the entrance. Massive turrets ringed it, reminding him of teeth. He saw smaller landing pads dotting the outside of the asteroid, he could see why those wishing for privacy would like it here. It would be easy to set up and then leave if need be. How was that possible? asked Andia. Everin half grinned. As I mentioned earlier, the Torvata is unique. It will make getting places a bit easier than if we had to do it conventionally. Your ship is impressive. I have never seen this type of capability before. If we had it, our force projection would be so much greater, said Ricard with a sparkle in his eye. Yes, it would. 
and that could be dangerous in the wrong hands, said Everin, raising a finger. Chorus is asking for intent, said V. Chorus? asked Dr. Snowden. I apologize. The docking authority refers to this asteroid station as Chorus. They have asked us for our intent. Everin nodded. Tell them we are just visiting. Acknowledged. The Torvada flew through the massive hole in the side of Chorus and then descended to a landing pad that hung off the side near the entrance. The interior lining of Chorus was packed with walkways, shops, and landing pads like the one they were approaching. The open center was filled with ships coming and going. There was an object emanating yellow light that hovered in the open space interior. Once they landed, Dr. Snowden looked out expecting to see a dock manager or something similar. But none came. He chewed on his upper lip as he looked at Andia. Expecting a welcoming party? asked Andia. Yeah, I was, sorta, said Dr. Snowden. Definitely your first visit to an asteroid station, then. The docking authority here only assigns you a landing pad. You're on your own after that, for better or worse. Everin stood up. Yes, you can expect to find many differences here from Kriegus. Silva smirked. Of course we will. This is a dump, and Kriegus isn't. Dr. Snowden sighed. Silva's constant arrogance irritated him and reminded him of a pompous politician. He wondered if Silva would hamper their efforts here. Everin seemed to think he would not, but Dr. Snowden found that hard to believe. Okay, from what we know, this place can be dangerous. We will need to stick together, said Everin. Silva tapped at his forearm device. This is odd. I can't communicate back home. My shields are most likely preventing that. It should work once we are off the ship. V. Orb mode. Acknowledged, said V. He walked to the back of the ship. Silva smirked and shook his head. The group assembled outside the Torvada near the ramp. Dr. Snowden noticed the smell immediately. It smelled like rotten eggs and gasoline. He coughed and waved his hand in front of his face. Strong smell out here. Andia raised a flap from her neck area and covered the lower half of her face. Don't you have a breather or filter of some type? Dr. Snowden and Emily will not need one. They will adjust automatically, and Silva and Rakar have natural protection, said Everin. Silva eyed Dr. Snowden and Emily. You can filter like a Cregan? Maybe these earthlings are more advanced than Fedorians. Emily cocked her head at Silva. Or Cregans, even. Andia chuckled. Silva smirked as he walked to the edge of the landing platform. I'm going to check in. Please, start without me. Everin nodded. Okay. Rakar and Andia, you two seem familiar with this place. What course of action do you recommend? Ricard tilted his head and gestured off in the distance. We should start at the entertainment centers. From what I've heard through various channels, that is usually the best place to find contact information. Hmm. I wonder how many there are, said Everin. He walked over to a console standing near the walkway off the landing pad. He placed his UIC on it and then perused his ARI. It appears there are eight main entertainment centers. The nearest one is close by and is called Dezul's Crater. We can start there. Any concerns? Dr. Snowden shook his head, as did the others. How did you get that information so quickly? asked Andia, pointing to the UIC on the console. Everin half smiled. Advanced technology. I've never seen technology that can hack into something that quickly before, said Andia. Everin nodded. You most likely will not again either. These systems are centralized, a vulnerability the UIC can exploit. Sylvia had rejoined them. Senator Cross wants me to meet with a contact here. I will need Rakar to escort me. 
right now? asked Emily. Yes. We can meet back here in, say, uh, a day or so. Will that be an issue? Or is my presence required for you to do whatever you're going to do? asked Silva. Everin narrowed his eyes. No, that will be fine. Do what you must. The rest of us will head to Duzul's crater. Silva began walking away. Rikar walked up to Everin. I apologize for this. I didn't know I would be escorting him on Senator Cross's personal business. Everin put a hand on Rikar's shoulder. Keep him safe. We will be okay. Rikar sighed and trudged after Silva. Dr. Snowden watched them walk away. On one hand, he was glad Silva wasn't with them. On the other hand, he wanted to talk more with Rikar. At least he would get to see more, of course. Everin gestured at Silva and Rikar once they were off the landing pad and had walked a bit away. V. Stealth mode. Keep close to them. Acknowledged, said V. He took off after Silva and Rakar. Andia smirked. Don't trust them. Just keeping tabs on them in case they get in trouble. Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia followed Everin as he walked off the landing pad onto a walkway. It led to a platform that extended a bit out from the asteroid wall. Looking up and down the platform, Dr. Snowden could see that the various shops and buildings were carved into the asteroid, with just the front of the shop sticking out. He figured there were probably access ways to the exterior of Chorus that led to landing pads he saw dotting the outside. Chorus was the definition of easy come, easy go. As they walked down the platform toward Duzol's crater, Dr. Snowden noted that the architecture of the shop fronts varied wildly. He figured this was due to the many different alien species present. He got a good look at the center object that was emanating light. It appeared to be a free-floating orb. He compared it to a miniature sun, without all the radiation. The sounds of chorus seemed to vary, from the buzz of the locals to the sounds of the multitude of ships flying around. Although he initially gagged on Chorus's smell, he had already adjusted to it. His eyesight had been hazy back at the Torvada, but it had adjusted as well. He chuckled and glanced at Emily. This is an interesting place. Pretty busy so early in the morning. Emily nodded. Yeah, it's pretty cool once you adjust to it. Andia walked alongside Emily. Morning has little meaning on stations like this. Business is open at all times, although there are some periods of time busier than others. From what I know, Chorus is particularly busy when it is morning on Kriegis. She smiled. This must be fascinating to both of you. Dr. Snowden chuckled. A week ago, I was teaching students about astronomy. Now I'm walking inside an asteroid. It's kind of surreal. After ten minutes of walking, Everin paused outside an entrance, lit by bright signs surrounding it and then raised a hand. I think we are here. They gathered around Everin, who pointed to a large doorway. Above the doorway was a large holographic sign that had an image of an asteroid with a large crater on it and the word Duzels across it. On each side of the entrance were two large reptilian humanoids. They had on patchwork armor with large weapons on their backs and sides. They reminded Dr. Snowden of what a crocodile would look like if it was humanoid. They were even more reptilian-looking than the Drodalians. He wondered if they considered humans a delicacy as well. Once inside, I will hopefully locate someone who can help us find the whereabouts of the information broker, said Everin. They walked up to the reptilians. One of them hissed. Fredorians! No trouble in here. If trouble... I am trouble. Everin nodded at them. You will not need to worry about trouble from us. We are just visiting. The reptilian that spoke before waved them in. Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia followed Everin in. Dr. Snowden knew the Fredorians had a reputation on Kriegis, but it seemed to extend out here as well. 
He coughed at the cloud of smoke that descended on him and waved his hands around, trying to dissipate it. A bit smoky in here. Andia laughed. Some of it is probably not from smoking. Dr. Snowden grimaced with wide eyes and looked at Emily. Sounds great. He noted that Doozle's was fairly large. A center area had a rectangular bar with a tough-looking humanoid serving drinks and food. The bartender had multiple flaps on his head and four arms. Dr. Snowden mused that four arms as a bartender would be quite handy. Tables and booths dotted the rest of the room. There were several doorways that he guessed were the bathrooms or maybe led to other rooms deeper in the asteroid. Although it reminded him of a typical bar on Earth, everything was high-tech looking. The walls had metal panels and consoles, and holograms seemed to be playing on some of the tables. The varied species hanging around intrigued Dr. Snowden. They ranged from humanoid to non-humanoid in various colors. The one that stood out to him was a large, cobra-looking being in the back by a large stage. He shivered at the thought of a large, sentient snake. A mesmerizing beat pounded through the smoky room, and two large, boar-like humanoids were on stage. They walked up to the bar. Emily nodded her head. Sounds like rap. The boar humanoids growled to the beat. Maybe not, said Emily, with raised eyebrows. Andia half-smiled. They're Hyborix. That is one of their battle songs. Great mercenaries, but not too bright. Emily snorted. Everin waved down the bartender, who walked over to him. Where can I find the information broker? The bartender smirked while slowly raising his head. Never heard of him. Are you sure? asked Everin. Quite, said the bartender, walking away. Everin turned around to face Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia. Well, I guess I will check with others. He pointed at an open booth near the entrance. You three can get a table. Dr. Snowden waved at Emily and Andia. You two go ahead. I will get us some water. Emily squeezed Dr. Snowden's shoulder, then left with Andia to the booth. Everin took off to another part of the bar. Dr. Snowden turned around and tried to wave down the bartender. The bartender arrived after a few waves and Dr. Snowden ordered a few glasses of water. The bartender smirked as he went to get it. A humanoid woman with a patchwork of brownish light armor walked up next to Dr. Snowden. She had green skin, blue eyes, and a shock of black hair pulled back. His heart raced as he did a double-take at her presence. The woman smiled at him. Name's Jala. Dropped off some cargo and here for another twelve hours. She looked around then stared at him. Want to get some food? Take it back to my quarters? Then have sex? Dr. Snowden's eyes widened. I beg your pardon? You're human, right? From Fedoria? Dr. Snowden licked his lips and swallowed hard. Yeah, I am. I'm a Raynax female. Or didn't you notice? said Jala, as she eyed Dr. Snowden. Dr. Snowden sighed. I don't know what a Raynaxian is. Jala laughed. <laughs> oh, really? An opportunity for you to learn, then. The bartender slammed some water containers in front of Dr. Snowden, causing him to look at the bartender. The bartender chuckled at Dr. Snowden. Careful with this one. She bites. Jala tossed a look at the bartender. Dr. Snowden gulped as he grabbed the three containers. He exhaled sharply and faced Jala. I must get back to my group. Jala edged in close and slipped a small, circular device into Dr. Snowden's pants pocket. You have my communication chip now. If you change your mind, contact me. Dr. Snowden nodded vigorously. Okay. He turned to walk back. His eyes popped open when Jala smacked his rear. Jala laughed. <laughs> Don't forget me. Dr. Snowden walked back to the booth. 
Emily had her head down in her arms, and Andia was trying to hold back a laugh. He sat down and passed out the water containers. Emily, are you okay? asked Dr. Snowden as he reached out and shook her forearm. Emily looked up. She had a big smile and tears streamed down her face. Uncle Albert, you're quite the chick magnet. Andia and Emily burst out laughing. Dr. Snowden half smiled. Well, I'm not sure what exactly happened up there or what a Raynaxian is, but they seem quite forward. Andia chuckled. You're fine. Raynax has a matriarchal society. They may look similar, but the women are physically stronger and a bit larger than the males. They dominate that society. You ran into a lonely space trucker, judging by her armor. Emily beamed a big smile at Dr. Snowden. I'm sorry, Uncle Albert. It was just funny seeing your face when Andia told me what was going to happen. She let out a hearty laugh. Dr. Snowden nodded. Yes, well, it was an interesting experience. Andia put a hand on Dr. Snowden's shoulder. Human males are somewhat of a Raynaxian female fetish. However, any woman would be proud to have you for dinner. Andia and Emily laughed through their smiling. Dr. Snowden sighed. It seemed Andia and Emily had bonded well even if it was over his bumbling around a Raynaxian female. Over the next five minutes, Andia explained early Raynax civilization in a nutshell. It paralleled Earth's history in many ways, except on Raynax, it was the women who were in power. When the Raynaxians went out into the galaxy, they were surprised to find most planets were male-dominated, which they seemed to have no problems with, since Fredorians looked the most like them they tended to seek them out. On Raynax, it was the men who got pregnant and the women who took care of breastfeeding the baby, although the men could too. He shook his head at the thought. He figured Jala, upon seeing him at the bar, thought she might have struck gold. Still, beautiful women who could not get pregnant did not seem like a bad deal. Everin returned after a few minutes and sat at the booth. He exhaled from his nose, it appears there is a virtual intelligence booth nearby that functions as a go-between. The information broker listens to the requests through it and responds if interested. We need something to trade with, however. What could we have that would interest the information broker? asked Emily. Andia reached out and touched Emily's hand. Maybe, she said, glancing around. He would be willing to accept me as an informant in his network in exchange for any information. Everin tilted his head. That could work. You would do this? Andia smiled and put both her hands out, palms up. Finding the Archeron crystals is worth giving away an occasional piece of information. If it helps for Doria. I'm in. Everin pursed his lips, then nodded at Andia. Okay, let us head out then. They got up from the table and walked toward the entrance. When they were almost there, Jalo walked by Dr. Snowden and slapped him on the rear as she passed, causing him to jump. Everin turned toward Dr. Snowden with a quizzical look. Andia and Emily chuckled through their smiles. Dr. Snowden shook his head and gestured toward the entrance as he looked at Everin. It's a long story. Let's just go. Everin bobbed his head. As you wish. They exited Duzol's crater and turned right onto the platform. After a minute's walk, they came upon an alleyway. It then took them another thirty minutes to navigate the winding, interconnected alleys and arrive at another section of the platform overlooking the interior. A doorway with a humanoid robot stood in front of them. The robot shot out a yellow beam from its eyes at them as they approached. The chamber is available for use. Please secure your weapons and stand at least two feet away from the walls at all times. Everin gestured for them to enter. We are here. Dr. Snowden glanced at Andia and Emily, then walked through the door. The room had eight even sides, with a raised octagonal platform that was waist-high in the center. 
Andia and Emily walked to his right, and Everin to his left. The door closed shut, sealing them in. Dr. Snowden jumped a bit as he looked around. So? What now? Everin raised a finger. Give it a moment. The center platform shimmered briefly, and a holographic male human appeared. It rotated its head slowly from left to right as it scanned them. It looked at Everin. State your business. We seek information on the lost Archeron crystals. The hologram tilted its head. Your payment method. Andia stepped forward. I am the Prime Ambassador of Fedoria. I offer myself as an informant in your network. The hologram stood straight. Processing. Please wait. They waited for several minutes. The hologram smiled. This platform will descend. Please do not be alarmed. The information broker has decided to negotiate with you. Sounds like we got a deal, said Emily. The hologram looked at Emily. Not yet. The platform descended for a minute, and once it stopped, the door they came in slid back open. Everin put a hand out toward Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia, and then walked through the door. After a moment, he waved them through. Once they were in the large room, the door behind them closed. Dr. Snowden noted the room was jam-packed with screens, holographic displays, and other devices and machines he could not identify. There were several metallic-covered tables sprinkled throughout the room with various gadgets on them. Whew. What is all this? A control center, it looks like, said Everin. They walked over to one of the tables, which Everin scanned with his ring. Emily and Andia walked over to another table that had a three-foot-tall brown-furred statue of a creature. It had large black eyes, a bushy tail, and claws on its hands and feet. Emily ran her hand over its head. This almost looks real. The statue smiled. Boo! Emily let out a startled shriek and jumped behind Andia. The statue laughed. Sorry, sorry. I know how skittish humans are. Welcome. I'm the information broker. The broker jumped off the table and pointed at Everin. You're back. Dr. Snowden pulled his head back and scrutinized the broker. You look like a giant squirrel. The broker chuckled. Squirrel. Oh, <laughs> from Earth, right? Earth squirrels are primitive. I'm evolved. But I suspect you didn't come all this way to discuss my evolution. No, I, I didn't mean, said Dr. Snowden. The broker cut him off. Oh, don't worry about it. I was just messing with you. The broker walked over to the table Everin was at and hopped up onto a pedestal. He then began tinkering with the device. Everin scrutinized the broker. I do not believe we have met. The broker eyed Everin for a moment. Interesting. He went back to tinkering with his device. So, the lost Archeron crystals, huh? Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia walked over next to Everin. Dr. Snowden studied the device the broker was working on. It reminded him of a locket. The outside had a stainless steel finish, and the inside had a foam-like texture. Everin rubbed his chin. Yes. Senator Cross suggested we check with you. She seemed to think you would talk to us. The broker looked up at them. Senator Cross. Even more interesting. Why did she think I would help you? I'm curious. Because we aren't Cregans, said Andia. The broker paused, then made a sidelong glance at Andia. She's partially right. He grinned big as he faced Andia. Prime Ambassador of Fedoria, Andia Giggs. You were willing to be an informant for my network. Intriguing. Do you think Senator Cross was correct? Andia glanced at Everin, then back at the broker. I don't know, but we're here, so you must be interested a little. The broker raised his clawed hand. Ha! <clears throat> Not bad. He pointed at Everin. 
He is why I am talking to you all now. Everin narrowed his eyes. Elaborate. The broker stood straight up and, in a deep, mocking voice, said, Elaborate! He then burst out laughing. He smiled and took a deep breath as he wagged a finger at Everin. You know, you loosen up over time. I forget sometimes how stiff that form is for you. Emily eyed the broker. You know, Everin? Of course I do, Emily. I'm the information broker. However, since he is a time traveler, we meet out of sequence. This must be his first time meeting me, but not my first time meeting him. Andia's lips parted. You believe he is a time traveler? The broker put his hands together and squealed. Oh, <laughs> she doesn't believe yet. I seem to be meeting others out of sequence as of late, said Everin. The broker clasped his hands in front of him. And why do you think that is? After an awkward silence, Dr. Snowden slowly nodded and waved a finger. Because he spends so much time in this area, he would see the effects of his future self's actions more frequently, including those who have already met his future selves. The broker stopped and stared at Dr. Snowden. Even now you are this observant. Amazing! You're very astute. Everin already knew the answer, but he chose to let someone else answer. Interesting. Well, back to the Archeron crystals thing. I don't have much information on them. However, I know someone who would. Everin pursed his lips. Who would that be? The broker squinted at Everin. An answer for an answer. An information trade. And Andia will be an informant as needed. Deal? Andia nodded at Everin. Everin gestured toward the broker. We have a deal. The broker broke out a big grin. Excellent. Me first. Who else have you met out of sequence recently? Everin looked at the ground for a moment. He then made a sidelong glance at Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia. Ciros. The broker licked his lips. Ah, Ciros is an enigma. Hard to find information on. From what little I do know, he is like you without the Torvada. Very powerful. He circled his hand. What do you have on him? Everin half smiled. Ciros is an Antigulan. He is from a timeline that no longer exists and blames me for the timeline changing. Creole Jewel! That would explain the bounty on you, said the broker, shaking his head slowly. And Krykus debt here at Chorus. You're quite popular with the bounty hunters. This was the first Dr. Snowden had heard of a bounty. He wondered if Everin going off by himself was related to it, and if Creole Jewel and this Ciro's character were part of that. I am not familiar with Krykus Det, said Everin. Oh, yeah, he's sneaky, here to collect you and your friends. I can't see him, which is unusual. I would be careful on the station, said the broker. Noted. Now, whom should we contact for more information? said Everin. The broker nodded. Maxilagorax Afintu Calosta. I just call him Max. Emily giggled. His name is funny, isn't it? said the broker. And how do we find him? asked Everin. The broker laughed. Another trade. Excellent. This time, though, it's information for an action. He snapped the locket device shut and tossed it at Everin. Everin reached out and caught it. He scanned it with his ring. An information device. Yes. Yes. If you take that to him, I will tell you where he is. Deal? Everin nodded. 
It is a deal. The broker walked over to a wall with a large screen. He sat at a console and pulled up a galactic map. After a few moments of navigating it, a planet highlighted, Max is there. Dr. Snowden scrutinized the planet and ran his hand over his cheek. There's no sun. A rogue planet? The broker shook his head while smiling. The astronomy professor strikes again! Dr. Snowden exhaled sharply through his mouth. This Max guy is living on an inhospitable rogue planet, then. The broker spun around in his chair a full turn before coming to a stop facing Dr. Snowden, Emily, Andia, and Everin. He clasped his hands in front of him. Inhospitable! <laughs> He chuckled. You have the Torvada. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone without a ship like that. Dr. Snowden noticed Andia tilting her head as if in contemplation. He figured she was now beginning to realize that Everin might just be able to find the lost Archeron crystals. Is there something else there we should be worried about? asked Andia. The broker's smile wound down, and his eyes sparkled. He looked at Everin. Possibly. Well? Aren't you going to tell us? asked Andia, as she circled a hand in front of her. The broker shook his head. I can't. Andia jerked her head back. Why not? His rules, said the broker, pointing to Everin. Andia creased her eyebrows and looked at Everin. You understanding any of this? Everin nodded and faced the broker. I do. We appreciate the information. Come, let us go. He turned and walked back toward the chamber they came down in, with Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia in tow. The door to the chamber was open, and as they were about to enter it, the broker called out to them, Wait! He ran up to Dr. Snowden. Can I see the chip in your pocket? Dr. Snowden glanced at Everin, who nodded. Not sure how you know about that, but sure. Why not? He reached into his front right pants pocket and pulled out a device that looked like a poker chip. He handed it to the broker. The broker grabbed it and bounded over to one of his tables. He pulled out a scalpel-looking device and shot a few lasers from it at the chip. He bounded back to Dr. Snowden and handed it to him. There you go. I silenced the output for you. Dr. Snowden put the chip back in his pocket. Okay. Why'd you do that? The broker smiled. My gift to you. The broker's smile wound down, and he swallowed hard. He walked over to Emily and hugged her waist. And thank you. Emily glanced at Everin, whose eyes were narrowed. She chuckled and looked at the broker as he stepped back. Thanks, I think. The broker nodded and waved them away. Go! Adventure awaits you! He bounded to the far side of the room and sat at a console. They walked into the chamber. The door slid shut, and the chamber began to rise. What an interesting character, said Dr. Snowden. Emily giggled. I kinda liked him. He's adorable. The male hologram appeared. I can still hear you. Everin smiled. You have been helpful. The hologram nodded, then dissipated. The chamber came to a stop. The door to the outside slid open, and they exited the chamber. Dr. Snowden walked over to the guardrail on the platform and looked out. The smell of the station was now familiar to him, and he took in a deep breath and then exhaled. He was still coming to grips about where he was and what he had seen. Emily and Andia joined him by the walkway. He turned his head to look at Everin. Everin had his utility handle pulled out and extended into a baton. He pointed ahead. We are not alone. Dr. Snowden thought his eyes were playing tricks on him, as he could see the faint outline of a humanoid by the disturbances of light swirling around the edges where Everin was pointing. On the ground next to the disturbance was a crumpled robotic body with a hole in its chest and its head a few feet away. 
He reached back and tapped Andia and Emily. Hey, you two. The light disturbances faded, and a large reptilian male humanoid came into view. The reptilian had on medium gray light armor packed with pouches and small devices ringing his belt. He had a large, oddly shaped weapon pointing at Everin. He hissed in a deep voice. Gotcha. He shot a red beam at Everin, who had raised his forearm shield. Dr. Snowden's eyes popped open when he saw the beam cut through Everin's shield. The beam enveloped Everin, causing him to stumble. The reptilian shot another blast. Everin fell to the ground and stopped moving. Dr. Snowden's heartbeat ramped up as a chill went through him. He had never seen Everin hurt before, much less knocked out. Or maybe it was worse than that. He gritted his teeth and ran toward Everin while glaring at the reptilian. Hey! The reptilian flicked a few switches on his weapon and then pointed it at Dr. Snowden, who stopped in his tracks. Get back, said Andia, as she stepped to the side of Dr. Snowden with her sidearm raised. She fired at the reptilian. Her beam dissipated upon hitting a shield of some type. Dr. Snowden almost forgot about using his PSD as a stun weapon. He reached into his pants pocket to retrieve it. The reptilian laughed, then fired a wide blue beam. Dr. Snowden felt a surge of electricity shoot through him as he fell to the ground. He trembled uncontrollably as he saw Andia crumple and turned to see Emily had been laid out. He clenched his jaw as he bore a gaze through the reptilian. He then tried to crawl over to Emily. The reptilian walked over to Dr. Snowden with a device in his hand. He kicked Dr. Snowden in the stomach and then rolled him over onto his back. Dr. Snowden squinted and grunted through pain as the reptilian put a foot on his chest. Impressive. You should be down. You're tough for a soft skin. I'll give you that, said the reptilian, grinning and revealing a mouth of sharp teeth. Dr. Snowden shuddered as the reptilian jabbed him with the device. His eyes dulled, and then he passed out. Dr. Snowden grunted as he heard Emily speaking. He shook his head. He thought he could hear that music from Duzal's crater pounding away in his head. He exhaled through his nose and tried to move and then noticed he was sitting in something with his ankles and hands bound by metal-like bands. The taste of blood was on his tongue as he rolled it around in his mouth. He wriggled a bit and then looked around. To his right was Emily who appeared to be in the same structure as he was. He turned his head as far right as he could and saw Everin and Andia also in the same structures, but facing the opposite direction. It was like chairs built on a platform of some type, and it was moving. The tunnel they were in was dimly lit, but he was still able to focus on the grinning reptilian pushing the platform they were on. The reptilian smirked. You're awake. Surprising. What the hell is going on? The reptilian half smiled. Krikus Stets the name. You're being transported to my ship. Once I get you to where you need to be, I get paid. That's what the hell is going on. He laughed. Dr. Snowden looked over at Emily, who was squinting while shaking her head. He cleared his throat. Emily... You okay? Yeah, just a little dizzy, said Emily. You should be. You got hit by a Satarkin stun beam. Really surprised the old man didn't go down the first shot, said Krikus. Dr. Snowden narrowed his eyes as he turned to look at Krikus. He heard Andia wrestling behind him. This bounty must be worth something for you to take this risk, said Andia with a gravelly voice. Before Krikus could respond, Everin piped in. Five million for me, Dr. Snowden, and Emily. Krikus smiled, again displaying a row of sharp teeth. Yes, but there is a bounty on Andia for two hundred and fifty thousand. From who? asked Andia. Not who. Where? You're going to Tokara. And that is... Krikus laughed. Ice Moon. One way in to the underwater base under the ice. 
one way out. I don't understand why softskins would pay for you, but the important aspect is they do. You're the prime ambassador of Fredoria. There will be quite a few interested based on your list price. Pay for me? To do what? asked Andia. If you ever had any enemies, they will be notified. For a small sum, they can have some time with you alone. Pleasure. Torture. Who knows what they have in mind? Once you have outlived your usefulness, or no one pays for you, you die. That's quite sickening, said Andia. I've heard stories from there. You softskins can be quite depraved. Dr. Snowden imagined Andia did not think this trip would go this way. The chip in his pocket kept rubbing into his leg, causing him to look down at his right front pocket. When he leaned toward the side, the communication chip briefly flashed light blue. Leaning hard enough that the device was pressed squarely against the chair he was in caused it to glow with a steady blue light. He wondered if Jalo was contacted and the blue light meant she was listening. The information broker mentioned he had silenced the output. Did he know this was going to happen? Maybe Jala could help. He cleared his throat. So, Krykus dead. You're a bounty hunter who has captured us and is now taking us to your ship. Then you will take us to some place to get paid. Krykus growled. I already told you that. You better not be damaged. No, not at all. Just wanted to make sure it was clear what's going on, said Dr. Snowden. There was a robotic body nearby when you captured us. It appears you had some competition. Did he get any of your crew? asked Everin. Krykus smirked. GJ-45 stood no chance. And I work solo as all good bounty hunters do. Why split the cost unnecessarily? He actually found you for me. Guess he thought he would ambush you, so probably didn't expect to be dismissed like the scrub he was. Easy pickings from there. I almost got that information broker, too. Been hunting that little shit for years but he was gone when I went down to visit him. It's like the bastard knew I was coming. He slipped out and took off in a ship. At least I got some information out of there. He won't outrun me for much longer. Are you sure he will not double back? asked Everin. Krykus laughed. And do what? Become my lunch? You underestimate him. Dr. Snowden looked down and chuckled. Krykus focused on Dr. Snowden. It is funny, isn't it? Dr. Snowden shook his head. Not that. I was just remembering something someone told me a while back about being on the opposite side of Everin. Krykus emitted a low growl. Yeah? And what's that? To paraphrase... Being on the wrong side of Everin is foolish. It never ends well, said Dr. Snowden. Krykus hissed. And given your situation now, you don't see how foolish that sounds. Dr. Snowden smiled. I guess we'll find out. I guess we will. You humans are annoying. If there wasn't a clause that you not be touched... I'd cut your tongues out and seal your mouths, said Krykus. The hover platform approached a section of the tunnel that narrowed down. On each side of the narrowed section was a large window. Krykus stopped the card and walked over to one of the windows. He pointed at his wrist and nodded. He then returned to the hover platform and began pushing it. As they passed the narrowed section... Dr. Snowden saw two men in dirty white uniforms watch them pass. He tilted his head at them as they smiled and sat back. After a few moments, they were past the narrowed section. Dr. Snowden snorted. Well, glad they helped. 
Amazing what a bit of money can do in a shithole like this, said Krikus, smirking. Andy sighed. Corruption everywhere. They approached the tunnel exit. Dr. Snowden craned his neck to peer out. He saw a wide walkway, much wider than the Torvada's width, extend from the tunnel to a landing pad, where a sole medium-sized ship sat in the middle of it. Almost home, said Krikus as he quickened his pace. Butterflies flew in Dr. Snowden's stomach as he wondered how they were going to get out of this. He was still surprised how easily Everin went down. Whatever that red beam was, it must have been very powerful. Krikus pushed the cart out onto the wide walkway. About halfway there, Dr. Snowden's heart raced as he noticed something that looked like the tip of the Torvada's ramp sitting in the middle of the walkway. He looked at Emily and slightly nodded toward the ramp. Emily circled her head while sneaking a glance ahead. Her eyes widened, and she smiled at Dr. Snowden. As they neared the ramp tip, a device flew past the hover platform and bounced behind Krikus before coming to a stop. Krikus turned to look at the device. Dr. Snowden felt a tug as the hover platform was pulled forward. He turned and saw a robotic hand pulling it. After a moment, the cart was at a stop on the ramp inside the Torvada shield. Rakar and Jala stood next to V. Dr. Snowden chuckled. What took you so long? Rakar and Jala stepped in front of the cart. Jala turned her head a bit to the side. It's not over yet, honey. Emily giggled. Krikus backed away from the device. The device lit up briefly, then detonated, emitting a pulse of energy. Krikus roared as he fell to the ground. Rakar and Jala rushed out and fired on Krikus. Krikus grunted as his shield began to fade and electrical arcs danced on him. He rolled to the side and reached for his weapon. As he brought it to bear on Rakar, Jala ran up to Krikus and stomped his head. Krikus stopped moving. Rakar nodded at Jala. Back on the ramp, V had placed Everin's UIC on the cart. Everin flicked his fingers across his ARI, and the restraints popped. They got up out of the cart and stood. Dr. Snowden stretched his neck and saw Andia and Emily get up and stretch. He walked over to Everin, who was using the chair to stand up. You okay? Everin nodded and grimaced. A bit weak. Dr. Snowden put his arm around Everin. I'll help you into the ship. In a bit. Is everyone okay? Everyone nodded. Everin squinted at Krikus, then turned to Rakar. Glad you showed up. How did you know we were captured? Rakar gestured at V. The information broker told V of the situation. So we got into the Torvada, stealthed, then landed on the walkway and waited. He then gestured at Jala. Jala was already here looking around. She said Dr. Snowden contacted her, so she followed the communication ship's location and waited outside the tunnel for him. We discovered we were here for the same reason. We put our heads together and, well, our plan worked. Although Krikus was a bit tougher than I expected. V was contacted by the information broker? asked Emily. Rakar nodded. Silva went into a building to meet with someone. I stood outside and waited. When the information broker contacted V, it was through a screen on the side of a building. V decloaked, and we investigated. I informed Silva, who didn't care. Then we headed out here. Emily smirked. Well, I'm sorry we inconvenienced Silva. He was more upset that V had followed us, said Rakar, smiling. I am glad you came to help. Taking on Krikus was a bit risky. He is quite formidable, said Everin. Rakar exhaled from his nose. Yeah, I had asked V to help, but he said there were restrictions preventing him from engaging in body mode, and that Krikus would be able to see through any hologram. I see. I may need to adjust that. Dr. Snowden looked at V. Speaking of the broker, where is that little furball? He is gone. He said his cover was blown here and he needed to leave. His notification to me was a farewell gift, said V. Everin nodded. We will meet him again, I am sure. He scanned Krikus with his ring. He is unconscious, 
but I am unsure for how long. Rikar, can you take off Krykus's armor? I cannot go near it until it is properly secured. Rikar nodded and walked over to Krykus and began taking off pieces of his armor. V. Load Krykus on the cart when his armor is off, then take his armor and weapon to the research lab and secure it. I will then transport Krykus to his ship. Acknowledged. V pushed the cart over to where Krykus was. Everin turned toward Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia. Dr. Snowden, I will need you to help me load Krykus onto his ship. I also need to do a few other things while I am there. Dr. Snowden nodded. What about us? asked Emily, pointing between her and Andia. You two can help move the armor to the Torvata when it is off Krykus. Emily half smiled. We're on it. She and Andia walked over to where Krykus was. They each picked up a piece of armor that Rakar had removed. It did not take long to get Krykus's armor off. Krykus had on a red undergarment that covered a majority of his body. V picked up Krykus and put him in one of the chairs. Everin walked over to the cart and interacted with his ARI. The restraints adjusted to the size of Krykus's wrists and ankles, then clamped down. Everin sat down next to Krykus and then waved at Dr. Snowden. Dr. Snowden walked behind the card and pushed. He noticed it glided easily. Rakar, Andia, Emily, and V headed to the Torvada with their arms packed with armor pieces. Jalo walked beside Dr. Snowden. I'm going with you. Dr. Snowden half smiled. Not a problem with me. He looked at Everin. So, what was that red beam? It cut through your shield without much effort. Palacin energy. It is extremely rare. I have never seen it in a quantity where it could be used in a weapon. I will need to formulate a counter for it when we get back to the Torvata. I've never heard of Palacin energy. Jala shook her head. Me either. This is just another type of exotic energy that has some unusual properties— it does not affect normal matter much, but has a very powerful impact on other exotic matter and energy, as you saw. Dr. Snowden sighed. Well, hopefully we don't run into it again. I'd like to learn more about all that. There is a hollow program on them you can check out later. They had gone around the Torvada and approached Krykus's ship. Dr. Snowden noticed it had an aggressive profile that was studded with weaponry. It was shaped like a computer mouse, with the back of the ship sporting large metallic burners. When they reached the side door of the ship, Everin stood up and grabbed his UIC off the hover cart. He walked over and placed it on a console near the door. The door opened, and a ramp extended to the ground. He motioned at Dr. Snowden, who pushed the card up the ramp. Once inside the ship, Dr. Snowden parked the card in the back. Everin walked over to Krykus and placed his UIC on Krykus's arm. After a moment, it emitted a stable blue light. I thought the UIC only worked on technology, said Dr. Snowden. Everin nodded. You are correct. Krykus, however, has an information storage device in his arm. It would seem he wanted to keep it close. I've heard of that. Pretty expensive, though, and uncommon. Can get messy if someone is looking for it, said Jala. Everin accessed his ARI. I am moving the information and will then put it into the ship's system. Giving him the Jerzon treatment, said Dr. Snowden, laughing. I am. Jala drew her lips to the side. What is a Jerzon treatment? Dr. Snowden circled a hand in front of him. Everin is going to send Krykus where law enforcement is and then broadcast his wrongdoings. He did it to a dirtbag we crossed paths with long ago. That's pretty clever, but I'm sure his ship is secured. Everin pulled the UIC off Krykus, then walked to the front of the ship. He sat in Krykus's pilot seat and put it on the ship's console. Not against this. After a few moments... The ship powered up. Jalo widened her eyes and looked around. Everin interacted with his ARI and then stood up, taking the UIC with him. 
He gestured for Dr. Snowden and Jala to exit the ship, then followed them out. After a few moments, the ramp retracted, and the side door closed. The ship hovered briefly before flying off. I also have a copy of his information, and will look through it when back on the ship. I did a check on his weapon, and it appears he stole it from a mercenary a while back. I am guessing he figured he finally found a use for it from the bounty description. Let us head back, said Everin. They walked back to the ship where V stood by the ramp. Krikus's armor and weapon have been secured. Andia, Emily, and Silva have retired to their rooms. Rakar is on the roof, said V. Excellent. I am going to begin looking at Krikus's armor, weapon, and data. I will be in the research lab, said Everin. Jala smiled at Dr. Snowden. I have six hours before I have to go. Maybe we could enjoy them together? Dr. Snowden half smiled and looked at the ground. A rising warmth spread through him. I don't know. I'm kinda tired from all this action. Jala drew the right side of her lips up. I could help you relax. Thanks, but I think I'll be fine. Jala laughed. Fine. Fine. Was worth a shot. She walked up to Dr. Snowden and whispered into his ear. If you change your mind, you have my chip. She nipped his ear, then walked away. Dr. Snowden shook his head as he watched Jalo walk off, then turned to walk back up the ramp. Chapter 6 On Ciros's personal ship, Ciros eased back into the executive chair in his quarters. In front of him sat an impressive desk with an array of consoles and screens, alongside holographic projectors. His quarters were more of a communication center with the basic necessities of a bedroom than a place to relax. He reflected on the past day. He had met with the Covendron mercenaries and procured five of their best. Expensive, but well worth the cost. Typically, only two or three in a group were available at a time. Five was a windfall. They handled the flying of the ship and its maintenance. There was some history between him and the mercenaries. His first encounter with them long ago was when they were assigned to take him out by a rival corporation. He subdued those who came, and then the next group, and the next one after that. After negotiating with them, they agreed to give him immunity, and to turn the tables on those who had originally hired them. He flipped on one of the holographic projectors. An image of his wife and three kids appeared. A lump formed in his throat as he gritted his teeth. He missed them. His life had been good, and he enjoyed his job. The day it was all taken from him would forever be etched in his mind. Everin will pay. A beeping sound rang out from the door. Ciro's clicked off the holographic image. Come in. A Covendron mercenary walked in. He had on a black and gold light armor suit. Across his chest was a strap that ran diagonally from his shoulder to his hip. On the strap was an array of devices and gadgets. The signature red metallic armband glistened in the lightly lit room. The mercenary walked up to Ciro's desk. We have some developments. Ciro's nodded. Yildares, please sit down. Yildares sat down in a chair in front of the desk and nodded at Ciro's. Ciro stretched his neck to one side, then to the other. So, what did you learn? Yildares tapped at his wrist, causing a screen to pop up. He interacted with it and after a few moments, he flicked a finger across the screen toward Ciros's desk, causing the display to appear on there. As you can see, there was some chatter about Krikus' debt on the Kriegen Lawnet system. His ship arrived at Kriegen Outpost 1.6.8. He was strapped to a chair of some type, and his ship logs contained a massive dump of his illegal activities. Ciros narrowed his eyes. Krikus' debt. He rubbed his chin. 
Name sounds familiar. Yildaris flung another screen to Ciro's desk. High-grade bounty hunter, operating out of the Galvin Rim. He has a high capture rate. In this case, he had tried to abduct several people. Everin, Dr. Albert Snowden, Emily Snowden, and Andia Kiggs. He failed, however, it would appear. Ciro's chuckled and shook his head. I would have expected that. Were there any unusual weapons or armor found on Krykus's ship? Yildaris shook his head. None. Just equipment you would normally expect. I've worked with Krykus before. He's a tough bastard. Capturing four people should have been easy. For most targets, sure. For Everin and crew. Not even close. Who's this Andia Kiggs? Yildaris flung another screen to Ciro's desk. She is the prime ambassador of Fedoria. I sent an intercepted message from a Kriegan inspector to your desk. He seems to be traveling with them. There is also a Kriegan ranger in the group. Ciro studied his desk screen. Interesting. What an unusual group. I have never heard of those three but it seems they are looking for the lost Archeron crystals to help Fedoria. He glanced at the ceiling and eased back into his chair. Yeah, saw that. It makes no sense, said Yildaris, snorting. Ciro smiled. If they have an inspector, then he must have been assigned. Do we know who assigned him? Senator Valia to cross. Find out what you can on her, as well as this Andia Kiggs and the Kriegans. Will do. Ciro's bent forward with clasped hands and rested his chin on them. Everin is trying to fix something. Having Fedoria assemble the Acheron with the lost Acheron crystals would help Fedoria. But why is he doing that? It must be important if he is involved. I don't know, said Yildaris, easing back into his chair. You run a powerful corporation. You could send a private army after them. But instead, you want a small strike force. Ciro smirked. The bigger the presence, the easier it is to be noticed. That invites distractions. The last thing we need is the Kriegans getting involved. Ciros interacted with his desk screen and shot a screen over to Yoldaris. Change course to these coordinates. Yoldaris looked at his screen and shot Ciros a quizzical look. The ancient Kriegan homeworld. It's quarantined. If you wanted to avoid the military, that's one of the last places you want to be. They have several bases and outposts there. Why are we going there? Ciros smirked. Because that is where the Archeron base is, and where they will end up. Dr. Snowden woke up to the sound of his PSD chirping. He grabbed it and pressed the top button. He noticed it was nine in the morning, Earth time. Once expanded, he noticed the communications icon was flashing, so he pressed it. Hey, sleepyhead. Some of us actually work around here, said Emily. Dr. Snowden squinted and exhaled through his nose. All right, all right, Miss Sunshine. I'm getting up. Where are you? In the conference room. I'm here with Rakar V and Everin. We're having breakfast. Dr. Snowden nodded. Okay, I will be there in a few. The communication screen disappeared. He sat on the edge of the bed and rubbed his eyes. He saw the communication ship Jala had given him sitting on the table next to the bed. He grabbed it and flipped it around in his hands. It was flashing a soft blue light. He pressed it and jerked back as a hologram of Jala appeared. Hey, taking off now. The chip will show up on my scanners any time it is within a few light years. I hope you plan on swinging by this area again sometime and... Maybe we can pick up where we left off. She clicked and winked, and the hologram dissipated. Dr. Snowden sighed. He was so used to being rejected that Jala's interest in him was a shock to the system. He shook his head and smiled, then showered.
got dressed, and headed to the conference room. Upon his arrival, he saw that Silva and Andia had arrived and taken their seats. He headed to the replicator area to get a cup of coffee and some breakfast. Emily walked up behind him. I heard Jala wanted to stay over last night. Dr. Snowden stood up straight. She did. But she didn't. I'm glad you're interested, though. Oh, come on, Uncle Albert, I was just teasing. You need your coffee, said Emily, as she turned to head back to the table. Dr. Snowden grabbed his coffee and picked up his usual breakfast. He walked over to the table and took his seat next to Emily. He noticed Andia and Emily had shared a plate. He dug into his breakfast. Good. It looks like we are all here. I have something to discuss, so if anyone wants to get something more to drink or eat, now would be a good time, said Everin. He looked around the table and after a few moments continued when no one had gotten up. The recent set of events has shown me how dangerous this is turning out to be. I believe I should proceed alone from here on out. I can take you all back to Kriegis while I complete the mission. Dr. Snowden and Emily, you could have some time on Kriegis, assuming the Fedorian Embassy will have you. If not, I can take you back to Earth. Andia snorted. I don't think so. Fedoria is in this one hundred percent. We don't back down at the first sign of trouble. Silva smirked and shook his head while gesturing in a dismissive manner at Andia. Yes, yes. That's why you're known as stubborn and aggressive. He faced Everin. I agree with your sentiment, but offer a counter-proposal. You can go outside the ship alone. We can stay on the ship, but still stick around and come out if needed. Andia narrowed her eyes at Silva. You call it stubborn and aggressive. We call it standing up for what we believe in. Either way, I don't plan to sit inside a ship or go back to Cregan unless Everin forces me to. This is the first time I actually believe that we might find the Archeron crystals. Everin gestured at Dr. Snowden who was mid-bite. Dr. Snowden? Dr. Snowden paused as everyone looked at him. He slowly finished his bite and took a sip of his coffee, then raised his finger while nodding at Andia. I'm with Andia on this, he faced Everin. We knew the risks the moment we stepped on the Torvata. That overgrown lizard isn't going to dampen my spirit. Emily giggled. <laughs> Same here. It was one setback, but we got through it as a team. Everin turned to Rakar. Your thoughts? Rakar eyed the table for a moment before speaking. I admire the humans for sticking it out. He made a sidelong glance at Silva. That is not a weakness. He looked at Andia and Emily. This ranger stands with you. Everin nodded. Okay, then. It is settled. I wanted to put it out there in case anyone had doubts. However, it appears everyone is committed. He touched the table console. A hologram shot up in the middle of the table, showing a lone planet. According to the information broker, this is where we are headed, a rogue planet. It will be a hostile environment, so I am guessing whoever this Max is, he is powerful enough to overcome the environment. I heard Uncle Albert mention it, but what exactly is a rogue planet, and what type of environment are we talking about? asked Emily. Dr. Snowden eyed Emily. You should have read those books I suggested to you. A rogue planet is a planet that was kicked out of its solar system and moves through interstellar space without a sun. It has been theorized that they are ice worlds with subsurface oceans but that it may be possible that they could have retained their atmosphere, trapping heat. Either way, not a pleasant place. Silva narrowed his eyes. You seem to be more knowledgeable than is generally suggested for your species. However, you are missing that these planets can also form on their own. Dr. Snowden half-smiled. I have read a few papers on that idea as well. A recent paper suggested that tiny gas clouds with planetary mass 
so-called globulets are being shot out of the rosette nebula, which can form them. Even brown dwarfs, which are essentially failed stars, can form from that as well. Silva glanced at Ricar, then at Dr. Snowden. Perhaps we need to reevaluate Earth's technology level. The last report I read was that they had just discovered how to fly through the air. Our reports appear to be out of date if you have this level of knowledge. Everin cleared his throat. We are getting off track. We will need to stay on the ship for this one. Come, let us head to the command area. Dr. Snowden eyed Silva as he stood up and then exited the room. He watched as Andia walked up to him. Andia put a hand on Dr. Snowden's shoulder. Impressive. You surprised a Cregan. Not easily done. Dr. Snowden smirked. He must think we're primitive. Definitely. I know all about it, said Andia with a half-smile. They exited the room and walked over to the command area. Silva and Rakar sat on the left side, with Andia, Dr. Snowden, and Emily on the right side. A galactic map appeared on the right side of the main screen. The map then zoomed to the coordinates Everin had given. A planet appeared with a green outline. A gold beam and portal Dr. Snowden had come to associate with traveling long distances appeared outside the Torvada. It flew through the portal, and after a few moments, they appeared in blank space. Dr. Snowden looked around. I don't see it. The main screen went semi-transparent, allowing them to see out into space. A green highlight with a trailing line showed up on the screen along with some numbers. I have marked it in green so you can see it, said V. As they approached the planet, another highlight appeared. Another object has been detected. Trajectory indicates interception. Estimated time of interception is two minutes. Everin scrutinized his ARI and then tapped at the arm of his chair. Interesting. It is spherical, and scans cannot penetrate whatever it is. Hold position. Acknowledged. After a minute, the object on an interception path became more visible. The front screen showed an enhanced image of a yellow spherical orb with tendrils of light swarming on its surface. Silva gasped. It's... it's the Great Selector! Dr. Snowden narrowed his eyes. Maybe because he was jaded, but to him, it looked just like another alien species. Granted, it was in deep space, and it did have tendrils of light. He looked over at a wide-eyed Silva. This must be the greatest day in Silva's life. Silva looked at Everin. Is there any way we can get a better look other than through this window when it reaches us? Everin nodded. Yes. Let us head to the roof. They took the elevator to the roof, and after the doors opened, Silva rushed out to the light blue guardrails on the edge of the roof. The rest followed him out. Dr. Snowden strained to see the great selector approaching them. It appeared to him as a small, yellow sun that got bigger every passing second. After a moment, the Great Selector appeared just outside the Torvada shield. Silva, Rakar, and Andia knelt and bowed their heads. Dr. Snowden looked around with amusement. He did not believe in this Great Selector being a god, but its effect was apparent on Silva, Rakar, and Andia. Emily walked over and grabbed his right arm. The Great Selector extended a strand of energy to the edge of the Torvada shield. It then pointed at Everin. Everin nodded and pressed a button on his ARI, causing a small portion of the guardrail to disappear. A light blue walkway extended out from the roof to the edge of the shield. Everin walked to the edge of it and extended his hand outside the shielding. The Great Selector enveloped Everin's hand with a tendril for a minute, then retracted it. It paused for a moment then flew off. Everin turned around and walked back to the roof. The walkway dissipated, and the guardrail respawned. The Great Selector! It touched you! said Silva, standing up with widened eyes. Everin nodded. It did. It appears to know who I am, and Dr. Snowden and Emily as well. It was overjoyed to see humanoids in space. It knows us? asked Dr. Snowden. Yes, 
I am not sure how, though. Dr. Snowden crossed his arms. Why is it so concerned about humanoids, exactly? It didn't look like anything close to resembling a humanoid form. Silva snapped his head toward Dr. Snowden. You speak as if the Great Selector is just another alien species, he snorted. I forget sometimes how primitive your species is. The Great Selector is the reason you and I exist. Dr. Snowden's face turned red. Well, that's your belief, not mine. On Earth, there is no big tentacled ball of light guiding our evolution that we know of. Do you even have evidence of it guiding your evolution, or that the Archeron actually does what it says and is not just being interpreted? We fled our planet based on the Great Selector communicating to us through the Archeron. We wouldn't be here otherwise, said Silva. Yes, but you prepared for a space invasion. Why didn't it tell you about the portals specifically instead of being vague? Is it really that complex for a... Dr. Snowden made air quotes with his hands. God, to add an additional sentence to the warning? You mock me. I can see tolerance is something you lack, said Silva, smirking. He turned and then stormed off to the elevator. Andia half smiled. The Great Selector is a divine being in Cregan culture. As I mentioned before... They firmly believe they were the first humanoids created by it, and that gives them a superior status among other humanoids. I know, and I think it's ridiculous. Maybe. Cregans are physically and mentally stronger than any other humanoid on average, so there may be some truth to them being selected. They are also the oldest known humanoid civilization. They may be older and different, yes, but superior? Please, tell me you don't believe that. Andia drew her lips flat and squeezed Dr. Snowden's arm. She glanced at Rakar, then headed to the elevator. Emily glared at Dr. Snowden. You know, you can be a real jerk face sometimes. She hustled after Andia. Dr. Snowden rolled his head around. What the hell just happened? Rikar smiled and put a hand on Dr. Snowden's shoulder. I appreciate your ability to speak what's on your mind without fear. As for Silva, he is a devout follower of the Way of the Great Selector, an organization dedicated to interpreting how the Great Selector wants us to live. He already deems humans beneath him, and to be questioned in that manner after actually seeing the Great Selector was deeply offensive to him. Essentially, you ruined his moment. Dr. Snowden shook his head and sighed. If he is so easily shaken by a question, it makes me think maybe he isn't as solid in his beliefs as he thinks. Ricard nodded. I agree with you. While I acknowledge the Great Selector had an impact on our formation, I do not acknowledge the way of the Great Selector's interpretations. If the Archeron can truly communicate with the Great Selector... The power of interpretation shifts to the Emperor, as it was in the old days. Dr. Snowden turned toward Everin. Well, what was Andia and Emily all about? Everin smiled. You know that Fedoria was a planet populated by former human slaves. It is part of their culture that they are not on the same level as the Cregans. The Cregan language is the default language spoken throughout the Empire, even on Fedoria. It is not something they talk about openly from what I have researched, especially in front of Cregans. Dr. Snowden exhaled. And I tossed it in her face in front of everyone. Great. I like you, earthlings, said Rakar, laughing. Everin nodded. They are more feisty than Dr. Snowden lets on. Let us head on back to the command area. Rakar slapped Dr. Snowden on the back and they proceeded to the elevator. Everin, Dr. Snowden, and Rakar took the elevator down and then walked over to the command area. They took their respective seats. Dr. Snowden looked at the ground, then glanced at Andia. I'm sorry if I offended you. Andia smiled. It's okay. You didn't know. She looked at Emily. 
He really didn't know. Don't be angry with him. It's okay. Emily smirked. He's just being himself. Dr. Snowden looked at Emily, who was shaking her head. He could see she had a strong bond with Andia. He looked over at Silva to say something, but Silva's deep scowl and narrowed eyes made him decide not to for now. V. Take us down, said Everin. Acknowledged. Dr. Snowden's breathing staggered when the Torvada descended through cloud cover. He walked up to the guardrail and took in the view as a jungle-filled world opened before him. It should be ice, and even if it did have an atmosphere, definitely not a jungle. This is not quite what I expected. Something is at work here. Fee, run an atmosphere scan. Acknowledged. A listing of percentages and gas names appeared on the front right screen. The temperature showed it to be about 72 degrees Fahrenheit. It has a breathable atmosphere, and there's sunlight with no sun. How is that possible? asked Dr. Snowden. We will find out soon, said Everin. The Torvada skimmed the jungle as they approached a mountainous region. A highlight appeared around a structure carved into the side. The Torvada flew toward it. There appears to be an energy source there. That looks like a good place to start. V. Scan for life forms, said Everin. Acknowledged. Pockets of red dots overlaid on the screen. Multiple life forms detected. Dr. Snowden looked at Andia. Have you seen anything like this before? Andia shook her head. Dr. Snowden looked at Rakar. Rakar shook his head. I have never seen a rogue planet with this type of environment. It shouldn't be possible. We should tread carefully. Something isn't right here. Agreed, said Everin. As the Torvada approached the structure, Dr. Snowden could see it had large statues carved into the mountainside around the entrance. The statues looked like an upright armored ant, with an extra set of arms and a bizarre set of weapons. It reminded him of extended claws. In front of the entrance was a large stairway, and before that an open area that faded as it met the jungle. Everin pointed to the open area. Land us there. Acknowledged. The Torvada descended to the open area. When it landed, Everin stood up. I will investigate. Andia stood up. Uh-uh. We're coming with you. Silva smirked. By way, she means everyone except me. I will stay here, unless that is also an issue for Dr. Snowden. Dr. Snowden drew his lips flat and sighed as he looked at the ground. Very well. Those who are coming... Follow me to the research lab. Dr. Snowden, Emily, Andia, and Rakar followed Everin to the research lab. Everin walked up to one of the tables with an odd assortment of gadgets and devices. A rubber-like substance covered part of the table. On top of it was a circular base with raised edges. A hologram appeared above it as Everin interacted with his ARI. The hologram showed a small object with a belt clip on it. Four of the objects appeared on a replicator pad that sat on the side of the table to the right. Everin grabbed them and handed them out. These are temperature shield generators. They won't prevent anything from getting through physically, but they will maintain a consistent temperature around you. Dr. Snowden looked at the generator. Why do we need these? The temperature seems pretty decent. As far as we know. If it changes, things could get bad. Rakar half grinned. My suit can handle temperature changes. I don't need this. The others, though, probably do since they aren't wearing space-worthy suits. He handed it back to Everin. Andia narrowed her eyes. How does it maintain temperature but then allow physical objects through? Everin smiled. It uses a type of energy you would be unfamiliar with. Its properties allow it to maintain a spherical bubble at a constant temperature. While it will not protect against extreme temperatures, it can handle small variations. I do have full space-worthy suits if you prefer. Dr. Snowden shook his head. He did not want to wear anything bulky if he could avoid it. If these things work, then it and the PSD will be all I need. Same, said Emily. Everin nodded. Dr. Snowden and Emily, 
Remember that your PSDs have scanning capability that generates an augmented reality view. Emily pulled her PSD out and pressed the top button on it. When it expanded, she held it up to Rakar and pressed the scan button. Readouts floated on the screen around Rakar's image. Whoa! It shows a lot of information. Andia stepped behind Emily to peer at the display while placing a hand on her hip. We have something similar on Fedoria. It is a visor mounted on a helmet, though, unless you go for implants. What did you call it? A PSD? It is a personal support device. It possesses some functionality that there is no equivalent of at the Cregan level of technology, said Everin. He gestured toward the ramp. Let us head out. Dr. Snowden, Emily, Ricard, and Andia followed Everin out of the Torvada, with V flying in orb mode. Dr. Snowden immediately noticed how much dimmer it was compared with when they were descending in the Torvada. The jungle on the perimeter looked ominous. The sounds caught his attention. Whispering, punctuated by shrieking, made him rub the goosebumps on his arm. Sounds crazy out here. No kidding, said Emily. She pointed her PSD around, which had a wide, luminescence beam shooting out of it. Good idea, said Dr. Snowden as he opened his PSD and selected Illumination. Everin pulled off two Illumination orbs and activated them. He tossed them into the air, and they took off. Rikar pressed on his shoulder pads, and light beams shot out from the devices on his shoulders. Andia pulled out a device and activated it, causing a light beam to shine forward. Everin nodded toward the structure carved into the mountainside. V. Scout Mode. Acknowledged. Scout mode engaged. V took off, scanning up the stairway. They walked up the stairway for fifteen minutes. It had several landing areas where they stopped to rest briefly. Each landing pad had a statue on each side, similar to the ones carved into the mountainside. At the first landing, a creature swooped at Rakar but flew off with a few warning shots from his weapon. Dr. Snowden was scanning everything in sight. He noticed that the stone stairs seemed to be in good shape. His nose caught the faint hint of the jungle, which he thought was odd. Given how strong it was before, it was almost as if the smell had been swept away. Emily scanned one of the statues at the first landing. Wow! According to this scan, this is over 320,000 years old. This statue should have been long gone by now. Dr. Snowden half grinned at Emily. The history major in you comes out. He walked over and scanned the statue. So, you like older things, huh? said Andia, smiling at Emily. Ricard and Andia laughed. Dr. Snowden shot a look at Andia and then scanned the statue and verified Emily's findings. He did a double take after another scan. Um, weren't the eyes on this statue facing forward? Emily looked up and jumped back a bit. They were. They couldn't have moved, though. It's stone. Everin walked up to the statue and scanned it with his ring. He narrowed his eyes and looked around. I suspect who we are looking for is nearby. Come, let us head up to the entrance. They walked for another fifteen minutes up the stairway, pausing at each landing to catch their breath. Dr. Snowden noticed that Andia was struggling. He could feel strength in his legs even with all this exertion. Emily was doing okay, and Ricard was able to keep up as well. He had never mentioned the nanobots to anyone, since Everin had instructed them to keep quiet, but their effect relative to Andia was noticeable. They stood at the entrance to the large stone structure. The entrance was large, and massive stone pillars stood equidistant from each other to the side of it, ending at the statues. Andia leaned against one of the pillars, then slid down. Whew! She looked at Emily. You don't even look winded. Ricard half smiled. I had no idea how fit earthlings were. Andia smirked. Well, we could have probably used the ship to drop us off up here instead of walking up all these stairs. It was good for us to check out the environment and scan before getting to the entrance. Top-level scans do not always capture everything, said Everin. Andia rolled her eyes. I guess. After a few minutes, they entered through the large entrance. 
Dr. Snowden and Emily began scanning. Rakar moved ahead of the group and began checking out the room's interior. Everin and Andio walked behind Rakar. Dr. Snowden took a look around the large room they were in. The illumination orbs had flown to the top, but dimmed as the room appeared to have its own illumination. He looked around to find the light source and traced it to advanced-looking wall sconces. Everin, check this out. Everin walked over to Dr. Snowden and then scanned the sconce with his ring. It appears this structure is maintained. Dr. Snowden shook his head and turned around to see what was in front of them. He noted that the stone walls and flooring had a tiled stone texture. Looking ahead, he saw a central pathway from the entrance to farther back into the room. The room itself appeared to be one of many stretching forward, joined by smaller entrances. Statues lined the walls. He thought it was odd that for a place so old, it was fairly clean, but if it was being maintained as Everin had said, maybe not so odd. The question then was who was doing the maintenance. Everyone jumped when the front entrance sides reached out to each other in a fluid-like manner and sealed up the entrance. What the heck was that? said Dr. Snowden, stepping away from the entrance. He swallowed hard as he felt Emily's death grip on his right arm. I think whom we seek knows we are here. Do not panic. If they can do that, they would have done much worse if they were malicious, said Everin. Andy had gulped. Easy for you to say. Stone should never move like that when in that state. Ricard nodded with wide eyes. I agree. The stone moved like a fluid. It appears we are to move forward into the next room. Come, said Everin. Dr. Snowden admired Everin's confidence. Stone just moved like a fluid, and it did not even phase Everin. He was always level-headed and calm, even in the worst of situations. Dr. Snowden figured if he had the knowledge Everin possessed and his physical might, he would probably be that confident as well, although the experience gap would definitely be noticeable. They walked through several rooms until they came to the last room, it was large, with a throne centered in the back. A purple, ornately decorated rug ran the length from the room's entrance to the throne. Large pillars stood to the side of the rug. Statues lined the walls, as in the other rooms. They were similar to the insectoid statues Dr. Snowden saw outside. Emily jumped as the wall sconces lit up when they entered the room. She walked up to one of the sconces near the entrance and scanned it. She jumped again as the room entrance closed like the main entrance had. She ran back to the others. Well, what now? asked Dr. Snowden. Everin pointed toward the throne. I suspect we are to approach the throne. He walked toward the throne, with Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia directly behind him. Ricard took up the rear. As they approached it, a grinding noise echoed throughout the room. Dr. Snowden turned around and saw that the statues in the room were beginning to move toward them. What the heck? Andia pulled out her sidearm and fired at one of the statues. It crumbled where the shot hit, but then slowly reassembled itself. Her eyes widened. These things can reassemble! Everin ran over to Dr. Snowden and Emily and gestured toward them. Let me see your PSDs. They handed their PSDs to Everin. He opened both of them up and clicked around the interface. The PSD shot out a thin metal rod from their ends. Everin closed the PSDs and handed them back. This should help. The rod is a lot stronger than it looks. He looked at Andia and Rakar. Gather around me. V projected holograms of various creatures and even duplicates of the group, but the statues ignored them. Dr. Snowden and Emily ran behind Everin. Rakar and Andia flanked him and were firing at the approaching statues. Rakar had unloaded a huge burst of weapon fire on the statues. One of the statues was completely smashed to pieces, then began reassembling itself. Everin had extended his utility handle into a staff and was firing repulsing shots, which were knocking the statues back and smashing them. The statues kept reassembling and coming back. Everin gestured to the throne. Get around the throne! Dr. Snowden and Emily ran up to the throne. A statue approached from behind the throne. A wave of fear shot through Dr. Snowden. His heartbeat ramped up and his legs froze. He stared at the statue as it came within a few feet of him. 
Uncle Albert, what's wrong with you? said Emily. She swung at the statue repeatedly with her rod, knocking it to pieces. The statue did not reassemble. Dr. Snowden shook his head and squinted his eyes. Paralyzing fear crept through him. All he could think about was fleeing. I... I don't know. Everin, the statue doesn't regenerate if we hit it with our rods, said Emily, turning to look at Everin. Everin ran over to Dr. Snowden and Emily. Good. Keep them at bay. Rakar and Andia had joined Dr. Snowden and Emily at the throne. Andia looked at the smashed statue. Why does that work and not our weapons? Emily shook her head. I don't know. Rakar stepped forward to bash one of the statues as it approached the throne. The statue's arm cracked and fell off. In a flash, he disappeared, and his armor and weapon fell to the ground. Rakar, said Dr. Snowden. Where'd he go? Everin scanned where Rakar had last been seen. Hmm. There appears to be a disturbance in the air where he was. He scrutinized his ARI. He may have been teleported. That indicates either a high level of technology or that whom we seek has the ability to do so. You three defend yourselves. I am going to clear them out. Everin adjusted his utility handle, which now glowed a dim gold with a silver tip at the end. He ran out and dismantled the statues, one by one, attacking them in a flurry of strikes. The statues did not reassemble. It took Everin several minutes, but the statues to the front and side were defeated. Emily handled the ones that came from the rear. Dr. Snowden cringed behind her. One of the statues had come within a range of Andia, and her weapon fire dismantled it. The statue did not regenerate. She looked at Emily. Oh, now my weapon has an effect. Dr. Snowden shuddered as he watched the statue crumble. Something about the shields and energy in the rods must be disrupting whatever was animating these statues. He sighed once all the statues were down. What the heck were those things, and where did— A small, circular, slanted opening appeared under each of them, causing them to slide down their respective holes. Dr. Snowden could feel the smooth slide twisting and turning in the dark. He saw V had flown into the tunnel with him and was scanning ahead. He reached out to try to stop, but it was like the surface of the slide was coated with oil. The PSD was tumbling around with him. After a few moments of sliding— he was launched a few feet from where the hole exited from a stone wall. The PSD launched out after him and hit him in the back. The hole closed up after V flew out. He realized he was not going to be able to crawl back up that way. Looking around, he saw Emily, Everin, and Andia a few feet from their now closing holes. He stood up and dusted off his jacket and then picked up his PSD. After opening it, he noticed there were several other defense options to choose from but the rod icon was highlighted. Pressing it caused the rod to retract into the PSD. He was unsure how it had the space to do that, but it did. Shaking his head, he walked over to the others. Well, that was interesting. In the distance, a voice shouted out. Emily's eyes widened. Rakar! Andia jerked her head back. How can you tell? I can barely hear anything. Voice analyzed. It is Rakar, said V. They hustled over to where Rakar was calling from. Dr. Snowden noticed the rocky cavern they were in was massive. It was like a portion of a meadow had been sliced off and plopped down. The grass under his feet was wet, and as they approached Rakar's voice, he could hear running water. The cavern was well lit, as if a miniature sun was shining down on them. They came upon Rakar standing underneath a large tree next to a small creek. Glad to see you all, said Rakar, smiling. They assembled around Rakar. Everin scanned the tree and surrounding area. This area is unusual. Have you seen anything? Rakar shook his head. No. Been wandering around for a bit. Seems empty. I appeared naked, and then my armor and weapon appeared a minute later. They jumped as a face formed on the tree's trunk. It smiled at them. It's not that empty. Rakar stepped forward and pulled out his weapon. Everin stepped up and half turned his head toward Rakar while gesturing with his hand down. If this is whom we seek, then that will not be necessary. The face in the tree smiled. I agree. Allow me to introduce myself. 
The face disappeared for a moment, and then a male humanoid consisting of twisted wood strips stepped out of the tree. The humanoid tilted his head and snapped his wooden fingers. In a quick flash, the wooden body turned into flesh and blood. He was naked, with fair skin, black hair, and golden eyes. The humanoid bowed. I am Maxigalorax Afintu Colosta. You can call me Max for short. Dr. Snowden's lips turned down, and his face turned red. He pointed up. Were you responsible for all that nonsense above? Max put a hand out. I was. However, before we continue, Max laughed. Oh, I forgot. Humanoids are shy about nudity. Been a while since I took this form. Unless everyone prefers this. Emily and Andia shook their heads. Very well. Max snapped his fingers, and a gray, featureless suit formed on his body. Better? Emily half smiled. Much. Thank you. Max nodded. He gestured and a round table with chairs appeared before them. He signaled toward the chairs. Please, sit. They all pulled up a chair and sat around the table. Dr. Snowden did not know what to make of Max. He could see that Max was able to create things and manipulate the environment at will. He wondered if Max had anything to do with the paralyzing fear he experienced earlier. Max waved his hand at them. Intriguing. I can't sense any of you. I thought maybe it was a fluke, but I am certain now. However, he said, pointing at Rakar, him, I can feel. I teleported him down and had to resort to using the environment to bring the rest of you down. Dr. Snowden paused for a moment then tapped at his shield generator on his belt. It's because of these. You couldn't penetrate the shield. Rakar didn't have one, and Everin would have had a natural shield around him. Otherwise, he would have had a shield generator device as well. Andia tilted her head at Dr. Snowden. How'd you figure that out? Dr. Snowden shook his head. I don't know. It just popped in my mind. He shot a look at Everin. Max put a hand on his chin. Interesting. Everin narrowed his eyes. Agreed. Very interesting. Dr. Snowden pushed up his glasses as he looked at Max. Why didn't you just appear when we were at the entrance instead of doing all that smoke and mirrors? Max eased back into his chair and laced his fingers. I could have. But when I can't sense someone, he said, gesturing at Everin, that usually means trouble. I had no idea who you were or what you wanted. So, I observed your reactions. You were in no danger. Emily tilted her head. You were the statue outside? Max chuckled. I didn't expect you to catch that. Your attention to detail surprises me. He rubbed his chin. The fact that you all are here means you got past the death light. That means your group must have some power. Do you blame me for being cautious? The death light? asked Rakar. Max turned toward Rakar. Ah, the Cregan. You refer to it as the Great Selector. My kind refers to them as the Death Lights. You imply there's more than one? Well, of course I do, said Max. He laughed. Oh, right. Cregans think there is one. No, no, they are a species, just like you and me. They just tend to be a bit more... advanced. Ricard pulled his head back and narrowed his eyes. I have never heard of them referred to in that manner before but I also have no way of verifying if what you say is true. Why do you refer to them as death lights? Because that's what they are. They dispense death and are made of some type of energy resembling light that I can't seem to interact with. They massacred my kind without hesitation. I believe I am the last due to them. There must be a good reason they attacked you. They bring life, not destroy it. Max chuckled. You lack the level of awareness that I do, so you couldn't know. Emily looked at the ground for a moment, then looked at Max. You're a matter mage. Max paused in contemplation as he looked at Emily. I have been called that. Again, I'm surprised. Dr. Snowden studied Emily. He wondered if the nanobots were doing something to him and Emily. Yeah, I'm surprised as well. He was able to create this table and chairs out of thin air. He could create holes through the rock that sealed themselves up. It makes sense, said Emily, gesturing at the table. Max eyed Emily. Where'd you hear that term? We ran across someone who confused Everin with one, 
said Emily, pointing at Everin. Max scrutinized Everin. Yes, I could see that. I guess to those sensitive to detecting energy signatures, we would appear somewhat similar. Speaking of which, what are you exactly? A traveler helping those in need, said Everin. He pointed at Andia. In this case, I am helping Andia Kiggs find the lost Archeron crystals. The information broker said you had knowledge of them. The Archeron? How interesting. And what of the information broker? What do you know of him? We have something for you. Everin reached into the storage container on his side and pulled out the locket that the information broker had given to him. He tossed it to Max. The locket hovered in midair when it came near Max. Max rotated the locket as he scrutinized it. After a moment, his eyes blinked slowly, and he smiled. Ah, a message. Haven't seen him in a while. I can't seem to transmit or receive communications past a light here. Usually he flies within range to send me something before being chased away by the death light. It could easily catch him if it wanted to, but it doesn't, which makes no sense. He turned toward Everin. He says you're friends. That's unusual for him. He doesn't have any friends except for me. I'm curious. How did you get past the death light? I talked with it via touch, said Everin. Mac sat on the edge of his seat as his eyes widened. You touched it? I did. Mac sat back in his chair with narrowed eyes. He then sat forward and clasped his hands while resting his elbows on the table. He perched his head atop his hands and gazed at Everin. You must be more powerful than you're letting on. Touching a death light and being invisible to me, those are powerful abilities. If a death light touches me, I cease to exist. Why are they hunting you? asked Rakar. Max paused for a moment and then gestured at the table. A mini planet appeared over it. Let me ask you this. If a planet, such as the one hovering over the table now, had primitive life evolving that was not humanoid, would you interfere with its evolution? Rakar snorted. The Great Selector did for us and many other humanoids. Max nodded. Yes, they did. My kind wanted life to evolve naturally, not artificially. A philosophical difference, really. We opposed them destroying life to create humanoids. They would send large asteroids toward a planet to wipe out any life that wasn't humanoid and had advanced past a certain stage. For the planets just starting out, they would send asteroids with life there, then guide it to a humanoid form. Dr. Snowden put his hand on his chin. Panspermia. The belief that our planet was seeded with life from the stars. We also had a large asteroid hit our planet, wiping out most life and letting mammals evolve. Are you suggesting our planet was guided by the Great Selector? Mac shrugged. It could have been. I'm not aware of your planet, but your description sounds like they were involved to some degree. As a matter mage, I would have stopped any asteroid artificially sent to eradicate life. That, apparently, was not acceptable to the Deathlights. Do you wonder why I'm not surprised that five humanoids are before me now? Dr. Snowden squinted while blinking rapidly. What Max was saying made sense. The great selectors, while helpful to humanoids everywhere it seemed, must have wiped out many other attempts for life to evolve naturally. So why are you here, then? I can take on a pure energy form to travel the stars. The Deathlights can move faster than me, although I'm not sure how. If I leave, I die. The fact that you saw it on the way in means it is still out there watching. They knew I was watching the life on this planet evolve, so they sent an asteroid. I dematerialized it. They sent a larger one, almost the size of a moon. Then they chased me away. The asteroid was too big and knocked the planet out of orbit, and here we are. All life was extinguished. I guess they were not selected. I do not know why they don't come after me. They know I'm here, said Max. Everin placed his hands in front of him, touching at the fingertips. Interesting. It would appear they want you alive for something. That's my guess. But for what, who knows? I can't even talk with them. Not that I would want to. Ricard dipped his head and looked at Max. You speak a terrible tale, but I have no way of verifying it. The outside environment doesn't look like an asteroid, hit it. Max waved his hand. Of course not. 
I can refashion the environment, but not life itself. Sure, I can create replicas, but they aren't alive. It doesn't matter. What does matter is you want something from me. What do you offer in exchange? Knowledge, said Everin. Mac slowly circled a hand. Go on. Everin pulled off his UIC and put it on the table. Max raised a hand toward it. His eyes popped. This was created by my kind. It's a universal interface card. How'd you get this? It was a gift from a colony of matter mages I helped long ago and far away. Where? It seems we have something to exchange. Max sighed. Well, even knowing where it is won't help me. Then we can take you there. The Deathlights can sense me, even on a ship. They cannot sense you on my ship, just as you cannot sense those of us with shielding similar to my ship. Max swallowed hard and licked his lips. You take me to this colony, and I will tell you everything you need to know about the lost Archeron crystals. Your proposal is acceptable. Max smiled. It's done, then. Let's head to your ship. Hold on to your seats. He waved his hand, and the ground beneath them lifted into the air. The platform floated toward the wall that they had slid through. Max gestured at the wall, and a hole opened, slanting up. The platform ascended through the hole, eventually arriving outside the structure near the stairway. The platform descended and then landed near the Torvada. Max stood up and scrutinized Everin. Are you sure the death light out there won't be able to detect me? Everin nodded. I am. They all got up from their chairs and walked to the Torvada's ramp. Max waved his hand at the Torvada. Amazing! It's like it's not even there! How is this possible? Everin smiled. You can control most matter within a certain radius that originated within this universe. If you cannot control, Max cut him off. Of course! It's not of this universe! He bit his upper lip. That would mean you are not of this universe. Very interesting. Dr. Snowden studied Max. It fascinated him that beings like Max existed. It was even more fascinating watching Everin and Max interact. He wondered how Max could control matter, yet not make life. What was his natural state? Maybe Everin would fill him in on it when he had time. Max's conclusion at least shed some light on Everin's true nature. He looked at Andia and Rakar. Their faces gave away that they were trying to digest what they heard. Everin turned and walked up the ramp. Once inside the shielding, Max waved his hand. Unbelievable! I can't sense anything now! He slapped Rakar on the back and smiled. I'm just like you now. Yeah, you are. Come on, said Rakar, smirking while gesturing up the ramp. Once inside, they headed to the front. Everin took his seat at the command chair, while Rakar and Max joined a startled Silva. Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia sat on the right side. V had flown into the maintenance rooms and emerged in body mode. He walked over to the front console and interacted with it. Who exactly is this? asked Silva, gesturing at Max. Someone who can help us, said Rakar. Silva snorted. Great. Just what this venture needs. Max smiled. Ah, that is the type of Kriegen I'm used to. What's that supposed to mean? You're arrogant. Do you not see this? Silva shook his head. The Torvada took off and descended into the air. After a few moments, they were in space. An object appeared on the screen in a faint outline. Approaching signature matches that of the Great Selector, said V. Max drew his lips flat. A true test, then. He looked at Everin. I hope your ship is faster than that death light. Silva peered at Max. Why do you call it that? Rakar waved his hand in the air. We've already been over this. Had you come along with us, you would know. He nodded at Max. Silva snorted. Everin half smiled. Speed is not needed. V, take us to these coordinates. He tapped at his ARI. Acknowledged. The Torvada shot a gold beam out, and a portal opened up. The Torvada flew through it and exited above a barren, rocky world. Max's eyes widened. You're a rift traveler. Everin shook his head. Not quite. 
The Torvada descended through the cloud cover and approached an outcropping midway up a cliff. As the Torvada landed, a crack in the cliff wall appeared. Two male humanoids and one female humanoid walked out. Everin stood up and gestured toward the entrance. Come. Everyone except Silva followed Everin out of the Torvada. Once down the ramp, the female humanoid ran toward Everin and hugged him. Back so soon? She cracked a smile at the rest. Everin half smiled. It has been over twenty years from my perspective. I have with me a friend from the Milky Way galaxy. He extended his left hand, and his ring projected an image of the Milky Way. He gestured at Max to step forward with his other hand. Max drooped his head as he approached the humanoids. He trembled as a tear ran down his face. The female humanoid walked up to Max and hugged him. You're among your own kind now. You're safe here. Max wiped the tear from his face. He stepped back and shook hands with the other two humanoids. He turned toward Everin. I can't thank you enough. You can, by telling us about the lost Archeron crystals. Max nodded vigorously. Oh, right. Let me see your UIC. Everin handed his UIC to Max. Max tilted his head, and the UIC hovered over his hand. A blue light connected his hand to the UIC. After a few moments, he handed it back to Everin. The last known locations of the crystals have been uploaded into your ship. Where are they? asked Andia. There is a crystal on each colony ship that fled the ancient Cregan homeworld during their mass exodus event, said Max. He gestured with his free hand, causing an image of a rectangular white crystal to appear. The crystals will look like that. Everin scanned the rectangular crystal with his ring. And where are these colony ships now? asked Andia. Max smiled. You're quite the inquisitive being. He faced Everin. The locations are where they had planned to go. I don't know where they would be now. It's a start, though. So we should get the base first, then, from the ancient Cregan homeworld, said Andia. Not quite, as your Cregan friend here can verify. You need all three crystals in it for it to be able to be moved. Otherwise, it's like it is in a fixed point in space, said Max. Ricard nodded. He's right. We need to get the crystals first, especially since we now have the location of them. Then go to the base. There is a military outpost built around it there. Max half grinned. Cregans need to be more like you. He looked at Everin. You seem to understand these exotic energies and matter. I'm sure you can figure out a way to detect the crystals. After we get the first one, I will research that, said Everin. How do you know all this? asked Ricard, shaking his head. Max smiled. I am older than you might think. Who do you think was the information broker back in those days? Of course, it was a lot easier when there was less deathlight activity. You were an information broker? At one point, yes. I let others take the role. The current one is a survivor of a deathlight purged world, last of his kind. He particularly doesn't like deathlights or species that worship them as gods. Like us? Max nodded. You must imprint your personality on them, said Emily. Max tilted his head. Perhaps. I do have a charming personality. Everin nodded. Thank you for the information. We have a lot of work to do, it seems. I wish you luck in your new journey. Max smiled and handed the UIC back to Everin. Your UIC will now work to give you more detailed information on biological life. It will emit a red light instead of blue. A gift. He rushed forward and hugged a bemused Everin. I don't know what you are, but I'm in your debt. Dr. Snowden rubbed his chin. He struggled to comprehend someone as powerful as Max owing a debt. The female humanoid winked at Everin. Should I stay out here in case you return so quickly again? We will meet again, I am sure. The female humanoid hugged Everin, and then all four matter mages walked back into the cliff wall. The crack they came out of then sealed up, leaving no presence it was ever there. Everin gestured to the ship. It would appear we have a long journey ahead of us. Everin and V walked up the Torvada's ramp with Emily, Rakar, and Silva in tow. Dr. Snowden noticed Andia staring at the ground. He walked up to her. You okay? She raised the right side of her lips. Yeah, 
I just feel so... small. Matter mages, Everin and the Great Selector, beings that exist on another level of ability, all this advanced technology, all this knowledge, just makes me feel insignificant, and all our politics seem so petty. Dr. Snowden put his arm around her. You're Fedorian, and more importantly, you're human. We will adapt. Andy had tilted her head at Dr. Snowden, then nodded and smiled. Yeah, you're right. Let's go. Chapter 7 Everyone assembled in the conference room and took their seats. Everin pushed a button on the table console, causing a projection to shoot up showing the three rectangular crystals. These are the three crystals we need to find. According to Max, these are the last known locations. A swipe of his hand across the table console caused another hologram to shoot up over the table, showing a galactic map with two dots marked and a long line highlighted. They are based on the current era. Andia scrutinized the hologram. One of those locations is Kriegus. Everin half smiled. Yes, there appears to be one on Kriegus somewhere, but the exact location is unknown. He interacted with the table console, causing the hologram to change to the long line that was highlighted. The next crystal appears to be the flight path of a colony ship that never reported in. It is lost in space somewhere, or maybe crashed on a planet, but we have a path at least. We should be able to determine where it would be now based on this. The hologram switched to a galactic map with the solar system highlighted. It then zoomed in to a planet. The third one appears to be on a rocky planet called Gazes. Not too much information there. Silva snorted. That third one is in Drajan territory. They are notoriously xenophobic. We will need to be in and out there. Not much is known of them other than they are the most advanced civilization known, said Andia. Dr. Snowden turned his head. Most advanced? Are they as big as the Kriegen Star Empire? Andia shook her head. That's the weird thing. They only control a few systems. They never expanded beyond that. No one knows why, but every attempt to work with them has been a failure. She looked at Silva. Their technological advantage also keeps out others who would wish to claim their territory. You're referring to the Holinus incursion. They're lucky we did not send our full fleet, said Silva, smirking. Everin raised a hand. Regardless, we will need to be careful. The one with the flight path is interesting. The flight path showed again for the second colony ship. If it never reached its destination and just continued in flight, it would be here. The flight path on the hologram extended out as the map zoomed out. A dot appeared at the end of the line. It showed the ship almost at the edge of the galaxy. Dr. Snowden scrutinized the hologram. That's pretty far out, but not a problem for the Torvata. Agreed. The first one on Kriegis may pose an issue. Emily pursed her lips, then faced Everin. Not if we travel in time. If Kriegis was where one of the colony ships landed, couldn't we just be there when they arrived and search for it? Everyone stared at Emily. Emily half grinned. I'm just saying. Time travel? asked Rakar. Andia half grinned. Don't worry, I had the same reaction. Everin narrowed his eyes. Interesting. That is a solid suggestion. However, any time travel we do must be done with caution, lest we change something that shouldn't be changed. We do not want to interrupt the crystal's timeline. It may have had an impact on Kriegen history that we are unaware of. Well... There is no history of it that I'm aware of, and I would know if there was, said Silva, with his arms crossed over his chest. So we now know where they all might be. Which one do we do first? asked Andia. I believe we should do the second one first. It will take some time to locate it, 
but should prove much easier to find than the other two. We could use a break for the day while the Torvata is scanning for it. It will also allow me to calibrate scanners to detect it, which may prove useful for the Kriegis and Drajan ones, said Everin. Sounds good to me, said Dr. Snowden. Silva, Rakar, and Andia stood up and then headed to their living quarters. Everin stood and walked over to Dr. Snowden and Emily. If you do not mind... I would like to try the biological aspect of the UIC on you two. Dr. Snowden shrugged. Sure, why not? He extended his hand. Everin placed his UIC on Dr. Snowden's hand. A red light fluctuated under his UIC before stabilizing. Everin looked around and over Dr. Snowden. Intriguing. He grabbed his UIC. Emily. Emily put out her hand, and the UIC stabilized on it almost instantly. Everin scrutinized her. Very interesting results. Okay, I have what I need. Enjoy the rest of your day. Emily chuckled. Wait a minute. What was interesting? Just the first time I have seen an interface like that is all, said Everin. Dr. Snowden glanced at Emily, then shrugged. Well... I'll be in the planner cartography lab. I'm going to hit the hollow room and get some exercise in, said Emily. She hugged Dr. Snowden and then headed toward the living quarters. Everin extended a hand toward the research lab. I am headed there myself. V will take us out to the last known location and begin checking the route. Dr. Snowden nodded and walked off to the planner cartography lab. The next day... Dr. Snowden yawned as he sat on the edge of his bed. He had spent most of yesterday checking out the planner cartography lab. It was, as he expected, very high-tech. The room was essentially a miniature hollow room. Everin had shown him the basics of how it worked before heading off to do some research. Andia had joined him for a bit and filled him in on galactic politics. He was fascinated to learn about Fedorian history and the relationships they had formed both positive and negative. Dr. Snowden had checked out the galactic region of Earth and was entranced by the snippets of information on each planet. Although there was not a lot of data, the ones that had data were very detailed. He wondered if they were places Everin had gone, or if the information was just absorbed from somewhere else. He shook his head and headed to the shower. After getting dressed, he went to the conference room. He noticed the room was quiet. Rikar was alone having breakfast. Rikar nodded at Dr. Snowden. Good morning. Dr. Snowden nodded back and picked up a cup of coffee and some breakfast at the replicators. He joined Rikar at the table. I've been meaning to ask you, what a ranger is, exactly? Rikar smiled. A good question. We are a paramilitary force that is elected by the populace, one ranger for every one thousand people. We have special judicial powers granted by the government that put us on par with law enforcement and the military. Rangers are highly regarded by my people. Some do not like the power that the people and government give us. <laughs> like, uh, Silva? said Dr. Snowden, chuckling. Yeah. He is an inspector and works directly for the government. We actually come from the same administrative sector. I get the feeling you didn't care for Senator Cross much. I guess it was kind of obvious. I'll need to be more careful. It's a long story. To summarize, I found evidence linking her to illegal activities. I reported it to my commander, and he refused to pursue it. I took it up the chain, and then my evidence disappeared. I was disciplined for it, and moved to the reserve for a year to do administrative work. Not really my thing. Well, that sounds horrible. It was. This is my first field assignment since then. She specifically asked for me. Not sure why, though. Dr. Snowden narrowed his eyes. Maybe she knows something we don't. After chorus, I would agree, said Rakar, grinning. They finished their breakfast and headed to the front of the ship. Everin was in his command chair, and Silva was on the left seating area. Emily and Andia were on the right side with V at the front console. Rikar sat next to Silva, and Dr. Snowden sat next to Andia. Good morning. We have made some progress, said Everin. Do tell, 
said Dr. Snowden, gesturing with his right hand. The extended flight path crosses about 500 light years. The Torvada's long range scanners are about 10 light years, so we have been repeatedly hopping 10 light years and scanning. We just passed the 400 light year mark, said Everin. Andia's eyes widened. Ten light years? That's impressive. Our top of the line ships can only do six. Everin nodded. Even with the range, it still takes time to process. Dr. Snowden scrutinized the galactic map on the right front screen. It had the flight path of the second colony ship, with a dot representing where they were. A bright dot appeared off to the side of the line. The left side of the front screen showed a faint outline off in the distance. Ship detected, said V. Interesting. It is not as far as it should be. Something must have slowed it down. Take us in. Perform standard scans when in visual range, said Everin. Acknowledged. Dr. Snowden exhaled sharply as his heart raced. He looked around and, for a moment, soaked in where he was at and what he was doing. He was in space instead of studying it. He grinned as he watched the faint outline of the ship become stronger. He glanced at Emily, who was smiling at him. He figured she knew what he was feeling. After several minutes, the second colony ship came within visual range and appeared on the right side of the screen. Dr. Snowden noted that it looked like it was in good shape. The ship was grayish-white and shaped like a long cigar. The bottom was rounded, as was the top, but the middle was flat. The back of the ship had large thrusters, and he could see smaller thrusters along the side. He thought it was an unusual design, but maybe it was optimized for space. Performing scans, said V. Around the ship on the front right screen appeared multiple readouts. It showed no life forms and no thrust from the engines. It had been moving on its inertia. The readout indicated the environment had no air. Several parts of the ship highlighted on the outside. Scans complete, said V. Everin rubbed his chin. The ship interior looks like it has been exposed to deep space. V, take us to the closest cargo bay side entrance near the front. Acknowledged. Rikar, your suit is spaceworthy. I could use some assistance in searching the ship. The plan is to get the power back on to start up the artificial gravity, and then we can take our time finding the crystal. I am not expecting any issues, said Everin. I'm going too, said Andia. Everin nodded. If you wish. I have several suits in the research lab. Dr. Snowden glanced at Emily, who nodded. We're going too. No way I'm going to miss this. Silva snorted. I'll let you all risk your lives. I will stay here and monitor with V. Andia stood up and walked toward the research lab. Suit yourself. Dr. Snowden and Emily followed Andia. Once inside the research lab... They looked around for the suits. Everin walked in after them and headed to a room that hung off the back. He gestured toward the room. They are in there. They may seem large, but they compress down to your form. They also have a built-in temperature shield, like the one used on Max's planet. They walked into the room and found the suits. Dr. Snowden noticed that the large gray suits looked like a thin layer of semi-transparent metal over flannel, the helmet was nowhere to be seen, but there was a sturdy neck collar at the top. He pulled the suit down and ran his hand along it, noting that it felt like plastic. After stepping into it, he noted that pulling the sides together caused them to automatically connect. The suit compressed to form fit his body with a whooshing sound. He took a deep whiff as the smell of metal wafted past his nose. It reminded him of the smell created when rubbing a penny. Everin walked over to Dr. Snowden. Your helmet has two buttons on the neck. The left one is to spawn and close it. The other is for the heads-up display, or HUD for short. Your helmet will not drop if the outside environment is hostile, but you can override that by holding the left button for ten seconds. Dr. Snowden pressed the left button, and a thin, semi-transparent metallic helmet shot out of the neck collar and covered his head. He noticed he could breathe normally and see without any blind spots. Pressing the button on the right caused visual readouts to appear on the inside surface. Looking at Emily, 
he could see readouts fly off to the side of her. It supported augmented reality. This was something he could get used to. If I had known the suits were like this, I would have used one back on that rogue planet. Everin nodded and pointed to a small round device on Dr. Snowden's upper left chest. That is an interface toggle button. If you tap it, it will project your linked PSD interface a few feet in front of you. That is the suit's interface. Certain options will be disabled, but a majority of the functionality is there. Bear in mind that the scanner is in the palm of your left hand. Also, we are all connected to the Torvata communication system, so we can talk normally. Dr. Snowden nodded and looked around. Wish we had all this on the Crotophore ship. Everin's eye softened. Yes, I built these suits as a direct response to that incident. It would have made things much easier, and if I had planned better, things could have been avoided. Dr. Snowden sighed. He could see Everin was still troubled about the abduction experience. He shook his hand in the air. I wasn't implying anything. I know. However, you have an advantage this time, said Everin. He walked up to Emily and extended his left hand. Please place your right wrist in my hand. Emily complied. You have some defensive options on this suit, said Everin. He pressed and held the green wrist button. After a few seconds, a cone-shaped device shot out from the wrist and covered her hands. Whoa! What's that? said Emily. It is a modified version of my repulsing blast. It shoots a beam out that is easy to aim and will push objects away. To retract the repulsing weapon, just press the red wrist button, said Everin. He dropped Emily's wrist and tapped her interface toggle device. Everin interacted with the interface that projected a few feet in front of Emily. After a moment, a medium-sized, square, translucent shield appeared, hovering an inch away from her left arm. That should help a bit. Now that's awesome, said Emily. Andio walked up and tapped at the shield. Impressive. Fredoria has a similar suit, but it's much bulkier than this and probably half the functionality. Dr. Snowden tapped his interface button and studied the projection. After a few moments of messing with the options, a shield appeared off his left arm. He then pressed his green wrist button, which deployed his repulsing weapon. He waved his right arm around without effort. The repulsing device was light, and he could feel a handle in his palm. Oh, yeah, much better. I'm digging this suit. Everin grabbed Dr. Snowden's arm and pushed it down. Careful with that in here. Dr. Snowden pulled his lips back and clenched his teeth. Sorry. He pressed the red wrist button, causing the repulsing weapon to slide back into the suit. Also, keep in mind that the suits can go for several days without charging, depending on how much you use it. Andia and Emily both nodded and then retracted their weapons and turned off their shields. Emily gave a thumbs up to Everin. Good to go. Andia nodded. Me too. Everin grabbed a lower face mask with detailed lines on it as he walked out of the room with them in tow. They exited the research lab and walked to where Rakar stood facing the ramp. His helmet was on, and his suit and weapon were lit up. Everin placed his UIC on the back of Rakar's suit. After it connected, he interacted with his ARI. He then pulled off his UIC and placed it back on his belt. He placed the mask over his lower face, and it lit up along the edges and molded to his skin. Rakar, can you hear me? Rakar turned around and jerked his head back. Did you just hack my comms? I did. You are connected to the Torvata communication system now so we can all talk. Andia looked at Everin. You're just taking a lower face mask? Where's your suit? Everin smiled. I am wearing it. A chill ran through Dr. Snowden. He knew Everin was not trying to be scary, but the thought that maybe Everin was referring to wearing skin as a suit made his stomach uneasy. V had brought the Torvada parallel to the bottom of the colony ship near its cargo bays and matched its speed. The Torvada then slid sideways up to the cargo bay side door, extending its shield so it was flush with the door. The ramp extended up to the door, which had two vertical metal bars overlaying it. Each bar had a handle that sat about halfway down from the top of the door. 
To the right of the door was a massive sealed cargo bay entrance. They walked down the ramp to the door. Everin walked up and grabbed the two handles on the vertical bars. He began pushing them apart with little effort. Dr. Snowden chuckled as he saw Rakar and Andia's eyes widen. They were probably trying to figure out if the bars were easy to push or if Everin was just that strong. They would find out about the latter soon enough. At least they did not have to go through space to get to the door. He shook his head. Everin, you need any help? Everin turned his head halfway toward them. I am fine. This door will be open in a few seconds. Make sure your helmets are on before we enter. Dr. Snowden nodded and pressed the left button on his neck, causing his helmet to spring forward. He saw Emily and Andia's helmets pop up. After a few more seconds, the doorway was open and Everin was gesturing for them to enter. Ricard went first, with Andia right after him. Emily followed Andia, and Dr. Snowden followed her. As they passed through the Torvada shields and into the ship, they began to float. Dr. Snowden noted the small room they were in must be a type of decompression chamber. It would have been pitch black if it was not for the light emitting from Ricard's helmet lights. He wondered how the ship came to be decompressed. Everin went in last and closed the door. He pulled two illumination orbs off his belt and activated them. They lit up the small room. Everyone get your lights on. Dr. Snowden tapped his interface button and selected the illumination icon on the interface. It showed an outline of a humanoid body with various points highlighted. To the side of the body was a circle. He tapped the circle and an orb launched out from the back of the suit. It hovered over him and emitted a dim light. He tapped the hands and a ball of light surrounded his hands. He noted that when he touched his palm with his thumb, the ball of light condensed into a beam. He looked up and saw Andia and Emily watching him, and then activating their lights. "'We need to get the ship's power back on so the artificial gravity can kick in,' said Everin. He floated toward the interior door and scanned it. As he swept his hand along the wall, his beam exposed a dimly lit line that snaked its way to a small panel— he floated to the panel and pulled out his utility handle. Pressing a button on it caused it to extend into a prying tool. Dr. Snowden scrutinized the utility handle. He wondered how it could make so many different shapes. After a few moments, Everin pried open the panel, which revealed a large switch. After magnetizing his boots, which caused them to clamp to the floor, he pulled the switch and then demagnetized his boots, making him float again. The prying tool retracted back into the utility handle, which was then placed back onto his belt. He floated over to the interior door and pushed it open while gesturing forward. They floated into the large cargo bay. Their lights were like knives cutting into the darkness. There were various small shuttles and cargo containers floating about. Their illumination orbs exited the small room and floated to the top and emitted a bright light, making the cargo bay almost look like it was lighted on its own. Several hallways led off in various directions. Everin followed them out and closed the door. He extended his hand and a projection shot up from his ring, showing the ship's layout. The room they were in was highlighted green. We need to head to the engine room. Um, there's corpses floating around here, said Emily, pointing off into the distance. Everin floated over to the corpses and scanned several of them. Dr. Snowden noted that they were unusual looking. Some looked like their skin was made of brown leather. Others had weird appendages breaking through the skin. Some did not even look Cregan with all the deformations on them. What the heck is this? Everin studied his ARI. I am not sure. According to my scan, they were in a state of transformation. No need to worry, though. It appears they are not alive. The moisture is gone from these bodies, and what remains is essentially a freeze-dried husk. V. Prepare a diagnostic analysis from my scan. Acknowledged, said V, over the communications channel. Those things are not Gregans, said Silva, also over the communications channel. Silva can hear us? asked Emily. Yes, I can hear you and see you. Ricard looked at Emily while tapping a device on his shoulder. Oh, said Emily. They were creaking at one point, however, said Everin. Dr. Snowden glanced at Emily.
who he envisioned was not liking the corpses. Wonder what they were transforming into. Unknown. I would guess that before they could complete it, the ship was decompressed and left that way for a while. That would have had detrimental effects on the bodies. All gases and liquids would be gone as well as bacteria over time, and they would shrivel up but still be preserved, said Everin. Like space mummies without the wrappings. Maybe they were the cause of the decompression then, said Emily. Possibly, said Everin. He slid his finger across his ARI, causing the illumination orbs to brighten and light up the cargo bay. Dozens of corpses were now visible. Andia shivered. Well, this isn't creepy at all. Everin rubbed his chin. Nonetheless, to the engine room. They followed Everin down the hallway. Dr. Snowden noticed several other smaller rooms off to the side as they went down the hallway. As his light cut through the darkness, he could see more corpses. His skin crawled at the thought of the gravity kicking back on and all these corpses falling to the floor. He wondered if there would be a smell, although he was not planning on finding out. They walked up a ramp and approached the first large room. The illumination orbs surged forward and out into the room. Dr. Snowden paused at the size of it as the group entered the room. It spanned the height of the ship. There were multiple platforms and walkways connected to each other at various levels. Everin pointed toward the ground. We need to head down there. He pushed off over the railing and toward the ground. Everyone proceeded to do the same. After five minutes, they made it to the ground level. In the middle of the floor was a large device. It had a cluster of cylinders grouped around one large cylinder. Lines along its side shot out over the ground floor to smaller single cylinders with a ribbed texture. They walked over to the central device. Everin scanned it with his ring. Interesting. A fusion reactor. The injection process has stopped. I suspect when the ship was decompressed, a failsafe kicked in and shut it down. He pointed to the single cylinder structures. The power cells then ran until they were drained. Good luck finding power to start it up, said Rakar. Everin nodded. We just need to resupply the power cells. The reactor does not need to be turned on. I can supply that power. I need to determine what type of hookup is needed. He walked over to several large devices on the far side of the room. It appears the air supply tanks are also empty, but we do not need to replenish those. Rakar shook his head. I wouldn't believe half the things I have heard if I didn't see them for myself. Andia nodded. I'm with you there. After a few minutes, Everin walked back to the group. There is an external hookup to provide power from a source outside the ship. I am guessing it was used initially to fill the power cells. I will head back to the ship and hook up the Torvada's power system to it. If anyone wants to come, they can, or you can wait here. It should only be about thirty minutes or so. I'll wait. I want to explore this area a bit more, said Rakar. I'm with Rakar, said Dr. Snowden. Emily glanced at Andia, who nodded. We'll stay too. Everin half smiled. Very well. Make sure you stay on the ground level. When the power comes back on, the artificial gravity will kick on and the console in the back of the room should light up and show all the power cells along with other metrics of the ship's systems. When the power cells are full, let me know. I will be able to hear you via our linked communication. I will be back shortly. He pushed off from the ground and floated up toward the entrance they came down from. They spread out about the ground floor. Dr. Snowden headed to a small room he noticed off to the side. He jerked his head back after latching on to the doorway. Inside was a corpse with a hole in its head. It was a preserved male Cregan with little decomposition and no transformation. His hands gripped the chair arms, which anchored him in the seat. It looked like he had been shot execution style. Dr. Snowden wondered if he was killed willingly or not. He shivered at how desperate the situation must have been to come to those choices, then continued poking around the office. Fifteen minutes later, Everin spoke over the communications channel. I just hooked up the power source. Head to the console in the back of the room.
they floated over to the console. It had several screens showing images of power cells. As they filled up, Dr. Snowden turned around and noticed the physical cylinders in the room were beginning to light up as well. The ones on the screen matched the physical ones. After five minutes, the cells were fully charged. He wondered how much power was pumped through to fill the power cells so quickly. He figured with the Torvata, it was probably a hurricane of energy. The power cells are all charged, said Dr. Snowden. Excellent. Disconnecting the power source now. V will stay behind and keep the Torvata close. I will be with you all here shortly, said Everin. Fifteen minutes later, Everin floated down from the engine room entrance. He walked up to the console and placed his UIC on it. He studied his ARI, then looked around at Rakar, Andia, Dr. Snowden, and Emily. Hmm. I cannot access the command or security center. They must have manually disabled the connection. Nonetheless, hold on to something and put your feet on the ground. They spread out, grabbing on to what they could. Everin looked around, and after everyone had nodded they were ready, he pressed a button on his ARI. A warning light flashed, and after several minutes, Dr. Snowden could feel the gravity. He noticed he could move his arms effortlessly, but figured that was due to no air resistance. The lights had come on, and Everin had retrieved his illumination orbs and placed them back on his belt. Dr. Snowden shut off his lights, as did everyone else. The artificial gravity has been enabled. Given that there is no air here, I would suggest you keep your helmets on, said Everin. No argument there, said Andia. Everin extended his hand, and a projection shot up from his ring showing the ship's layout. A large area covering a third of the ship on the third level was highlighted. This command control center would be a good place to begin looking for the crystal. In front of it is the security control center. He walked toward the ramps leading up to the third level. Dr. Snowden took a look into the office he was in earlier. He wondered what the Cregan's last moments were. He grimaced as he turned around and followed Everin. After five minutes of walking up the ramps, they reached the third level. Dr. Snowden strained his neck and noted there were two more levels. He always imagined a command center should be positioned to look outside, but with technology... It made sense that it would not be a requirement for placement. Probably safer, too. He peered into the room from the entrance they were standing at. Corpses littered the ground. There was a mix of transformed and non-transformed. There were also some that had been in the process of transforming, it seemed. Most had holes in them as if something had shot a beam through them. Looks like a fight happened here. Yeah, not usually a good idea on any type of spacecraft. It must have been a desperate measure. Good thing the hall is as tough as it is, said Rakar. Everin nodded. I concur. The security control center should be just ahead. Come. He strode into the large, open room. Dr. Snowden noticed that there were four big ramps on each side of the room, one that went up and one that went down. He figured it was to make it easier for security to get around the ship as needed. He jumped as his foot hit a corpse. Ricard put his hand on Dr. Snowden's shoulder. Steady. Dr. Snowden swallowed hard and turned his head to nod at Ricard. The sheer amount of death around him was making his palms sweat. He turned his head toward Everin. How many people were on this ship? Everin held out his hand to the left as he kept walking. A projection shot up from his ring, showing the number. 10,342. Per max, quite a few. Emily shook her head. And all dead. Dr. Snowden caught up to Emily and put his right arm around her. He gave her a light squeeze through her suit. Everin stopped and tilted his head as if listening for something, then continued walking. Andia caught up to Everin. What was that about? I thought I sensed movement on the lower levels. May just be the ship readjusting to the gravity, said Everin. Oh, said Andia, looking around. After five minutes of walking, they reached the security control center. There was a split wall, the bottom half made of the same metallic texture as the ship and the top half a transparent, glass-like material. 
In the center of it was a large sealed door. Everin walked up to the panel to the right of the door and placed his UIC. After a moment, he swiped his hand across his ARI, and the door slid to the right. I disabled the scans and unsealed the interior door as well. They followed Everin through the small checkpoint. Dr. Snowden looked into the two windows on each side of the area and noted they were both empty. Once they were past the checkpoint, they found themselves in a hallway. Smaller ones branched off to the sides. Everin headed to the left, and after a minute or so of walking, faced the sealed door on the left side. He placed his UIC on the panel and swiped his hand across his ARI again. The door slid to the right, and he stepped in with the others in tow. The room had a large number of displays and consoles underneath them. Several non-transformed corpses lay on the ground. In the middle of the room was a sunken area reachable by steps. A command chair sat in the middle, surrounded by several workstations. Everin walked up to one of the consoles on the side and put his UIC on it. He pulled an orb off his belt and tossed it out. It shot up a projection of the area outside the security control center they had just come through. He studied his ARI. This is a live feed, but there are some recordings we can check out. They are a bit corrupted, but I should be able to compensate for that. Trying to pull up the last recorded video before shutdown. He tapped at his ARI, and the projection changed to a glitched view. Here we go. The projection showed security personnel in front of the sealed door. They were firing at semi and fully transformed Kriegans coming from the ramps. The sheer number of transformed Kriegans overwhelmed the security personnel, who retreated into the control center. After a few minutes, the entirety of the area was filled with multiple variations of transformed Kriegans who were attacking the doors. Dr. Snowden's heartbeat ramped up as he scrutinized the transformed. They moved in an unusual manner and seemed focused on getting to the security personnel. He looked over at Emily, who was grimacing. Thankfully, those things are dead now. Yeah, not sure I would want to have to mess with those in this environment, said Ricard. The projection went blank. Everin tapped at his ARI. I am checking the other feeds. After a few minutes, Everin's lips drew flat. Well, I found the cause of the transformations. This video feed is from around the same time as the last one. The projection changed to a view of a large hallway. In the middle of it was a stone structure resembling an obelisk. Red, smoke-filled tendrils snaked out from it, and when it touched a Cregan, they would fall to the ground and roll around for a bit, but then stand up with small physical signs of a transformation. The tendrils looked like they were pumping something into the Cregans. A steady flow of unwilling Cregans were brought to the obelisk structure and transformed. What the heck is that? said Dr. Snowden. Unknown. If it is still on the ship, we should avoid it. I don't think it would have survived exposure to deep space, but I cannot confirm that, said Everin. The projection changed to the ship's layout, and a red dot appeared a few rooms over. I have found where the crystal is stored, and unlocked its security container. Andy aside. Finally! This place is unnatural! They exited and headed toward the room the projection showed. Everin tilted his head when they reached the main hallway. He put his UIC on the panel next to the entryway doors and touched his ARI. The doors sealed shut. Dr. Snowden's blood ran cold. Expecting company? No, but why take a chance? Come, said Everin. Dr. Snowden's heart continued to race as he licked his lips. His stomach roiled as he had flashbacks of the drog on the Crotovore ship. After trembling for a moment, he refocused on the task at hand. They reached the security container room. It was a small room, and a portion of the wall jutted out. The area above it was indented past the sides of the wall. The indentation had black flaps on the sides, with a console on the portion that jutted out. Everin walked up to it and placed his UIC on the console. After a moment, he rubbed his chin. It has already been picked up. Checking the feed for this room. After a minute... He grabbed his UIC and faced the group. It appears whoever took this had the appropriate credentials to do so. I suspect they are in the command center, which is farther ahead. 
Come. Dr. Snowden's heartbeat slowed down as he focused on his suit's interface on their way to the command control center. He had navigated the various options and pressed the navigation icon and then a map icon. It showed a map on the HUD that was similar to the layouts that Everin's ring generated. There were options on the interface to see where they had traveled, with distances and times. The functionality reminded him of a global positioning system with a holographic interface. He also noticed he could set a waypoint, and when he had set one to the command center, he could see a dotted green line on the ground leading to it. Emily had to tap his arm a few times as he lagged behind playing with it. The suit was turning out to be more versatile than he had originally imagined. The command control center was a large open area. Like the main security control center, it had a command chair surrounded by various workstations. Consoles lined the edges of the room, with smaller rooms hanging off the back. The sides of the room had multiple large screens. Everin walked up to the command chair and scanned the corpse sitting in it. He reached into the pocket of the corpse's uniform and pulled out the crystal. It appears the captain understood the importance of the crystal. He placed the crystal in a container that slid out from his belt. Dr. Snowden noted that Everin would tap the side of his belt and that portion would slide out. It reminded him of pulling out a drawer on a dresser. The surface area exposed was light blue and rippled. When Everin had placed the crystal into it, Dr. Snowden expected to see the crystal fall to the ground. Instead, it submerged into the surface and vanished. He understood then that it was using dimensional mechanics. The container surface may have been somewhat small, but what it was a surface to could be much larger. He had looked on his own belt to see if he had one as well, but did not see anything like it. Everin walked over to one of the consoles and placed his UIC on it. I have shut off the emergency help signal that has been broadcasting. There is a visual log here meant to be viewed by whoever reaches this room. He gestured at one of the large screens. I am relaying it now and you should be able to hear it, as I have patched the audio into our communication system. The screen showed a tired Cregan grimacing in the command chair. His suit was tattered, and his face covered in blood and grime. This is the captain. Although our ship was able to leave Cregus, a portal stone got on board. We don't know how it got on board, but it has been activated and is transforming the crew similar to what those bastards did on Cregus. His right eye twitched. We're trying to contain it, but the transformed have begun opening the cryopods and transforming out the newly awakened civilians. I'm not sure how they are opening the pods. Roughly a third of our security personnel have gone down. We have sealed off the security and command center. The captain looked down for a moment, then sighed. The ship will be decompressed. Many lives will be lost but this contagion cannot be allowed to spread. We will try to save any who are left, but as of this moment, all cryopods have been opened. The fusion reactor requires a manual restart, and we will attempt it after decompression. He looked down at the crystal in his right hand. May the great selector show mercy on us in our time of need. The screen went black. Dr. Snowden rubbed the goosebumps on his arm as he faced Everin. You don't think that portal stone is active now, do you? It is possible. Ricard shook his head. These portal stones were on the ancient homeworld and caused the mass exodus. I have never seen one until now. No one knows where they came from, just that they did. Andia faced Ricard. Judging by what happened on this ship, it's no wonder the Cregans fled. They didn't stand a chance. At least one of your colony ships made it, though, and your race has flourished since. Rikar looked at the ground. Yeah. Imagine if this one would have survived. We did eventually clear the planet by bombarding it from space several hundred years later and establishing outposts and bases. But we couldn't locate the other colony ships. He looked around. Now I know why. Everin moved his hand across his ARI and pressed a few buttons. Several screens flashed on, and a red line appeared at the bottom of them. 
It showed a visual feed of various areas on the ship. Transformed were seen roaming around. He glanced at Dr. Snowden. Interesting. These are live feeds across the ship. It appears your question of whether the portal stone is active or not has been answered, Dr. Snowden. I am unsure of what triggered it, but now know it is not from this universe, otherwise it would not be able to activate. I suspect it is rehydrating the transformed using exotic matter and energy. Emily ran over to Dr. Snowden and death-gripped his right arm with her trembling hands. I wouldn't call that interesting. Dr. Snowden let out a measured breath as dread pervaded his body. He swallowed hard with wide eyes. That's just great. Ricard grunted as he flicked several buttons on his weapon. He drew it in front of him in a forceful manner and nodded his head vigorously. They will taste modern Kriegan weaponry. Oh, great selector, said Andia as she took a shaky step back. Everyone stay calm. We will get through this. V, establish a command link with this ship, said Everin. Acknowledged, said V, over the communications channel. After a few moments, V spoke. Connection established. Everin grabbed his UIC and put it on his belt. Let us head to the Torvata. We will need to be careful. You don't seem awfully concerned about those things, said Andia. It appears that they need to drag the preserved bodies to the stone to rehydrate them. That will take time. If we hurry, we can avoid most of them. Everin, Rukar, and Andia headed toward the command center exit. Everin paused when they reached it and turned around to face a trembling Dr. Snowden and Emily, who were breathing deeply with their eyes closed. They were still standing near the center of the room. Dr. Snowden... Dr. Snowden opened his eyes and nodded. Coming. He tapped Emily's hand and they grouped up with the others. You okay? asked Andia as she squeezed Emily's shoulder. Emily gulped. Hope so. Dr. Snowden realized that both he and Emily shared a moment of paralyzing fear. His mind had screamed at him to run, even though they were not in any immediate danger. Something was wrong. They exited the command center and headed to the security center's main entrance. When they arrived at the sealed doors, Everin placed his UIC on the panel to the side. He rubbed his chin and, after a moment, extended his hand. A projection shot up from his ring, showing the other side of the doors they stood before. Several transformed were sauntering up and down the ramps. Others were either milling about or crawling on the ground. V. Nearest exit. Analyzing. After a moment, V responded. One level beneath you is the nearest exit, relaying coordinates. The projection from Everin's ring showed the ship's layout. It showed their current location and a path to the exit. They would need to go down the ramps on the right side coming from the door, then along the wall to a hallway that led to an external door similar to the one they came in from. Dr. Snowden had messed with his interface and was able to see that there was an option to synchronize V's relayed coordinates into the GPS system. He pressed it and saw the same projection on his HUD that Everin's ring had displayed. Everin put his hand to the side, which turned off the projection. The plan is I will draw them to the center of the room outside these doors. Once they are on me, Rikar, lead the others to the ramp. I will join you after dispatching the ones focused on me and then move ahead, clearing a path. Rikar nodded. Got it. Everin looked around at everyone. Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia, deploy your repulsing weapons and shields. Dr. Snowden deployed his repulsor weapon and activated his shield. He flicked his wrist around a bit while pointing at the ground. His heart was racing, and his palms were sweating. Fighting on the ship was not something he had planned on doing. It was getting warm in his helmet, so he adjusted its internal temperature through his interface. Everin turned back to the sealed door. Okay, I am opening the doors now. He swiped his hand across his ARI, and both the interior and exterior door slid to the right. He grabbed his UIC and placed it on his belt while pulling off his utility handle. It was fully extended into a staff with glowing orange ends by the time he reached the exterior door. He turned his head halfway. I am going in. 
Rakar moved forward to the exterior door as Everin ran out into the open area in front of the security control center. Andia and Emily followed behind him. The transformed in the area paused as they turned toward Everin. One rushed from ahead of him. Everin aimed his staff at it and fired a repulsing beam. The creature flew back as several others advanced. Everin rushed forward. Another two ran from the ramp toward him. He swept the legs of the first one and pushed the second one to the ground. He stepped back and fired again. The two flew to the opposite ramp that he was trying to secure. Ricard turned his head halfway to the side and gestured toward the ramp. Let's go. He ran ahead. Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia followed Ricard. When they got to the ramp, Everin had herded the remaining transformed over to the ramp on the other side of the room. He ran over to Ricard and looked at the ramp, then headed down it, knocking a few of the transformed off it. Once it was cleared, he gestured at Ricard to come forward. Ricard signaled for Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia to follow him as he descended to the landing, where Everin waited. Dr. Snowden noted there was another ramp they needed to go down. It gave him a view of the next level, however. His mouth dropped at seeing the multiple cryopods arranged like bookshelves. Around them on the floor were hundreds of transformed and corpses in various states. He noticed about half of the corpses were still preserved and the others were being carted off by the transform to the portal stone for rehydration. He had activated the directional component of the GPS system, and could see a green line running ahead through the mass of transformed. Um, how are we going to get through that? Everin pointed down the sidewall. The hallway we need to get to is ahead. Just stay close to the wall, shoot as needed, and we should avoid a majority of them. I am going to head out ahead of the group and grab their attention again. Do not stay too close to me. V is going to bring the ship to the exit we need to get out of and will then join us if needed. Going now. Everin rushed down the ramp and clung to the side of the wall. He occasionally repulsed a few transformed. After a minute, he moved out from the wall a bit, where he got swarmed. Dr. Snowden could barely see him, but he noticed transformed were flying everywhere. Ricard nodded and turned toward Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia. Let's move. They proceeded down the ramp. When they reached the bottom, they stayed close to the wall and advanced toward the hallway that would lead to the exit door. Several creatures ran up behind them, but Dr. Snowden was able to repulse them with his device. He liked how it performed. Just aim and fire, and anything hit by the hollow beam went flying backward. Emily was by his side, shooting toward the middle and Andia was taking shots to the side and ahead along with Rakar. He did notice he could move faster without any air pressure hindering him. When they were halfway there, Dr. Snowden jumped as he heard Rakar scream. He turned to see Rakar being pulled into a side room. He rushed to the doorway and saw four transformed holding Rakar down and trying to bite and claw him. He stepped into the room. Two of the transformed looked up and then peeled off toward Dr. Snowden. He fired at them, and they slammed into the other side of the room. Emily, said Andia. Dr. Snowden stepped out of the room and watched as Emily booked it along the wall toward the exit. What was she doing? He faced Andia and gestured at Emily. Protect her. What about you two? We'll be fine. Go. Andia nodded as she fired into the growing crowd of transformed outside the room. She took off down the side. Dr. Snowden ran over to Rakar, who had managed to get one of the transformed off him. The two that Dr. Snowden had knocked to the other side of the room were back up and approaching Rakar. Dr. Snowden fired at them again, sending them back against the wall. He grabbed the shoulder of one that was still on Rakar and pointed his repulsing device next to the creature's temple. He fired, sending chunks of the transformed into the air. The other one Rakar had gotten off focused on Dr. Snowden, who angled himself and lined up his shot. He fired at the creature, sending it back into the other two he had shot earlier. Ricard flipped over and tried to stand up. He fell back down. Feeling weak. Having trouble seeing. Dr. Snowden grabbed Ricard's arm and stood him up. He saw blood dripping out of a gash on Ricard's arm. He wondered how tough the claws must have been to puncture the light armor. He shook his head and put Ricard's arm around his shoulder. Keep focused. We're almost there. He turned his head to check on the ones that were blasted back. They were getting up and headed over to him. He hustled as fast as he could to the doorway, with Rakar limping along. His heart sank and his breathing went ragged as he saw three more rushing toward the door. 
He stepped out of the room and shot back at the three in the room, sending them sprawling. He turned toward the crowd of transformed, rushing him outside the room. He raised his arm to fire, but Ricard, going completely limp, dragged him down. He swung his right arm around wildly while death-gripping the repulsor weapon handle. The transformed had adapted and were actively dodging it. He calculated he only had a few moments before he would be swarmed. Where was Emily? Did she make it? A large transform standing around ten feet tall charged toward them. It had bits and pieces of other transformed across its body. It shoved other transformed out of the way. Dr. Snowden drew his lips flat as a chill ran through his body. He called out to Everin to no avail. He shot at the creature, who shrugged off his repulsing blast. He trembled as he braced himself. He was not going to survive this. The thought had never crossed his mind until now. At least Emily was safe. At least he thought she was. Time slowed down as the transformed monstrosity hurtled toward him. He could feel the vibrations of every step it made. He drew his lips down and closed his eyes, but they popped open when he heard V. Defensive mode engaged, said V in full body mode. The large transformed focused on V and slammed its hand down on top of him. He emerged through the top side of the hand. The creature howled as V pulled himself out of the hand and ran up the arm. He placed both legs around the neck and began tearing out chunks on the back of the creature's head. After a moment, the creature slumped to the ground. The other transformed swarmed on V. He grabbed the nearest transform by the neck and lifted it off the ground, then tossed it away. He kicked the legs off another, then put a hole in another's chest, then ripped the head off another. Dr. Snowden exhaled sharply. V. V approached him with arms out. I will carry Rakar. Get to the hallway. Everin is holding them off there. Dr. Snowden stood as V picked up Rakar. He glanced over at the cryopods and saw the obelisk-like portal stone. Red tendrils reached out from it and caressed the bodies being brought to it. The tendrils were pumping exotic matter into corpses and, after a few moments, would move to another corpse brought to it. He shuddered and swallowed hard. Once V had Rakar in his arms... He took off along the side with V behind him. He did not want to be anywhere near that stone. They reached the hallway without too much trouble, although he had to shoot a few transformed along the way. Everin was off to the side, fighting dozens of transformed. He glided from transformed to transformed, sending them flying or disabling them in a multitude of ways. His staff was a whirlwind, and each move was like a perfect finisher. V pointed down the hallway. We need to go. Dr. Snowden glanced at V, then at Everin. We need to help him. Everin will be fine. He will join us once we are safely on the ship. Dr. Snowden knew Everin was tough, but the room had begun to descend on him. Dr. Snowden exhaled sharply and nodded. He turned and ran down the hallway. As he approached the open exit door ahead, he saw Andia and Emily on the Torvada's ramp just outside the door. Emily had her head in her hands and was sitting with her knees to her head. He burst through the door with V. V headed up the ramp. I need to get Ricard to the medical lab. Everin is on his way now. Dr. Snowden retracted his helmet and noticed the others had as well. He watched V go into the Torvada. He decided to wait for Everin and turn toward Emily. Emily? Emily shuddered as she looked up at Dr. Snowden with wide eyes. I'm sorry, Uncle Albert. I don't know what came over me. Uncontrollable fear? Yeah. How did you know? Happened to me in that throne room on Max's planet. Also felt a twinge of it back in the command center. Emily grimaced. What's wrong with us? Andia looked at Emily. It happens. I don't think there's anything unusual about that. Emily shook her head. No. It isn't us. Something's off. Everin burst through the open door and onto the ramp. He closed the door and pulled the two metal rods shut. The sounds of the transformed hitting the door rang out. He turned toward Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia. Everyone okay? Dr. Snowden pointed up the ramp. Rakar is hurt. V took him to the medical lab. Everin nodded. I see. He tilted his head at Emily. What about you? Emily half grinned. Just got a bit scared is all. 
Everin narrowed his eyes. Interesting. He looked up at the ramp. Okay, let us head to the medical lab. Andia helped Emily up, and with Dr. Snowden, they followed Everin into the ship. They went to the medical room, passing a startled Silva on the way. What's going on? Ricar shut off his body camera a while back, said Silva with a raised voice. Not now, later, said Dr. Snowden, extending a hand toward Silva. Once inside the medical lab, Dr. Snowden noted that Ricar was strapped to a table. Ricar was writhing around with a mix of blood and sweat emanating from his body. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened. He could not understand the words Ricar was shouting. It was evident that whatever transformation process that occurred on the ship was now happening with Ricar. Ricar's skin had turned an even darker shade of purple than it already was. A splotchy texture had appeared on his neck. He was not sure how Ricar went from limp to this state, but was glad it happened here and not on the Cregan ship. Everin placed his UIC on Ricar. It glowed a light red, then emitted a stable, deep red light after a moment. Everin rubbed his chin while studying his ARI. V walked over to a device that held several syringes. One of the syringes retracted into the device. When it came out, the cartridge attached to it was filled with a beige-colored gel. V grabbed the syringe, walked over to Everin, and handed it to him. V, take the Torvata to a safe distance. Make sure it is still within range to send commands to the colony ship. Acknowledged, said V, as he exited the medical lab. Everin scrutinized the syringe. There are biological entities in Rakar trying to control his body. These nanobots will correct that. I think he might be better off with a Kriegan medical team looking at it, said Silva. Everin shook his head. Not if you want him to live. He bent over and pricked Rakar in the neck. Rakar shouted as his hands clutched at the slab he was on. His head shook violently for a moment. Then his body went limp. Emily grabbed Rakar's hand as she glanced at Everin. What happened? The nanobots have shut down his movement while they deal with the biological threat. However, there may be some damage. I need to steady him and make sure his body rallies. I am going in, said Everin. He moved to the head of the slab and pulled up a chair. He sat down and placed his hands on each side of Rakar's head. Silva snorted. Going in where, exactly? Everin glanced at Silva. To his mind. He closed his eyes. Everin faded into a black void. A desert landscape rushed toward him from below. After a moment, he stood on a sea of sand. He raised his hand and looked around. He pivoted toward a voice shouting in the distance and then walked toward it. After a few moments, he arrived to see Rakar lying in the sand. Rakar's hands and feet were bound with metal cuffs, and a bar ran between them, connecting them. Everin, what's going on? said Rakar. Everin walked over and knelt beside Rakar. We are in your mind. You have been infected. I have injected nanobots to remove the threat, but you must stay in control of your mind. Rakar shook his head. I haven't given up. Your bindings. They are a mental construct. If you wish them away, they will go. What? Focus. Close your eyes. You are in control of your mind. Imagine the bindings away. Ricard shut his eyes and gritted his teeth. After a moment, he opened them. It's not working. Everin placed his hands on Ricard's shoulders and then looked him in the eye. You are a Cregan ranger. Your duty is to your people. You chose this role because you believed you were capable of defending them from threats. How will you defend them if you cannot control your mind? Ricard drew his lips flat as his eyes misted. I am in control of my mind. Prove it. Ricard squinted hard and clenched his jaw. After a few moments, the cuffs and bar dissipated. He exhaled sharply through his mouth as he opened his eyes. He looked down at his hands and feet, then struggled to stand. Everin reached out to steady Ricard. Ricard narrowed his eyes as he rubbed his wrists while taking deep breaths. He glanced at Everin. Thanks. Why are you here? I entered your mind to help stabilize you while the cleanup occurs. 
How, though? Telepathy? This feels so real. It is real. The nanobots I have injected to fight this infection have also allowed me to communicate and have a stronger presence here. I am curious why you chose a desert. I didn't. A large version of the obelisk-like portal stone rose out of the desert near them. Silence. Rakar stepped back as he stared at the stone. What is that? We are your new masters, said the stone. Everin half-smiled. It is a representation of the biological entities in your system. They are trying to break you down. We cannot read you. No, of course not. We are not on the same level. A horde of transformed appeared at the base of the stone. They roared and shouted as they ran toward Everin and Rakar. Rakar's eyes widened and his lips parted. Everin pointed at the incoming transformed while glancing at Rakar. You are in control of your mind. Remove them. Rakar squinted hard as he balled his fists. Large humanoid robots rose up in front of him. Target acquired. They began shooting lasers from their arms and physically dismantling the transformed. Rakar smiled. Let's see how they handle Kriegan juggernauts. What is this? It is a realization that you are not in control here, said Everin. We are the Malazim. We are the Fleshmasters. This body is ours. I don't think so, said Rakar. He gestured toward the stone, and the juggernauts approached it, firing as they went. Several more juggernauts rose up out of the sand. The stone shook, then sank a bit into the sand. This is not possible. But it is. This mind is not yours to take, said Everin. We are gods. You will stop this. Maybe in your realm. In this realm, you are a blight. I cannot allow you to exist here. What are you? Something older and more powerful than you. In conjunction with Rakar's mind, you are no match here. The stone sank farther as the approaching juggernauts increased their firing rate. You will cease this immediately. Rakar shook his head. You're not welcome here. You almost caused the extinction of my species. You'll pay for that. Your species is one of many we have bent to our will. We cannot be stopped. Rakar half grinned and pointed up to the sky. If we ever find any more of your stones, you will deal with this. A shadow cast over them as a large ship appeared in the sky. That is a Kriegan dreadnought. It will erase you. Your technology is no match. We'll see. A beam shot out from the dreadnought, encompassing the stone. The stone sank until just the tip was visible. We will be back. Rakar balled his fists and shook one at the stone. And the Kriegans will be waiting for revenge. The stone sank into the sand. Rakar sighed and glanced at Everin. So that is what almost wiped out my people. I can't imagine what it must have been like for them. Thanks for coming. Everin smiled. You did all the work. I just pointed you in the right direction. Rakar pursed his lips and looked around. So what now? Everin gestured around at the surrounding desert. This is your mind. You can do whatever you want while your body heals. I must go, however. I cannot leave that ship out there. I understand. I owe you, said Rakar, as he sighed and nodded. Everin shook his head. You do not. This is what I do. You should recover in a few days, although it may appear to be longer in here. I will see you when you wake. Will do, said Rakar, as he shook Everin's hand. Everin faded out.
Dr. Snowden watched as Everin removed his hands from Rakar's head. I thought you were going to help him. I have. His mind is clear. He will need a few days to heal. You had your hands on his head for a few minutes, said Andia. Everin glanced at Dr. Snowden, then Emily. The perception of time can be different in the mind. Dr. Snowden drew his lips flat. Flashbacks of the virtual simulation aboard the Crotovor ship appeared in his mind. He understood that Everin could have spent hours in Rakar's mind, but it would only appear as a few minutes in the real world. He tilted his head at Andia. Based on my anecdotal experience, he's right. Andia shot Emily a look. You understanding any of this? Yeah. Imagine doing a year in your mind and only three weeks in reality, said Emily with a half smile. Andia jerked her head back. Well, I hope he comes out of this without any issues. What do we do now? Everin stood up and walked to the entrance of the room. We have a ship to destroy. They followed Everin out of the room and to the command center. V positioned himself at the front console. Dr. Snowden saw that V had moved the Torvada far enough that the colony ship seemed like a small blip on the front screen. As Everin sat at his command chair, Silva hustled up next to him. You can't destroy that ship. It's Krieg in history. It is also filled with what caused the mass exodus of your planet. The portal stones do not belong here. I must remove them, said Everin. You can't make that decision. Who do you think you are? Everin stood up and fixed his gaze on Silva. I am the one the great selector chose to speak to. Silva's eyes widened as he took a step back. His chin trembled as he clasped his hands in front of him. He exhaled from his mouth and looked at the ground. He nodded. Everin sat back down and interacted with the arm of his command chair. V. Set the auto-destruct for twenty minutes. Acknowledged. After a few moments, Everin scrutinized his chair arm. The ship's auto-destruct has been set. Dr. Snowden walked up to the front guardrail and squinted at the ship. Less than ten minutes ago, they were aborted and fighting their way off it. He was not going to miss it, but his stomach dropped at the thought of all those people long ago waking up to transformed around them. They had nowhere to go and stood no chance. It must have been terrifying for them. After twenty minutes, Dr. Snowden watched the ship silently explode. He shook his head and faced Everin. One down, two to go. Let's hope the others don't involve destruction. Everin nodded. We can take a break. Let us meet in the conference room in five hours. Andia smirked. No argument there. I'm going to get out of this suit and get cleaned up. Silva nodded and walked off toward the living quarters. After Andia and Silva had gone, Emily faced Everin. Everin, I experienced an unusual reaction on the ship. Everin half grinned. I know. We will deal with it after all of this. Dr. Snowden cocked his head. Do you know something we don't? This out-of-control fear thing is dangerous. Everin extended a hand, palm down toward Dr. Snowden. Just a hunch. I will need to run some tests later. You both should be okay until then. Dr. Snowden glanced at Emily, then at Everin. Fine. I'm going to get cleaned up and then take a nap. I am beginning to understand how Sanjay must have felt on the Crotovore ship. Come on, Emily. They walked off toward the living quarters. Chapter 8 Dr. Snowden awoke from his nap to the sound of his PSD chirping. He set an alarm to wake him an hour before their planned meeting time so he could talk with Everin before everyone gathered. After showering and getting dressed, he headed to the conference room. It was empty, and craving a cup of coffee, he headed over to the replicator pads. After getting his coffee, he moved on to the medical lab. If Everin was anywhere, he would be there or in the research lab but more likely in the medical lab due to Rakar. Upon reaching the medical lab, 
Dr. Snowden found Everin sitting in a chair at one of the side tables while analyzing a hologram. Everin turned his head toward Dr. Snowden. Have a good nap. Dr. Snowden nodded. He walked over and sat in a chair opposite Everin. Yeah, with so much going on, I wanted to get some rest in before approaching you with some questions. What is on your mind? asked Everin, rubbing his chin. Dr. Snowden took a sip of his coffee. When we were on the ship, I saw the portal stone. It had those red tendrils coming out of it, and I think you knew more about it than you were letting on. Ah, uh, yes. I did not want to mention it outside you and Emily. It was an outsider artifact. It acted as a conduit into this realm and, by its very nature of being exotic in its makeup, would be able to survive in deep space. They call themselves the Malazim. How do you know its name? I talked to them in Rakar's mind. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened. He could not imagine what type of conversation they had. He glanced at Rakar. Rakar appears to be doing okay, though. I guess whatever influence it had went away. Everin nodded. With a little prodding. If I had not gone in, it would have permanently damaged his mind. Outsiders are more aware of their mortality when in a body. When they use an artifact as a portal, they are less concerned about what they do. The Malazim believed they were gods, and this was another realm for them to conquer. I could not allow that. Dr. Snowden took another sip of his coffee and nodded his head. Wonder how it got on the ship. My hypothesis is that it appeared on a shuttle to the colony ship in space. It would have then been moved when some were infected. Once in space, they would have put it in the middle of the ship and began bringing bodies to it. Dr. Snowden gulped. But Rakar began transforming immediately. The Malazim can control both the infection rate and appearance once inside a body, assuming the host does not resist. All those people. What a horrible way to wake up from a deep sleep. Their attention focused on Emily as she walked into the room with a running outfit on. She walked over to the work table. Uncle Albert, you're up early. Good evening to both of you. Everin half smiled at Emily. You look rested. Did I miss something? It's unusual for Uncle Albert to be awake near dinner time. Dr. Snowden shook his head then gestured at Everin. Everin thinks that stone on the colony ship was an outsider artifact. I just had some questions on it is all. That wouldn't surprise me. They would act like a portal or something, right? Dr. Snowden jerked his head back. Well, that's what Everin thinks. You're awfully observant this evening. It just popped in my head. Emily glanced at Rakar. How's he doing? Everin gestured at Rakar. He is making a speedy recovery. He should be up and about by tomorrow morning. Awesome. Emily glanced at the entrance to the medical lab, then back at Everin and Dr. Snowden. Going to get a run in. Later, Gators. She smiled at them and then exited the medical lab. Forty-five minutes later, everyone had assembled in the conference room. Everin sat at the head of the table, with Silva and V to his right, Andia, Emily, and Dr. Snowden to his left. Everin interacted with his ARI, causing two projections to shoot up from the middle of the table. It showed Kriegis and another planet. We have two more crystals to collect. One is on Kriegis. The other is on a planet called Gases. We need to decide on where to go next. Suggestions. Silva smirked and glanced at Emily. Ah, time travel. Emily glared back. Yes, time travel. Everin gestured at Andia and then Dr. Snowden. Kriegis, then. Andia nodded. Not a problem for me, and although I would have initially agreed with Silva on the time travel aspect, not so sure about that now. Dr. Snowden half smiled. Kriegis is fine with me. He nodded at Silva. Prepare to learn about time travel. We are in agreement then. We will head to Kriegis. 
Based on the oldest historical records, the colony ship landed roughly 5,000 years ago, said Everin. Correction. 5,240 years. Thanks, V. To the command center we go, then, said Everin, as he shut off the projections. He stood up and then exited the room, with the others in tow. Once in the command center, he took his seat while the others took theirs. V took his usual position at the front console. V, take us to Kriegis. Acknowledged. The Torvada shot out a beam that generated a portal, then flew through it, emerging over Kriegis. Silva shook his head. I still don't see how that is possible. Andia smirked. Let's just be happy it does what it does. Can we stop in? asked Silva. Everin glanced at Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia. Dr. Snowden shrugged while Andia and Emily nodded. Everin interacted with the arm on his chair. V, take us to the Fredorian Embassy. Acknowledged. As they approached the planet, the right front screen lit up with a credentials request. V pressed a few buttons on the console, and the credentials screen faded away. Everin smiled. It appears our pass is still good. The Torvada descended through the cloud cover and approached the domed city they had visited earlier. The ship flew through an opening in the dome instead of heading to the landing pads. After a few minutes, they landed where they had initially departed from Kriegis. Everin stood up. Meet back here in twenty hours. Silva stood up and stretched. Finally. Be good to be on familiar ground. I need to check in. He walked toward the ship's entrance. Andia faced Dr. Snowden and Emily. I am going to check in at the embassy. Care to join me and then catch dinner afterward? I think I'm good. I just want to unwind a bit, said Dr. Snowden. Oh, okay. Emily swatted Dr. Snowden's arm. Sure, sounds good to me. What? said Dr. Snowden. It's okay, said Andia, as she gestured toward the ship's entrance. Emily nodded and followed Andia. Dr. Snowden studied them as they left. Did I miss something again? You implied that you could not unwind around Andia. Dr. Snowden snorted. I didn't imply that at all. Everin half smiled. Well, what's done is done. Everin gestured toward the research lab. Come. I will show you some interesting things in the planner cartography lab. Emily followed Andia off the Torvada. She enjoyed spending time with Andia. She knew Uncle Albert would not care whom she had a relationship with, but she suspected he liked Andia as well. She was more surprised about Fredorian's views on relationships. From discussing it with Andia, they did not have exclusive couples. They had groups. Children were raised by the state alongside the parents. Every child was taken care of. The groups were a mix of females and males, and there was no legal binding other than the parentage of the children. Everyone was free to come and go. Apparently it worked for Fedorian society, as it was the model used since their inception. Andia had stopped and turned to face Emily. You look deep in thought. Emily smiled. Just thinking about where we are is all. She looked around. Where to first? I need to check my office. Then we can prepare for dinner and head out. Will that work for you? Asked Andia. Yeah. Okay. Your room should still be there for you. I will meet you there in, say, an hour? Emily nodded. Okay. Andia stepped in close to Emily and put one hand on Emily's neck. She drew in close and kissed the other side of Emily's neck and then walked off into the Fedorian embassy. Emily felt a warmth surge through her. Her smile stretched from ear to ear as she entered the building after Andia. An hour later, Emily checked herself out in front of the mirror in her bathroom. She had on a red dress with open-toe sandals. She was going to wear something else, but Andia had the outfit sent to her room. A knock on the door drew her attention. She walked over to the door with a small purse slung over her shoulder while making last-minute adjustments to her hair. Her ponytail was gone, as Andia liked her without it. She opened the door. Andia's eyes widened. Wow, 
You look great. Ready to go? Emily smiled as her heart rate increased. She swept her eyes across Andia, who wore a black dress with similar shoes. Her hair was piled up and looked like it had been sculpted. The scent of a sweet perfume perforated the air. You look great, too. I'm ready. Andia smiled and gestured down the hallway. Our transportation awaits. Emily followed Andia down the hallway. After a few minutes, they arrived at a shuttle with a Fedorian guard. Stepping into the shuttle, she noticed another guard up front alongside the pilot. She tilted her head at Andia. A lot of security. Andia nodded. Based on recent events, I felt it necessary. Emily nodded as she thought back to the second colony ship. She still felt embarrassed about running away, not only in front of Andia, but also Uncle Albert. It was not who she was. She hoped whatever was causing it would be fixed, if it was fixable at all. The flight to the restaurant only took about ten minutes. They landed on the roof and were ushered into the restaurant by one of the guards, who did not follow them in. They descended a ramp and walked into a large, empty dining room. A Cregan with a gold and silver outfit approached them. I am Tolius Jibar, your attendant for the night. Please, follow me. They followed Tolius to an open circular booth on the far side of the restaurant. Tolius gestured for them to sit, then touched a console on the table. Menu options have been loaded, and the restaurant is yours for the night. You can call me by using the call option on the console. When you have selected your food, I will bring it out. Any questions? Emily shook her head. Andia half grinned. It's not my first time here, Tolius. Your formality is appreciated, though. We're okay. As you wish, said Tolius. Emily slid into the booth while Andia slid into the opposite side. She looked down at the console on the table. She flipped through the various items. Recommend anything? Andia tapped at the table console. She flicked the item she selected over to Emily. The items on the menu here are edible by human standards. Emily scrutinized the item. It looked like celery, but made of meat. Um, well, why not? She ordered the item, along with a purple drink that looked like a soda. She hoped it wasn't something crazy. Andia smiled. Excellent. Dinner is on the way. Emily nodded. So, tell me, is this trip really your first time leaving Earth? Voluntarily, yeah. I got to see Earth from space on the way out here. It was breathtaking. I can't even imagine. Fedorians grow up and typically have their first flight in space by the time they are nine, definitely by ten. What happens when they hit ten? Andia smiled. They enter the military training part of their studies. Part of that is visiting at least one base off-world. There are some places on Earth where that occurs, though they don't go off-world. Typically, they wait until they are eighteen, though. Earth sounds so interesting. There isn't much Earth history taught, and what is known is very little. Emily laughed. Well, Earth is a lot different than you might think. There are a lot of weird things there. Andia jerked her head back. Like what? Tolius walked into the room, pushing a tray. He aligned it alongside the table and then lifted a platter to each of them. Will there be anything else? I'm fine, said Emily. Me too. Thanks as always, Tolius, said Andia. My pleasure, said Tolius, as he pushed the tray back out of the room. Emily poked at her green meat stick. Well... You remember that portal stone on the second colony ship? Andia nodded. It was an outsider artifact. What's that? It's an artifact from outside this reality. Andia chuckled. You know, if it was anyone else saying that, I would have dismissed it as crazy. Seeing what I have, though, in the last week, I believe you. She took a bite off her plate. Emily sipped at her purple drink. It had a fizz to it along with the strong root beer flavor. Well, the weird thing is, on Earth, 
There are thousands of these outsiders, not artifacts, but actual people. Along with them are other types of non-humans. Well, there would be aliens there, since it is a protected planet. Emily grimaced as she chewed on a bite of the green meat. She swallowed with wide eyes. That was interesting. She looked at Andia. Not aliens. Things called daedrolds and other names I don't remember offhand. Who knows what else is out there. All I know is there are a lot of them relative to the rest of the galaxy, at least from what Everin said. Andia put her hand on her chin. You know... You're lucky to get to travel with him. He's unique. There is also something unique about you and your uncle. I can't put my finger on it. Your hair, skin, and teeth all seem to shine. You have a glow about you. You move with precision. Your words are concise. And you seem to be a lot more knowledgeable than someone from Earth should be. Well, we do travel with Everin. No, I... No, I mean, you understand things very quickly, and can apply it. Now you're just flattering me, said Emily, as she smiled coyly. Not at all. If you lived on Fedoria, you both would be in my group. Emily's eyes widened as she jerked her head back. That would be a bit weird to be in a group with Uncle Albert. Andia laughed. <laughs> Not in the same group. Different groups, but... I would be in both of those groups. They talked a bit more, and after twenty minutes of eating, laughing, and enjoying themselves, Emily felt the urge to use the bathroom. She pushed her plate back. Where's the bathroom? Andia pointed to a hallway across the room. Over there. Emily half smiled. Thanks. I won't be long. She slid out of the booth and walked toward the hallway. She paused as she smelled an unusual scent. It was sweat. She looked around. Everything okay? asked Andia. Yeah. Probably nothing, said Emily. She pulled out her PSD from her purse and set up the stun beam. There were some noises, but she figured it was just the kitchen. Nonetheless, she was prepared. She reached the hallway and walked into the bathroom. It was large, and there was a small hallway leading to the larger part. Several spotless stalls stood to the top left of the room, with a mirror on the right wall. She walked down the short hallway and then entered one of the stalls, relieved herself, and then went to the mirror. After washing her hands and adjusting her hair, she heard heavy footsteps thudding toward the bathroom. She pulled out her PSD and moved to the left side of the room, where the small hallway joined with the larger part of the bathroom. It would be enough to give her the element of surprise if an attacker barged into the room. A large, fair-skinned humanoid with a leather suit entered and burst into the larger part of the bathroom. His head was bald, and he had ridges encircling his head. He sniffed and turned toward Emily. Emily fired her PSD at him. He dodged it and reached out to grab her arm. Her eyes flared and her face turned red. Rage bubbled inside her. As she went to fire at him again... She froze and then dropped her PSD. A surge of fear ran wild through her as her breathing went haphazard. That's more like it, said the humanoid as he stepped toward her. Emily squinted hard and shook her head. She grabbed the startled humanoid by his neck, knocking his grabbing arm out of the way, then tossed him into the mirror. His eyes popped open as she picked up her PSD and fired a beam at him, making him pass out. Another round of heavy footsteps approached. She grabbed the one she had shot and placed his upper half in one of the stalls so that his leg showed. The nanobots in her were pulsing with energy as she went to the same spot as before the first one came in. Another large humanoid similar to the one that had come in earlier burst into the room. He focused on the legs of the first one sticking out of the stall and rushed over to them. Emily tripped him and then hit him with the stun beam. He crumpled next to the first one. She listened for more footsteps but did not hear any. After a few moments, she opened her PSD and contacted Dr. Snowden. Dr. Snowden appeared on the display. Hey, having a good? He said, trailing off as his eyes widened. What happened? Under attack at the restaurant, said Emily. She spun the PSD around to show the two bodies on the floor, then spun it back. When she looked at the display, 
Everin was standing beside Dr. Snowden. Stay there. We are on our way, said Everin. Emily nodded and closed the PSD. She took a few deep breaths to steady herself as she went to check on Andia. As she approached the end of the hallway leading back to the main room, a voice called out, Come out, Emily, if you value the life of Andia. Emily peeked out and saw a humanoid similar to the ones in the bathroom with a weapon on the table pointed at Andia. Who are you? Delicus. It seems you got past my companions. I won't make that mistake. Come out, or I waste Andia. Emily slipped the PSD into her purse and stepped out with her hands raised. Don't hurt her. Delkis grinned. I don't particularly want to put myself in a situation by killing an ambassador, but the price on your head? Well, let's just say it might be worth it. Now stand still. He stood up while keeping his gun trained on Andia. He adjusted his gun and turned it on Emily as he approached her while keeping an eye on Andia. I have it on stun, though you might wish I'd kept it on lethal. Emily saw that Andia was tapping the sidearm strapped to her thigh under her dress. Emily nodded. Delkis, you're not very smart, are you? Delkis raised his weapon at Emily. You arrogant bitch. He fired. But Emily had already hit the ground. Andia pulled out her sidearm and fired, hitting Delkis in the back. He stumbled as blue arcs enveloped him, and then he fell to the ground. Emily ran up to Andia. Are you okay? Andia nodded. We make a good team. Emily smiled and hugged Andia. She pulled her head back and kissed Andia. She then stepped back and looked at Delkis. Another bounty hunter? Andia stepped out of the booth and knelt beside Delkis. She did a quick search of his body. I don't think so. I think he was a freelance mercenary. He isn't particularly well equipped. Whatever he was, he's out. The others? I just stunned them. Everin and Uncle Albert are on their way now. I heard sounds in the kitchen earlier. Do you think... Tolius? Andia shook her head. I don't know. Let's check. They walked to the kitchen and peeked in. Tolius lay on the ground with a large knife through his chest and some type of cloth over his mouth. Antia gritted her teeth and sighed while exhaling slowly through her nose. Damn. Not Tolius. She looked at the ground as her eyes misted. Let's search Delkis again, then head to the roof. They walked back to Delkis and searched him. Antia pulled a device off him. This should give us more information. Let's go. They hustled to the top of the roof. The shuttle guard by the door they exited from lay on the ground. Andia knelt and put her hand on his neck. He's dead. I'm guessing the pilot and others are as well. She walked over to the shuttle, peeked in, then shook her head. Emily could tell Andia was upset. Andia knew Tolius and probably knew the guards and the pilot. Emily walked over to Andia and put her arm around her. A few minutes later, the Torvada pulled into sight, then landed next to the shuttle. Everin ran down the ramp with his baton out. Dr. Snowden and V followed behind him. Everin scanned the guard on the ground with his ring. An abduction attempt? Andia nodded. Emily stunned two in the bathroom. I stunned the other thanks to Emily's distraction. She handed Delkis's device to Everin. He had this device on him. Everin scanned the device. Interesting. These were freelancers from the area. Apparently they knew you would be eating here and the place would be closed down. V, scan the two in the bathroom. Acknowledged, said V, as he walked toward the restaurant doorway. Dr. Snowden ran over to Emily and hugged her. I called for backup with my panic button, but no Cregan law enforcement came, said Andia. Everin narrowed his eyes. I hope you do not mind but I accessed the network from the Fedorian Embassy before heading out. The local Cregan station received your call. Andia drew her lips flat. This was planned, then, by someone with the authority to have it ignored. Everin nodded. Possibly. 
We can go over Delcus's device more in detail on the Torvada. I am sorry for the loss of your guards. Did you know them? asked Dr. Snowden. Andia looked down. I didn't personally, but they were my responsibility. They were loyal. The owner of this restaurant is dead as well. I knew him for a long time. He didn't deserve this. She sighed. I will have another shuttle come out and clean up. We can notify the Cregan authorities again when we get back. Her eyes flared. They won't ignore me this time. Everin gestured toward the Torvata. We can take my ship. There may be others out here still. Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia followed Everin into the Torvata and then to the command center. After a few moments, V joined them and took his spot at the front console. He faced Everin. I have bound them and placed them in the main room. Everin nodded. Fifteen minutes later, they were back at the Fedorian Embassy landing pad. Andia stood up. I need to handle some business in regards to this. Understandable. Do you wish for us to accompany you? asked Everin. Andia shook her head. I'll be fine. The embassy is the only place outside here that I truly feel safe. Thank you. Everin nodded, and then he and Dr. Snowden headed off to the planner cartography lab. Andio watched them go, then turned toward Emily. I don't wish to be alone tonight. Emily grabbed Andia's hand and half smiled. They walked out of the Torvada. On his personal ship, Ciros walked on to the command center, where Yoldaris and a few Covendron mercenaries worked at consoles. He placed his hands behind his back and surveyed the multiple screens. They were a few days away from the ancient Cregan homeworld. He knew that although Cregans were not allowed back on the planet in case of the portals, they still held military bases there. Caution would be needed. Yildaris stood up and walked over to Ciros. We have new information. I was just on my way to see you. Ciros nodded. Report. The Cregan inspector known as Silva has submitted a report to Senator Cross. It is a bit... unusual. Unusual how? Yildaris smirked. He claims that Everin talked to a great selector. Ciro smiled. How is that unusual? Yildaris jerked his head back. I may not believe the great selector is a god but I can't ignore that it had a hand in the development of humanoids. Only one person is to have ever talked to one. The founder of the Way of the Great Selector. Yes, I know the story. Emperors could also talk to them as well. Of course, having an Archeron makes it a bit easier. According to Silva, the Great Selector is but one of many. That's correct. Yildaris eyed Ciros. None of that is unusual to you? Ciros shook his head. I have talked to the great selectors before, so no, it isn't. What the Cregans claim is a god is merely another species to me. They didn't like me. They would have spoken to Everin and probably liked him. He is very charming when he wants to be. Yildaris swallowed hard. I see. There is another report on an encounter with a matter mage. Now that is a term I haven't heard in a long time. What was the outcome? They took him away to a matter mage colony in another galaxy, said Yildaris. He laughed. Not sure this guy is all there. Interesting. I thought the great selectors had wiped them all out. Appears one slipped by them. Yildaris's eyes widened as he licked his lips. The report says they called the great selectors by the name Deathlights, and there was a war with them. Yes, I remember the war well. Yildaris tilted his head. That must have been long ago. Otherwise it would be all over the galactic net. I'm much older than you think. 
What else was in the report? Yildaris gulped. They found the second colony ship and retrieved an Archeron crystal off of it. The ship had something referred to as a portal stone, and they were attacked by some type of transformed creatures. That ship must have been at least 5,000 years old. No way anything could have been alive on it. Ciros nodded. The work of the Malazim. They caused the mass exodus on the ancient Kriegan homeworld. It would appear one of their conduits was still on the ship. Yes. Well, one of those transformed infected the Kriegan ranger, Rakar, but Everin healed him. The Torvada's medical nanobots would have made quick work of the Malazim's biological infection. Yildaris ran a finger down the flat, screen-like device he had in his hand. He pressed on a section of it. And this Andia Kiggs. It appears she went to dinner with Emily Snowden and was attacked by unknown assailants. Ciros narrowed his eyes. Bounty hunters. Yildaris shook his head. According to these reports, it looks like an inside job. Ciros walked over to the guardrail that separated the command center from the entrance area of the room. Someone else is trying to capture them. Could be for the bounty I placed, or maybe something else. There is a small note here that the Kriegan law enforcement was notified during the attack, but they did not arrive until much later. Definitely an inside job, said Ciros as he looked around the control room. What else? They have two more crystals to get. Then we'll head to the ancient Kriegan homeworld. One requires time travel. The other is in the Drayton system, said Yildaris as he chuckled. These reports are outlandish. Time travel. That's ridiculous. To the temporarily unaware. Sure. You're serious? Ciro smirked. About Everin and time traveling? Absolutely. We can't do anything about those last two crystals. Yoldaris interacted with his device, and the planet in the Drajan system appeared on one of the screens. He pointed to it. We can head there now. It will be a while, though. On top of that, it's the Drajan system. They're quite hostile. Ciro shook his head. No. Everin will be there and gone by the time we get there. Yoldaris jerked his head back. They're on Kriegis now, though. That planet is at a minimum a month's journey. We can make it there before them. Now you're beginning to understand the capabilities of whom I seek. However, get me a list of mercenaries from Exibia. They are close enough that maybe one of them will get lucky. Patch me through when you find one that you consider worthy. As for us, continue on our current course. Yildaris looked at the ground for a moment, then looked back up at Ciros. I'll take care of it. He cleared his throat. Don't you think it's odd Everin is letting someone report on everything they are doing? He has to know that any party interested in that information will be listening in. Ciros looked at Yildaris. And that is what he wants. He wants me to know. Forward the full report to my workstation in my quarters. He wheeled around and exited the command center. Chapter 9 Dr. Snowden stared at the ceiling as he lay in bed. He had slept in later than he normally would. Emily would have had her run-in by now, and he wondered what time she got in after helping Andia in the embassy. A grin crept onto his face as he thought about the planner cartography lab that had soaked up hours of his time the day before. Zooming in and out across the stars was as simple as standing in the center of the lab and moving his hands around. It was addicting. He showered, dressed, and then headed to the conference room. Everin sat at the head of the table, as he always did, 
and Silva and Ricard sat in their usual spots. Dr. Snowden walked over to Ricard and put his hand on his shoulder. Ricard, good to see you're up and about. How are you feeling? Ricard glanced at Everin, then looked at Dr. Snowden. Much better. You travel with a powerful friend. Dr. Snowden smiled. Don't I know it. Everin's been inside my head, too. Really? Dr. Snowden chuckled. It was me and Emily's first time meeting him. Ours was a virtual simulation, though. He looked around. Speaking of which, where are those two? Everin looked up from the console he had been looking at. They are on their way. Andia said she had some last-minute business to take care of. Dr. Snowden nodded and headed to the replicator pad. He grabbed his usual breakfast and cup of coffee and sat in his normal seat. He took a sip of his coffee. So, any news on who those guys were last night? Cregan Law Enforcement is still looking into it, said Silva. Mm-hmm. Well, at least it can't be ignored now, said Dr. Snowden. What's that supposed to mean? said Silva. Everin confirmed that they received communication from Andia last night, but no help came. The help that came was me, Everin, and V. They are a busy unit, Rikar snorted. <laughs> In this district? It would have been a quiet night. No, if it was ignored, it was meant to be ignored. Silva glanced at Rikar. That's a bold accusation for a ranger to make. And an informed one as well. Dr. Snowden liked Rikar. Rikar spoke his mind and showed him that not all Cregans were alike. Dr. Snowden's attention focused on Andia and Emily as they entered the room. Emily was smiling from ear to ear, and Andia looked bright-eyed. He nodded at them. Well, glad you two could join us this morning. Ricard, said Emily, as she rushed over and hugged him. Andia followed her over and shook Ricard's hand and patted him on the back. Glad to see you two are well, said Ricard, smiling. Andia took her seat next to Everin while Emily sat next to her. No breakfast, said Dr. Snowden. I already had breakfast, said Emily, as she swatted Andia's arm. Andia and Ricard laughed. Dr. Snowden drew his lips flat. He seemed to be missing some inside joke. Oh, well then, I will just finish my breakfast. I'm glad you're here and safe, though. Emily smiled and then reached out and squeezed Dr. Snowden's shoulder. She then faced Everin. So, what's next? I was able to determine a method of scanning that will help us locate the other crystals. I have updated the Torvada systems with it so it should be available to any scanner connected to it, like my ring and your suits. I scanned Kriegis while everyone slept, and the crystal is not on the planet. In the past, supposedly. Right, said Silva. Yes. However, I took the time to go through various time periods to scan Kriegis. The result is that the crystal is gone the first month after the colony ship lands. I suspect it is we who take the crystal, but cannot verify that. However, since it is gone after the first month, if we do take it, then the timeline should have already adjusted for that. I was careful not to go too close to when we will be going there, otherwise we could encounter ourselves. I must warn everyone that any action taken in the past can have a ripple effect toward the future, so we must be cautious, said Everin. He glanced at Silva. Is Senator Cross aware of our plans? I updated her with my reports. I didn't know you were scanning the planet, so that wouldn't be in there. Her thoughts? Silva cleared his throat. She is uncertain on the accuracy of my reports. Andia chuckled. Means she doesn't believe it. I'm not sure I would either if I were in her place and read about traveling instantly across vast distances, matter mages, the great selector, and the transformed on that ship. Silva looked down. Yes, well, 
My reports are accurate. Everin nodded. I am sure they are. He interacted with his ARI, causing a projection to shoot up from the table, showing Kriegis. He pointed to a red dot pulsating on the surface. That is where it landed. They had a rough first month. Historical records speak of a disease that infected the colonists after they landed. The base for the cure came from a type of algae that grew on the walls in a nearby cave. It was discovered by Captain Maracus Laborn, a hero in Cregan history. Cregans are immune to the disease now, but back then, it was deadly. That immunity will be helpful when Silva and Rakar infiltrate their camp and meet with Captain Maracus then. Silva snorted. Excuse me? Andia chuckled. It makes sense. You're both Cregans, and you wouldn't arouse suspicion like the rest of us would. Yeah, I think if any human walked up to them back then and asked for one of their holiest artifacts, it wouldn't go over well, said Emily, with a grin. Silva eyed Emily down his nose. For once, we are in agreement. He turned toward Everin. I don't know about this. I'm still not entirely convinced we are even going there. Even if we do travel in time, how do you propose we get access to the crystal? asked Silva. They aren't going to just hand it over. You can tell them you are there to collect the crystals for safekeeping per military protocol. Silva narrowed his eyes. That would seem a bit out of place, don't you think? Ricard shook his head. Actually, that might work. Captain Maracus only knows that he had to safeguard it until it was retrieved. We can tell him that we started with them first. So if we are there a day before it disappears, what happens if it disappears before we can get to it? asked Silva, facing Everin. Perhaps then we will learn what happened to it. I do not know when it disappeared exactly, but going to the point where they have just begun to disassemble the ship for construction would be a good start, roughly two weeks after they landed, said Everin. We can do this. It's for our people, said Rakar, tilting his head at Silva. Silva paused as he looked at Rakar, and then nodded. Fine. For the record, I think this is dangerous to mess with history. Assuming we actually will be going back in time. We would also need a change of clothes to fit that era. You can select it from your room's clothing replicator. It has clothing from that era in the clothing selections. It sounds like we have a plan. Let us head to the command center, said Everin. Dr. Snowden looked around the room and noticed everyone nodding. He stood up and half smiled. As Emily would say... Let's do this. Emily drew her lips back, then laughed. I don't sound like that. Everin stood up and touched his ARI, causing the projection to fade. You do a bit. Emily shook her head while smiling. Dr. Snowden smiled as he exited the room. After a few minutes, they assembled in the command center and took their usual spots. Everin interacted with the chair arm. V, take us out. Acknowledged. The Torvada lifted off and descended through the atmosphere. Dr. Snowden squinted at the light shining off the domed city as it faded into the distance. After a few minutes, they were in space, looking down at Grigus. Dr. Snowden faced Everin. I know we are about to travel back in time, but can we view it from the roof? Everin nodded. Of course, if that is your wish. An interesting choice. I will accompany you. Emily stood. I'm going too. So is Andia. Andia cocked her head back as she stood up. Well, I guess I'm going too. Dr. Snowden stood and looked at Silva. You coming? Silva shrugged. At this point, why not? Ricard stood. Count me in. V turned and faced them. I am down. Emily giggled as Silva stared at V. They proceeded to the rear of the ship, then took the elevator to the roof. Once assembled on the roof, 
A smaller version of the front console shot up from the center of the roof. V took a position in front of it. V, proceed to the time coordinates I have sent. Acknowledged. Dr. Snowden walked to the edge of the guardrail. His breathing slowed as he tried to focus on Kriegis just underneath them. Kriegis began to fade, as did all the stars he could see. His heartbeat ramped up. What's going on? said Silva. We are moving through time, said Everin. After a moment, it was pure black around them. Dr. Snowden swallowed hard. He had seen this before, but being able to see everything disappear was beyond anything he could imagine. After a moment, Kriegis and the stars eased back into view. Silva rushed to the guardrail and looked down at Kriegis. What happened to Kriegis? We are back in time, when Kriegis had jungles. Dr. Snowden looked down at Kriegis. He could see why Silva was concerned. Seeing the planet go from the dull brown and white to a lush green would have been confusing. It was mind-boggling to even fathom how the Torvada could go through time. The ship had not even moved. Just there one moment in time. Shimmer. Then in another point in time. On top of that, it stayed relative to Kriegis. He figured if it had just went back in the same spot it was, they would be out in deep space somewhere. He shook his head and looked at Everin. You will need to explain how the Torvada can do that sometime. Everin half smiled. Sometime. We will need to head inside since we will be in stealth mode. With the swipe of Everin's hand over his ARI, the console slid back into the roof's floor. Dr. Snowden ran two fingers across his lips as he scrutinized the roof's floor. It was semi-transparent, and he did not see how or from where the console could have come. He looked around and saw Rakar, Emily, and Andia headed toward the elevator. Silva stood at the guardrail, looking out at Kriegis, with eyes widened and lips agape. Dr. Snowden approached him. Look, I know we have had our differences, and I apologize if I offended you, but we should put that to the side for the rest of this mission. He studied Silva, as Silva continued to stare over the guardrail in silence. You okay? Silva licked his lips and faced Dr. Snowden. How? How's this possible? From everything you've seen, this surprises you. Silva exhaled through his nose. It shouldn't, but it does. Dr. Snowden smirked. Trust me, I know that feeling. Matter may just defer to Everin, the great selector, of which I now know there are many, want to talk to him. He can go through time and travel great distances in a short amount of time. I'm having trouble believing my own reports. You're traveling with someone who those with godlike powers defer to. What does that make him? Dr. Snowden paused as he stared at Silva. He looked at the ground and exhaled sharply, and then looked back at Silva. That's easy. He's my friend. He turned and walked toward the elevator. Silva caught up to Dr. Snowden, and they entered the elevator. While in the elevator, Silva glanced at Dr. Snowden. You have one hell of a friend. I'm struggling to keep this all in perspective. Dr. Snowden nodded. He understood that Silva's foundation and belief system based on the Great Selector had been shattered, and here he was now, traveling with someone who he believes is on an equal or higher level. It was interesting to Dr. Snowden to observe, since he also went through something similar in seeing all the scientific and technological wonders from the first time he met Everin. Things that he thought were impossible occurred right before his eyes. They exited the elevator and headed to their respective seats in the command center. V. Stealth mode, said Everin. Acknowledged. Torvada stealth mode engaged. The Torvada broke cloud cover and descended toward Kriegis. 
The right front screen had a map overlay with a red dot indicating where they needed to go. The Torvada flew over to the dot and hovered above it. The right front screen showed the colony ship on the ground in various stages of dismantlement. Cregans could be seen moving around it near a makeshift camp nearby. Fee, take us to just outside the camp, said Everin. Acknowledged. The Torvada landed on an open patch where the jungle met blue grass. Everin pressed a few buttons on his chair arm. I have changed the external appearance to that of a Cregan ship of this era. He pointed back toward the living quarter. Silva, Rakar, you two can change clothing now. Silva and Rakar stood up and headed to the living quarters. After ten minutes, they returned. Rakar had on a dark blue military outfit with a black belt and unusual-looking boots. Silva had on a white robe with exotic designs across the shoulders and chest. It had several pockets scattered throughout. I am wearing a diplomat of the First Order robe, and Rakar has on a military intelligence outfit. That should give us some clout to work with, said Silva. I have some things that might help as well. Come, said Everin. He stood up and walked to the research lab with everyone in tow. In the research lab, he walked toward a replicator on the side of the room. After a few moments, two cards materialized. He grabbed them and handed one each to Silva and Rakar. Identification cards. Rakar looked the card over. These should come in handy. I'm impressed at the detail on it. I have had time to peruse Cregan systems, including the historical archives. Silva and Rakar put the identification badges into their side pockets. Everin walked over to a table and grabbed a small tablet device and then handed it to Silva. This device is similar to the devices used in this era and would be expected for someone of your rank, at least according to the archives. It is somewhat primitive relative to what you are used to, but it has the basics of communication, mapping, and storage, each mapped to buttons on the bottom of the device in that order. If you press the communication button, it will contact me, and I can send you any information you might need. The device does not have any future data on it, just so you know. Silva tilted the device around in his hands and nodded. He then placed it in a side pocket. Everin walked over to a cabinet and opened it, pulling out two necklaces with a small device on the end of them. Almost forgot these. They are panic devices. Just flip them on, and they will emit a loud, wailing noise. He handed them to Silva and Rakar. Anything else you might need? Silva glanced at Rakar, then shook his head. You did your research. But we should be okay. They will have synthesized a cure by now, and should be distributing it to the rest of the ship's crew. As advanced as the Kriegans are, even in this era, that's not too surprising they could come up with a cure for an unknown disease this quickly, said Dr. Snowden. Kriegans of this time period are not as advanced as your planet in the present. Dr. Snowden shook his head. I don't think so. These Kriegans traveled through space on a colony ship. We can barely send out probes across our solar system. Silva tilted his head. Although your planet has more advanced technology and knowledge than the Kriegans of this time period, I have read it is not shared with the general population. Dr. Snowden snorted. <laughs> Let me guess, the Helians. Silva paused for a moment, then nodded. That's correct. They have ships that can travel to other solar systems and very advanced technology for a protected planet. Dr. Snowden exhaled sharply through his mouth. Figures. One day there will be a reckoning for them. For what reason? asked Silva. Allowing humans to go into slavery for other alien races. Where did you hear that? From someone that I believe would know about it, said Dr. Snowden. He thought back to his conversation with Cesares. If you discover anything of it, let me know. It's illegal. Dr. Snowden glanced at Everin, then at Silva. All right. 
Although Silva had been rough around the edges initially, he was beginning to see another side of him, one where adherence to the law was not superficial, but a way of life. Everin rubbed his chin. We will be here should you need us. Rikar, your communication system is still tied into the ships. You can access it as you would any other communication channel. Good luck. Sounds good, said Rikar. Rikar nodded at Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia, and then headed to the Torvada entrance, with Silva in tow. Silva and Rikar paused outside the Torvada after exiting it. Silva turned toward the Torvada and soaked in the view. Impressive. It really does look like an ancient Kriegan ship now. Rikar scrutinized the Torvada. This ship was powerful. It was beyond anything he could have ever imagined. The first trip to Chorus was unbelievable, but he got used to it. Then they traveled in time, and now it had the appearance of an ancient Kriegan ship. It even had rooms that extended out past what should be possible in such a small ship. He nodded. Definitely unique. Silva paused as he tilted his head at Rakar. I agree. They turned and walked along the edge of the jungle toward the camp. Rakar studied the surrounding environment as they walked. He had learned growing up that Kriegis had been a jungle planet. He found it hard to believe at the time, since it was either desert, maintained grasslands, or infrastructure. He sniffed and inhaled the smells blaring around him. He noticed Silva was taking it in, too. So what do you think of this mission now? I am finding it difficult to believe any of it. Yet it's happening right in front of me. Yeah. I also like these humans. Never really interacted with them before. But they have heart. Silva looked down at the ground. I may have been hasty in my judgment of them. We all may have been. After a few more minutes of walking, they paused at the crest of a hill. Silva pulled out his tablet and pressed the map button. After scrutinizing it, he pointed off into the distance. That's where the administrative building would be, or will be. He placed the tablet back into his pocket. Ricar followed Silva's pointing and saw the large hill. Silva froze as the sound of a pack of animals cried out in the distance. I don't recognize that sound. Ricard tilted his head. I don't either. We are five thousand years in the past and will need to be careful. I've seen some of the bones of the predators in this era. He fingered his sidearm. They continued along the natural path until they reached the first signs of the camp. Standing on a hill, they could see the encampment was a hodgepodge of structures and various degrees of construction. The colony ship, in its various stages of dismantlement, loomed in the distance. Smoke billowed out of some of the completed structures. They were arranged in a circular fashion, with the largest completed structure in the center. The completed structures were rectangular with sharply angled, low-cut roofs. They were all metallic silver, the color of the ship. How do you want to proceed? asked Rakar. Let's, uh, head to the center. If this is anything like our architecture, the center will house the main administrative building and gathering area. Rakar nodded. They walked into the camp. Rakar noticed the structures that were half-built looked like they had not been worked on in a while. It did not surprise him, given the disease he knew to be around. They passed several structures with benches on the outside. Gregan sat on them, slouched over with dulled eyes. From what Rakar remembered, the disease made them lethargic until they died. As they approached the center of the encampment, two soldiers approached them. Silva and Rakar stopped walking and waited for the soldiers to come closer. Rakar noticed the dull blue outfit that would be typical of Kriegan military in this era. He half grinned as he noticed the projectile weaponry the soldiers were using. They also had on a gadget belt, and he recognized some of the older devices. 
They still used shrapnel-filled grenades instead of gravity and plasma grenades. He had studied them as a kid, and had traced their architecture from this period to the current. He wondered if he could get one to take back with him. The first soldier trained his weapon on them as he approached. State your purpose. I am Silva Gahajorn, a diplomat of the First Order. With me is my bodyguard and military intelligence specialist, Rakar Hojador. We wish to speak with Captain Maracus. The first soldier scrutinized them, glanced at the second soldier, then trained his gaze back on Silva and Rakar. Do you have any identification? We have identification badges in our side pockets, said Rakar. The first soldier gestured with his weapon for them to get them. Silva and Rakar got their badges out and held them at arm's length facing the soldiers. The second soldier pulled a device out from his belt and scanned the badges. They're good. The soldiers lowered their weapons. The first soldier sighed. It's good to see fresh faces. Captain Maracas will want to talk to you. Come on. He turned and waved for them to follow. Silva and Rakar followed the soldiers through the winding paths that the structures provided. Cregans in distress sat around outside the structures they passed. Some were sleeping or unconscious. As they approached the large central structure, Rakar noticed a large building behind it. It stuck out to him because it disrupted the circular architectural layout pattern typical of Cregan design. They came up on the entrance to the central structure. The first soldier waved at them to hold while the second soldier went inside. After a few moments, the second soldier peeked out the steel-like door and waved them in. The first soldier stepped to the side and gestured them in. Silva and Rakar followed the second soldier, with the first soldier walking behind them. They weaved through various hallways until they came to a large office. Inside sat Captain Maracus. He was large, by Cregan standards, and his dark purple skin had the splotches associated with the disease. His streamlined outfit was instantly recognizable to Rakar as that of a captain. Captain Maracus waved them in. Silva and Rakar walked into the office while the two soldiers docked themselves at the entrance, one inside the room, the other out. "'So you came all the way from Kriegis, I hear,' said Captain Maracus. He gestured for them to take a seat. "'This is Kriegis,' said Rakar. Captain Maracus eyed Rakar. "'What do you mean? No name has been assigned to this planet yet, other than the military's designation.' Be nice to reuse our home world's name, but the other colony ships might disagree. Silva cleared his throat and shot Rakar a sidelong glance. Yes, the military gave this planet a cryptic designation, but I suspect in time a better name will surface. Nonetheless, we are here on important business. He sat down. Captain Maracas stared at Silva for a moment, then eased back into his chair. So, what is this important business about? We are charged with collecting the Archeron crystals. We decided to come here first, said Silva. Captain Maracas smirked as he looked at Rakar. Military intelligence. I don't suppose you knew about this planet's condition before selecting it. Rakar paused as he looked at the table. He had not planned on this line of questioning but knew the disease originated in a pollen cloud that burst forth every five years. The analysis probe sent to analyze the planet for five years did not catch it. The probes noted nothing out of the ordinary. Captain Maracas eyed Rakar, then smiled. I read those same reports, too. Nothing on them indicated this. If you can get us the crystal, we can be on our way. We don't want to hold up your cure distribution efforts, said Silva, clearing his throat. Captain Maracas narrowed his eyes. What cure distribution efforts are you referring to? Rakar leaned forward. You don't have a cure? Captain Maracas leaned forward in his chair. Of course not. If I did, we wouldn't be getting splotches on our skin, coughing up blood, and lying around. Since you two are here now, you both are infected as well. I'm afraid I can't allow you to spread this to the other colony ships. 
Ricard and Silva looked at each other. Silva put his hand out toward Ricard, then faced Captain Maracas. If we were to find a cure that you could synthesize, would you allow us to leave with the Archeron crystal? Captain Maracas eased back into his chair and laced his hands. He ran his tongue around his mouth as he stared at Silva. After a moment, he cocked his head at Silva. How do you propose to do that, exactly? There was another planet that was researched that had an airborne virus. After it was studied, it was determined the effect on a Kriegen would be a slowdown of all internal systems. Until death. A cure was synthesized. Based on the scans from the analysis probes, there is a cave nearby that has an algae growing on the walls with a similar composition to that cure. With a bit of tweaking, it could be the base for a cure for this disease. Ricard half grinned. Silva was lying through his teeth, but did it without any hesitation. Silva must be adept at interrogations. Captain Maracas leaned forward and laced his hands while putting his elbows on the table. You get me that algae and help synthesize a cure? You can do whatever you want with that crystal. I don't necessarily believe the Archeron does what everyone says it does. Supposedly told us to prepare for an invasion, and you saw how well that went. Bunch of foolishness to me. Ricard studied Captain Maracas. Although there was a general belief in the Great Selector among all Kriegans, not everyone believed that the Archeron allowed for communication. He always believed it to be a tool used to control the masses. It was apparent Captain Maracas was of the same mind. We are in agreement, then. Ricard and I will head out immediately, said Silva. Captain Maracas pointed at the first soldier posted just inside the room's entrance. Durus, go with them to this cave. Their survival is of the utmost importance. I can't spare anyone else right now. Durus saluted. Yes, sir. Ricard extended his hand out. We'll be fine. We don't need an escort. Captain Maracas snorted. Perhaps. But this is also to make sure you don't jump the planet and take this infection elsewhere. That is acceptable. We are ready to go, said Silva. Captain Maracas eased back into his chair. Make sure to stop by the medical ward before heading out. Medical technician Zebros Gonude should have a container for your specimens. Good luck. Silva and Rakar exited the room with Darius in tow. They exited the structure and stood just outside the entrance. Do you have transportation? asked Silva. Just a small transport vehicle. All the heavy machinery is still packed on the colony ship, along with most of the passengers, said Darius. How many passengers? asked Rakar. Out of the two thousand, there are only a hundred of us out of our cryopods. Protocol is to establish an encampment, then slowly release the passengers in manageable chunks. This disease, however, has slowed the setup, and we can't release anyone until this is resolved. One way or another, said Dearus. I see. Where is this medical ward? asked Silva. Daros walked toward a large structure adjacent to the building they had just exited. Follow me. Silva and Ricard followed Diras over to the medical structure. Ricard noticed there were several benches outside with more Kriegans sitting on them. They seemed to be in various states of the disease. He noticed that most of them seemed to be middle-aged. From his studies, he could not recall age being a factor in how quickly the disease spread. Ricard turned his head toward Diras. Does age have an impact on how quickly the disease affects someone? Darius turned his head halfway while walking. Yeah, the younger you are, the slower the progression. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. You still die from it regardless of age. Ricard nodded. They arrived at the medical structure that loomed over most of the other buildings around it. In addition to its height, it stretched a ways back. Ricard figured most of the colony ship that had been dismantled probably went into this structure. They walked through the open door. Inside was a grid of makeshift cots, with various work tables and machinery in the center of the room. A Kriegan in a white outfit buzzed around. 
Dearus waved at the Cregan. Zebros! Zebros paused as he looked up at Dearus. He gestured for them to come to him. Dearus waved his hand forward. Come on. They walked over to Zebras, who was now sitting on a metal stool. Before him on his work table were various tablet-like devices and gadgetry. Dearus pointed toward Silva. This is Silva Gahajorn, a diplomat of the First Order. He then pointed toward Rakar. And this is Rakar Hojador, a military intelligence specialist. They have come from Kriegis and say they know of an algae nearby that can act as a base for a cure. From Kriegis, huh? I don't know what your business is here, but you're both infected now. So, what's this about uh, an algae? asked Zebros with a smirk. Silva nodded. We need a container to put it in, but you should be able to synthesize a cure from it. How do you know this, exactly? Military intelligence on this planet never mentioned anything about this. Or maybe they did know. I assure you there was nothing about this in the planet analysis. However, we ran across a similar effect on another planet. A counteragent was developed to eradicate that disease. It may not work on this one, but the symptoms are almost identical. So, just wild speculation? Do you have an alternative? Zebro sighed. No. We have lost seventeen so far. At this rate, everyone will be dead in a few months. I'm open to anything at this point. He walked over to a steel cabinet and opened it. A cylindrical container with a metal cap sat on the top row. He grabbed it and handed it to Silva. Take this. It has a light on top in case you need it. I hope you're right. Silva nodded. Ricard saluted with his arm across his chest, palm down. What's that? A military intelligence thing? asked Zebros. Ricard's eyes widened as he put his arm down. Yes, I uh, apologize for the confusion. We will be on our way. He had not thought about the standard Cregan salute not being known. Keeping future knowledge was more difficult than he realized. He figured this was probably what Everin had to deal with constantly as a time traveler. Silva and Rakar followed Dearus out of the medical structure. Dearus turned toward them. Wait here. I will get our transportation. It isn't much, but it can go across most terrain. He walked off into the distance. Silva looked down at the cylinder container. This is amazing. I can't believe we're here. How could they not have the cure already? He pulled out his tablet and pressed the communication button. Everin popped up on the screen. Everything okay? Apparently the cure has not been synthesized yet, or the algae procured. Then you must get it. I am relaying to you the coordinates of the cave along with the chemical makeup needed for the cure. Okay, said Silva, as Everin blinked off the screen. He studied the map and looked around, then looked at Rakar and shrugged. Rakar looked at the ground in contemplation. I think, he said, looking back up at Silva. We were always meant to be here. The Archeron crystal was meant to be taken by us, like Everin said. I didn't think we would also be getting the cure, though. Their attention focused on the vehicle that pulled up next to them. It had four wheels with a driver and passenger seat up front and a metal-like bed behind it that took up a majority of the vehicle's length. A mounted weapon sat on the bed. Duris was in the driver's seat and gestured for them to get in. Silva nodded at Ricard with knowing eyes and then took the passenger seat and Rakar climbed onto the bed and sat behind the mounted weapon. Duras turned his head to the side. Where to? Silva pointed off into the distance. Over there a bit. Should be no obstructions to the cave. Duras nodded as he shifted a lever. The vehicle whined as it moved forward, winding its way through the various structures. After a few minutes, they were on the edge of the encampment and moving over a blue grassland, Various creatures scattered as they moved across it. Rakar enjoyed seeing Kriegis in its natural state. 
He was not used to seeing large native grasslands. The grasslands had a much different smell than the scented grass on modern Kriegis. The creatures he observed in the distance were unfamiliar to him. On modern-day Kriegis, there was not much in terms of biodiversity. He also enjoyed the vehicle. Seeing wheels was very uncommon in modern-day Kriegis. The journey over the grasslands passed without incident for the next fifteen minutes. The vehicle came to a stop at the edge of a jungle. Silva narrowed his eyes as he looked ahead. Figures there would have been a jungle in the way. Duras shut off the vehicle, then turned toward Silva. Looks like we're walking. Rakar grabbed his weapon and jumped off the bed. Walking it is. Duras stepped out of the vehicle. He grabbed his weapon from a slot behind his seat and slung it over his shoulder. Should we be expecting trouble? Maybe. Rakar noticed the smell immediately. He had been to alien jungles before and had learned that if there was a strong scent among the background smells, then there was something out there. He surveyed the edge of the jungle, looking for any sign of movement. Kriegan history was well studied by all Kriegan rangers, he knew this era had vicious predators that would eventually be wiped out by the Kriegans as they expanded. His fear was that this was a jungle inhabited by the Vilipkors, large, flightless, carnivorous birds standing about seven feet tall that hunted in packs. He turned toward Silva and Duras. This is something's territory. We need to be careful. Silva... You may want to have your panic device easily accessible in case we need to emit an alarm. I'll take point. He moved into the jungle with Silva behind him and Duras behind Silva. They made steady progress toward the cave. The jungle was not as dense as Rakar had originally thought. He looked up and saw that the trees spread out across the top, forming a porous canopy. It would be easy to hide here, and easy for medium-sized predators to move around. As the cave came into view, Silva pointed to it. The willow caves are there, he rubbed his chin. The entrance is smaller than I remember. Duras faced Silva. You've seen it before? The probe analysis? Um, right, the probe analysis. We aren't too far now. They continued walking for a bit when Rakar raised his hand for them to stop. He turned his head slightly to the side. Duras, turn slowly around. Silva, get your emergency beacon ready to emit an alarm. A large Vilipcor emerged from behind a tree and stared at Rakar down its large beak. Rakar's eyes widened, and his heart raced. He did not even hear it coming up on them. There is another one behind us, said Duras. They're trying to distract us, said Rakar. Their hunting tactics were more advanced than he had originally thought. The Villip Corps tilted its head and then turned and ran away. Rakar faced Silva. Did you activate your panic device? Silva shook his head. No. Perhaps we have someone watching over us. The Great Selector, said Duras. Rakar half grinned. Or something more powerful. Duras shook his head. Well, I'll take it. Let's move. We're close, said Rakar. He eyed the trees around him and crept forward toward the cave, looking right and left as he went. They walked for a while until the cave was before them. Rakar crept up to the entrance and tilted his head. I don't hear anything. Light up. Silva nodded, then turned on the light of the container Zebros gave him. He moved ahead into the cave with Duras in tow. Rakar surveyed the surrounding area then ducked in after them. They walked ahead for a while with the light bouncing off the walls. A slime oozed from the walls and dripped onto the ground, making a pitter-patter sound echo out. Rakar wrinkled his nose. He could smell something decaying. A purple mat covering one of the walls caught his attention. He pointed to it. Is that what we're looking for? Silva scrutinized the mat and then nodded. That's it. The probes came into this cave and analyzed this. Captain Maracas never mentioned anything like that, said Duras. Silva's eyes widened. Um, yes. It was not put into the reports. However, there was a secondary analysis. Figures, said Duras. 
Silva pulled off the scraper attached to the side of the cylinder, then put the container against the wall and scraped some of the mat into the container. After a few minutes, he had scraped most of the mat off the wall. This should be enough. His lips drew down as a roar echoed out from the cave interior. Ricard shook his hand toward the cave's entrance. We need to move. Duras took off toward the entrance with Silva and Ricard in tow. After a few minutes, they reached the entrance. Ricard surveyed the surrounding environment again, then moved forward back onto the path they had taken to the cave. Silva followed him with Duras taking up the rear. Sounds of various creatures rang out from behind them. Ricard figured something must have spooked them. He wondered if it was the Torvado watching from above helping out. After ten minutes at a brisk pace, they reached their vehicle. They jumped into the vehicle and took off. On the way back across the blue grasslands, Duras pointed off to the side. A pack of canine-looking creatures was running along the side of the craft. Ricard noticed they were wild war dogs. He thought of one he had growing up. He had never seen a wild one. He half-smiled as he thought of the debate that raged on their origin in the scientific community. They were split down the middle on whether the war dogs were native to the planet or brought from ancient Kriegis, where a similar creature existed. He wished he could tell them, but knew that he could never tell anyone about what he saw here. They arrived back at the medical ward after fifteen minutes. They exited the vehicle and walked into the medical structure. Zebros was busy on the other side, giving water to a limp Gregan. He turned to face them as they rushed over to him. "'How'd it go?' asked Zebros. Silva handed Zebros the container. "'We have it. You should be able to synthesize the ooze this algae is producing into a serum.' He pulled out his tablet and navigated to the screen with the chemical listing that Everin had sent and then handed it to Zebros. "'You will need to add these chemicals to it.' Zebros eyed the container and then looked at the tablet. He sighed. I don't know about this, but we'll try it. We have these chemicals, but that is an unusual mixture. He walked over to a machine on the side of the room and pressed a button on it, causing a section with three container slots to slide out. The algae container was slotted, which then retracted back into the machine. He pressed a few buttons, and the machine went into action. A few moments later, another small section slid out with small vials hanging from it. He grabbed a vial and placed it into a small cylindrical container, creating a syringe. Silva, Rakar, and Diras followed Zebros over to several Kriegans lying on cots. Zebros turned to them. These men are close to death. I don't like the idea of experimenting on them with this. But I also understand it may be their only chance. Silva nodded. Understood. It will take about a day or so for the effects to appear. They won't die with it in their blood, though. Zebros drew his lips flat and then injected the men. We'll see. Rakar half grinned. We'll stay out of your way until this is verified. We'll be back tomorrow. Yes, yes, said Zebros, as he buzzed around the comatose Kriegans. Duras gestured toward the entrance. We have spare structures you two can stay in. They were built but are unoccupied. It's appreciated, said Rakar. He glanced at Silva and then followed Duras out of the medical structure. Duras pointed to a row of buildings. Pick anyone you want. Silva glanced at Rakar and then headed toward one of the structures. Ricard put his hand on Duras' shoulder. We appreciate the help. We'll see you in the morning. They spent the night in one of the small structures without incident. It had several rooms in it with functional power and temperature control. Ricard had seen these types of structures before, although they were much more advanced in his time. He liked it. It was functional and had enough room for a small group and, more importantly, would be easy and quick to build. In the morning, Silva and Rakar headed back to the medical building. Captain Maracas, Duras, and Zebros were talking with the Kriegans who had been injected the day before. The formerly comatose Kriegans were standing, smiling and stretching. Captain Maracas smiled and waved Silva and Rakar over. Silva shot Rakar a look and then headed over to them, with Rakar behind him. I think it's 
Working, said Zebros. Their blood shows a low account of the virus, and it's steadily declining. Silva nodded. They should then be immune to it once it is purged. Zebros ran his hand over his mouth. I'll get this distributed to the rest of the infected. I will need to make sure any new passengers are inoculated as well. Captain Maracas gestured toward the door. I've had my shot. Your help is greatly appreciated. And I owe you that crystal. Before you leave, make sure to check in and get your shots, said Zebros. Will do, said Rakar. Captain Maracas nodded. Silva and Rakar followed Captain Maracas back to his office. Captain Maracas grabbed a key from his desk and walked over to a steel cabinet. He unlocked it and pulled out the Archeron crystal, and then set it on his desk. Here it is. I think it's useless, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the Great Selector sent you to us. Silva tilted his head toward Captain Maracas, then picked up the crystal. For all our sake, let's just hope it does what it's supposed to. Captain Maracas laughed. Well... Good luck with that. Silva glanced at Rakar, then back at Captain Maracas. We will be on our way to the second colony ship after our shots. We appreciate your help in this matter. You know, this colony would have never survived if you two hadn't come along. But I guess the military in their own way wanted to make sure we were okay. We owe you a great debt. This will go in the historical records, said Captain Maracas. Rakar's eyes widened. You can put that you found it in a cave. The military would rather not have their involvement known. Or the First Order, for that matter, said Silva. If that's what you want, your secret is safe with me, said Captain Maracas. Silva extended his hand. It has truly been an honor to meet you. Captain Maracas jerked his head back as he shook Silva's hand. Rakar extended his hand, and a startled Captain Maracas shook it. The honor is mine. You are heroes to me. Silva bowed and exited the structure with Rakar. They went to the medical building and got their shots, knowing it would have no impact on them, then headed back to the Torvada. Dr. Snowden turned his head towards Silva, Rakar, and V as they entered the conference room. V had waited for them at the entrance to direct Silva and Rakar. You two were everywhere out there, said Dr. Snowden. Silva, Rakar, and V took their seats. Silva shook his head. It was... Uh, interesting. He handed the crystal to Everin. Here it is. Excellent. You both did well. I assume that was the Torvata that scared off those Villop cores, said Silva. It was. The Torvada sent a directed sonic beam at them. Just glad there were two. There were eight. Silva's eyes widened as he swallowed hard. Ricard licked his upper lip as he glanced at Emily, Andia, and Dr. Snowden across the table. The Villapcores were more efficient than I expected. Nonetheless, this colony wouldn't have survived if we hadn't interfered. The search for the lost Archeron crystals has set in motion a chain of events. We all have our parts to play, said Everin. Dr. Snowden scrutinized Everin. A causal time loop. A future event causing a past event. The future event being us looking for the lost Archeron crystals, which would be the cause, and the past event is us being here in the past and finding the cure— which is the effect, right? Everin nodded. In this instance, yes. What other instance would there be? Nothing is set in stone. The timeline is fluid, changing in order to keep its integrity intact. Andia shifted in her seat. But we're from the future, so we know what happens. This time travel event is a part of Cregan history. In this instance... That is correct. However, a rift could appear and change everything after we left or even during this time. Rifts do not obey the rules of space and time. They can come and go and are the main reason for timeline changes. Andia tilted her head. A rift? 
Dr. Snowden half grinned. A tunnel that can connect two points in space, time, and elsewhere. They are random in where they appear. Me and Emily got to see that firsthand. He glanced at Emily, who nodded. Andia turned her head toward Dr. Snowden. Okay, but we didn't see anything like that. If we had failed here, we would never have come here in the first place, because we wouldn't have existed. Dr. Snowden shrugged as he glanced at Everin. Yeah, I don't know. Andia jerked her head back as she turned her head toward Everin. So what would happen to us if a rift had appeared and stopped us getting the cure, or if one came after we left and changed everything? Would we just fade away? Everin shook his head. You have been in the Torvada, which means you would be immune to any timeline change for a short while. If you had never been in the Torvada, yes, you would simply not exist anymore. However, since you are immune for now, everything would have changed and you would have to adjust to any changes. For example, Kriegis could be the planet of another species, and Fredoria might not even exist. You could even possibly meet another version of yourself. Andia ran her hand over her mouth as she stared at the table for a moment, then looked at Everin. That's unsettling, to think nothing is guaranteed, not even our existence. Everyone stared at Everin as he narrowed his eyes. He clenched his jaw in a circle, then glanced at Andia. He drew his lips flat and ran his hands through his hair. You would be surprised at how often the timeline changes. He looked at Dr. Snowden and Emily. I try to undo rift impacts when I can. He gestured at Dr. Snowden. For example, the rift allowing the Crotovore to abduct you and Emily. Instead of you teaching class now, you are sitting on a ship on an alien planet. That rift did not exist in your history until it did. Silva, Rikar, and Andia stared at Dr. Snowden. Dr. Snowden swallowed hard. As much as I hate that rift, I'm glad to be where I am. Everin nodded. Silva leaned back into his chair and took a deep breath. I never imagined I would be a part of our history, even if we aren't mentioned. Was I born to save my people? I existed before I existed. It gives my existence a new perspective. Andia exhaled through her nose. Mine too. Everin nodded. We now have two of the three crystals. One more to go. Take a break and we can convene in two hours to discuss the third one. Chapter 10 After a quick nap, Dr. Snowden walked into the conference room while rubbing his eyes. He loved the fact that he could take a fulfilling nap, something that he always found difficult to do. Everin was at the head of the table, as always. To his left were Silva, Ricard, and V. Dr. Snowden went to the replicators and got a cup of coffee, then headed to his normal seat. He nodded at everyone as he took a sip of his coffee. Everin half-smiled. You seem to be well-rested. Yeah. Love napping on the Torvata, said Dr. Snowden as he surveyed the room. Where's Emily and Andia? Emily is showing Andia her running program. Apparently, Earth humans must endure physical activity to keep in shape, said Rakar. Dr. Snowden chuckled. Isn't that how Cregans do it, too? Silva shook his head. Not at all. We have a pill that can be taken once a month that keeps our body in shape. Although we have been genetically engineered for fitness, the pill gives us the benefits of physical exercise without actually doing it. So it's like an exercise pill or something. Not quite. It removes toxins and excessive fat deposits and provides continuous energy to the muscles. Well, dang. Where do I get some of that? Everin half grinned. You do not need it, Dr. Snowden. You have the ability within you to do it yourself. 
Dr. Snowden drew his lips down and glanced at Everin as he took another sip of his coffee. He cleared his throat. Right. Perhaps you can show me some time, then. I can do that. Emily and Andio walked into the conference room. They were freshly showered and had on clean clothes. Emily sat next to Dr. Snowden and Andio went to the replicators. Andia grabbed a purple-colored drink for Emily and a cup of an orange drink for herself, then took a seat next to Emily. So, on to the next one? asked Emily as she took a sip. Everin nodded. Yes, the last one is on the planet Gazes in Drajan territory. We have arrived already and are stealthed. While everyone rested, I took us to the past and back to verify where the colony ship landed, and we are over that spot now. Another infiltration mission? asked Rakar. Not this time. We will need to do this one in the present. Silva narrowed his eyes. Why? It would be much easier to get it in the past. Everin drew his lips flat while looking at the table. He then turned his head toward Silva. There were several Drajan ships in orbit. They were monitoring the colony ship. That seems like even more of a reason to go back. How do you know we were not meant to help them? asked Silva as he sat on the edge of his seat. Everin exhaled out his nose and tapped at the table console, which then shot a projection of a forest with large holes in it. He pointed at the projection. Does that look like Kriegus to you? Silva eyed the projection. He sat back in his chair and huffed. So if we do help them, we could alter the timeline drastically, is what you're saying. They were not meant to populate this planet, apparently. Correct. The Torvata scans show that it is down there now in that cavern system. It is possible they moved and left it behind. Not likely with Drajan ships in orbit. They would have exterminated them and blew the ship up. Typical Drajan, said Rakar, smirking. Andia tilted her head at Everin. Okay, so we are going to go into one of those holes? Yes, that is the current plan, said Everin. How would it survive after all these years? asked Andia. The Archeron crystals are very durable. They can survive for half a million years at a minimum. That place looks very uninviting, said Dr. Snowden. Everin nodded. This area appears to have a karst topography. We will need to find a sinkhole large enough for us to land in. Oh, what? Topography? asked Andia. Dr. Snowden gestured at Andia. It's a, a landscape formed out of soluble rock. Lot of sinkholes and caves. I see. Sounds like water would be needed for that, something Fedoria has very little of. Thank goodness for matter replicators. Everin touched the table console, and the projection shut off. He stood up and looked around the room. Okay. Time to find a landing spot. Everyone proceeded to the command center and took their usual spots. Dr. Snowden looked out the window and noticed the size of the landscape. It stretched farther than he could see and was pockmarked with cliffs, caves, sinkholes, and canyons. It looked like rivers carved tunnels right out of the landscape. He figured there was probably a large body of water somewhere in the distance. The front right screen showed the ground beneath them. The various holes on the surface were being highlighted red as they crossed over them, one of the holes outlined in green. Dr. Snowden tilted his head at Everin as a soft beeping sound chirped out. Looks like we found our entrance. I concur. Your suits and my ring will be able to show us the direction and distance we need to go. Should be pretty easy to get then? asked Dr. Snowden. Everin extended his hand. His ring shot up a holographic depiction of an arrow with some text off to the side that acted as a distance meter, showing two miles and increasing as they flew toward the green outlined hole. Possibly. There are no sinkholes for us to go through near it. There is an elaborate cavern system that connects all these sinkholes, so we should be able to navigate it. Dr. Snowden sighed. And I'm sure there aren't creatures down there wanting to eat us. Well, at least we have suits now to even it up, said Emily. The Torvada approached the green outline sinkhole. After a few moments, 
it reached the top of it and began its descent. Dr. Snowden noted the immediate change in the environment as they descended. He noticed there were smaller holes on the side of the wall with stones jutting out. They reminded him of footholes. Was there sentient life down here? He shuddered to think what might have evolved in an environment like this. The size of the holes would suggest whatever it was would be small, and the placement would mean they could either climb walls or fly. The Torvada landed on a damp, rocky floor. Small mechanical rods with luminescent orbs at the end extended out from the small black panels dotting the ship, illuminating the surrounding environment. The front right screen showed a view of their surroundings, but with wire textures and various text labels. Dr. Snowden scrutinized the front right screen. He saw that the air was breathable, the ground was damp, and there was life here, but nothing larger than a mouse. He saw Emily shiver a bit. She probably saw the insects that seemed to be flying around in the lights and showed up as little red dots swirling around the ship. Everin stood up and gestured toward the research lab. We will need some additional gear for this trip. Follow me. Silva stood up. I'm coming on this one. Dr. Snowden nodded at Silva, who nodded back. It was apparent Silva was beginning to loosen up around them. He figured that the last trip must have really changed Silva's perspective. Everin went to the research lab while the others went to get into their suits. They assembled in the main room of the research lab, where Everin was placing items into several slim metallic backpacks. After a few minutes, he zipped them up and handed them out to everyone. Dr. Snowden slipped the backpack on over his suit. This is pretty light. Your suits are helping that. There is food, water, and some additional gear we may need, said Everin. He gestured toward the research lab entrance. Everyone ready? They nodded and then followed Everin out of the research lab and exited the Torvada. Once they were outside the protective shielding of the Torvada, they paused. Everin pulled off two illumination orbs, activated them, and then tossed them into the air, but they paled in comparison to the Torvada's lighting. Dr. Snowden wrinkled his nose as the smell of stale air and something decaying wafted around. He saw a small hole on one of the sides with something scurrying into it. He squinted as the reflection off the walls from the Torvada's lighting stabbed his eyes. Looking around, he saw the Torvado was on a raised part of the floor. Everin had headed off toward a large tunnel. It appeared to be the only way out other than the way they came in. Dr. Snowden noticed everyone else had their helmets on, so he pressed the left button on his neck, causing his to shoot up. He interacted with the suit interface and navigated to the scan section. Activating the crystal scanner popped up an arrow and distance meter on his HUD. V flew over to Dr. Snowden. Dr. Snowden. Oh, yeah. Was just caught up in looking around. Acknowledged. Dr. Snowden remembered that V liked orb mode though he thought the body mode would have been more useful. He wondered if Everin made the decision or if V was given a choice to decide which mode to use or if it was decided on a case-by-case -case basis. He was hoping they would not run into anything. If they did, he knew Rakar had some heavy firepower. On top of that, they had the repulsing weapon on their suits. He wondered why the suits and the Torvada had no lethal weapons. They wound through several large, interconnecting tunnels for the next fifteen minutes and entered a large chamber with an opening at the top. The opening was too small for the Torvada to have come through. Everin raised his hand. Test your repulsing beam deployment. Rakar, please set your weapon on stun. Stun? asked Rakar. We do not want to kill if we do not need to. Andia tilted her head at Everin. Be hard with a repulsing beam unless it hit them into the air or something. Or if you placed it close to a vulnerable area, said Dr. Snowden. He recalled how easy it punched through the transformed creature's head back on the second colony ship. Everin nodded. If we can minimize that, it would be ideal. Rukar sighed as he interacted with the digital interface on his weapon. Dr. Snowden tested his repulsing weapon deployment, then retracted it back into the suit. Emily and Andia did the same. He noticed Silva looking at his wrist, so he went over and showed him how to do it. Silva waved his hand around with the repulsing weapon deployed. I like this. It's 
It's light. Dr. Snowden caught his arm mid-wave. Just make sure you don't point it at one of us, please. Silva nodded and then retracted his weapon. Got it. These suits are impressive. I like it. We have a similar suit on Kriegus, but it doesn't have a repulsing weapon on it and is a bit bulkier. They entered the large cavern, with the illumination orbs lighting it up, showcasing the ground floor. It was pockmarked with small holes covered with a mesh-like substance. V. Scout mode. Acknowledged. Scout mode engaged. V flew over the ground, scanning it while Everin scanned the immediate surrounding area with his ring. After a few moments, he pointed to the wall. Stay close to the wall. Emily tilted her head at Everin. What'd you find? Everin picked up a small rock and tossed it near one of the holes. Dr. Snowden jumped back as a rustling noise echoed out of the hole, and a tube-like creature shot up. A secondary tube filled with sharp teeth protruded out of the main body and grabbed the rock. It then retracted back into the body. The creature sank back into the hole and then rustled the mesh-like substance back into a cover. He was glad they didn't have those on Earth, as far as he knew. We should avoid those, said Everin. Emily gulped and deployed her repulsing weapon. She hugged the wall as they advanced along the side. They exited the chamber, and after thirty minutes of traversing the cave system, they paused in a small room that had several tunnels branching out. Everin extended his hand. A projection showed the arrow pointing ahead. Dr. Snowden scrutinized the arrow. He pointed to it while looking at Everin. Is it me, or is it glowing brighter? It is. Although there is a distance metric, I have adjusted it so that the luminosity increases as we approach the third crystal. Dr. Snowden nodded. So far there had been no issues. There was the occasional creature they startled, and they came across a smaller cavern with more of those tube creatures. He could see how easy it would be to get lost down here, and without any type of light, it'd be downright dangerous. Everin walked over to Dr. Snowden's backpack and pulled out several containers, which he passed out. Drink up. You should stay hydrated. They took a break and then headed deeper into the caverns. Several of the tunnels were descending. Dr. Snowden noticed as they went deeper, the temperature reading went up. He pulled up the suit interface and turned on the mapping feature. It spawned a mini-map with a red dot indicating their position. They were not too far from where they needed to go. After thirty minutes, they reached a medium-sized cavern that had a large hole in the middle. Everin walked over to the edge and scanned the ground with his ring. He waved for everyone to come over. Once everyone was assembled around him, he pointed at several burn marks in the ground. These are recent and formed by jump jets. It appears we are not alone down here. Emily peered over the edge of the hole. Quite a drop. Yes, it is, said Everin, as he walked over to her backpack. He pulled out two cylinders with flat circular ends that extended past the cylinder's circumference. He pulled them apart, which showed a small glowing ladder between them. He tossed one of the cylinders over the edge and put the other cylinder on the ground, which then buried itself, forming a natural anchor. He pointed down. Descend one at a time. I will head down first. He turned and jumped over the edge, with one of the illumination orbs following him. Andy aghast as she peeked over the edge. He's okay and waving at us. How is that possible? He's a lot stronger than he looks, said Emily, with a smile. Ricard glanced at Dr. Snowden and shook his head. He gestured at Andia and Emily. You two go first. Silva and Dr. Snowden can go next, and I'll go last. Well, aren't you a gentleman? said Emily, as she smiled at Ricard. She turned around and then crawled down the ladder. After a moment, she was over the edge. After ten minutes, they were assembled on the ground floor. We can leave the ladder for now and grab it on the way out, said Everin. Dr. Snowden scrutinized the ladder. He wondered what material it was made of, and if the glow was natural due to the material or something else. The rungs were solid as he descended, and he wagered that given it was Everin tech, it would probably be more durable than he imagined. They walked for several minutes through more tunnels. 
Dr. Snowden noticed these tunnels were wider and that the temperature shown on the HUD was decreasing. He thought it was odd, but it did not impact him since his temperature control was on. Everin paused in one of the tunnels and knelt by something on the ground. An illumination orb hovered over the lifeless body of a large, snake-like creature with two arms. It had an advanced-looking tech suit with various gadgets on it. A hole was visible on its chest when Everin turned it over. He scanned it with his ring. It appears this is a Drajan soldier of some type. Silva crowded around the corpse and jerked his head back. What are they doing here? Unknown. However, this wound was inflicted by an energy weapon of some type. I suspect they are not the only ones down here. I doubt they know about us coming. The only thing I know that would get a Drajan to land on a planet they are protecting is if someone violated their space. And we came in stealthed, said Silva. Yeah, I've read some of those reports. Drajan are tough, so there must be something tougher down here, said Rikar. Everin nodded. I agree, and firepower to back them up. It appears, based on the position of the body, that this Drajan soldier was hit in the back. It may have been trying to reach the hole we came down from. So, it was running from something, said Andia, with wide eyes. Rikar looked around. Wonder what could make a Drajan run away, said Rikar. I concur. We will need to be careful. Deploy your repulsing weapons, said Everin. He walked toward a side tunnel as everyone else readied their weapons. After walking for fifteen minutes, they came upon a large chamber. It had a waterfall on one side that fell through the floor. Small pools of water surrounded it on the edge. There were large, lightly glowing plant-like structures in the middle, and the sides were covered in vines. Everin gestured at V, who then flew out scanning. Ricard gestured at the waterfall. Easy access to water here. If there was anything dangerous around, it would probably stop by here. Everin scanned an area ahead of him and then pointed at several lumps of brown matter on the ground. I agree. And it seems they would defecate here as well. Watch your step. Dr. Snowden shook his head. Oh, great. They continued on into the chamber. After a few minutes, V returned. Inactive robot detected. Dr. Snowden looked ahead and saw a highlight on his HUD of something on the ground. He had become accustomed to the text that seemed to fly around objects, and the text for this was showing the metallic composition of a crumpled robot. Everin scanned it as he walked over with the others behind him. I suspect this is what the Drajan were either hunting or fighting. Rikar scrutinized the robot. It appears to have Kriegan tech on it, and something else. Exibian tech, said Silva, tilting his head. I have seen something similar before. Exibian? What would they be doing here? asked Andia. I don't know. Exibia is a border world between Kriegan and Drajan space, so it wouldn't be too hard for them to get here. They also are known to be on the outskirts of Kriegan law. It wouldn't surprise me if we are dealing with one of the many mercenary groups from there, said Silva. Everin nodded. We will find out. He gestured forward. Come. They traversed to almost the halfway point when periodic shouts rang out, which got closer every passing second. What was that? asked Andia as she looked around. I am unsure. Head back to the entrance, said Everin, pointing back. He gestured at V who took off toward the commotion. They hustled to the entrance and stood just inside it. After a few moments, a large green snake-like creature with a cobra mane approached them. It had on robes and seemed to be slithering as fast as it could. Everin weighed for the creature to come over. According to V's scan, it is a male Drajan. The Drajan headed toward them. Behind him was a pack of grayish-white tube-like creatures on six legs, their heads had an elongated snout with tentacles hanging off the sides. The snout ended with a circular mouth filled with razor-sharp teeth. Ricard raised his weapon. Okay, but what the hell is following him? Everin pointed to an area behind the Drajan. Ricard, fire a warning shot at those creatures. Ricard fired a shot above the creatures, causing them to pause momentarily. 
Everin raised his now-extended baton and shot a repulsing beam at the ground before the creatures. The creatures hesitated, then turned and ran toward a side tunnel. The Drajan had reached them and had his hands on his side. His eyes rapidly blinked horizontally as he tried to catch his breath. He looked up at Everin. Everin nodded and pulled out an orb. He tossed it in front of him, then interacted with his ARI. My name is Everin. I have tossed out a translation orb that will translate your language to Cregan and vice versa, so everyone can understand each other. The Drajan's eyes widened. Thank you. I wasn't expecting anyone else down here. Everin pointed at Andia. This is Andia Kiggs, Prime Ambassador of Fredoria. He then pointed at Silva. Silva Gahajorn is a Cregan inspector, and the other Cregan is Rakar Ho Jador, a Cregan ranger. He then pointed at Dr. Snowden. This is Dr. Albert Snowden, and to his right is his niece, Emily. Who are you? The Drajan hissed when Everin pointed to Silva and Rakar. I am Azizarus, a Drajan administrator of this region. I recognize the filthy Cregans, but have never seen your species before. Silva snorted. We are human from Fedoria and Earth, said Dr. Snowden, pointing at Andia and then Emily. Never heard of either said a Ciceris. He faced Everin. I am impressed by your translator device. I lost my communicator during the last fight. My group sent me back toward the ship with an escort, but I got lost, and he was taken down by those creatures. Emily cocked her head and pointed backward. We saw one of your group back there. I assume he was dead. We were tracking a vicious criminal known as Mutmut. I who was to only observe his capture. He is much tougher than we realized. Silva cocked his head and narrowed his eyes. Uh, Exibian. He is known to us. Yes. Somehow, well-armed and equipped Exibian mercenaries inside Cregan's space cross over to our space and wreak havoc. Are you implying we support them? Well, here we are, hunting down yet another Exidian, said Assisiris, narrowing his yellow eyes. Everin raised his hand. I think the focus is on what Mutmut is looking for. It is apparent his group is well armed. He turned toward Assisiris. Is all of your group dead? Assisiris hissed. I believe so. I don't even know where our ship is, and I have been on the run from one creature or another. May I book passage on your ship? We can do that. However, we must first retrieve something before we go. Assisiris shook his head. And what would that be? A crystal. If Mutmut is here, he probably knows we are coming for it. Otherwise, it would be odd for a mercenary to be out here. Not as odd as you might think. This would be a good hideout to conduct raiding from, said Assisiris. He eyed Everin. So you're responsible for him coming to this planet? Indirectly. We have had encounters with various bounty hunters and mercenaries over the last week. They know where we will be and when. Well, I'm coming with you then. Do you have any water or food? Everin nodded and gestured at Emily's backpack. This should be edible by your species. Andia went to Emily's backpack and pulled out a water container and a small metal container with square food pellets in it. She walked over and handed it to Assisiris, who bowed his head as he received it. Assisiris guzzled the water container, then opened the food container and devoured the pellets. He reared his head back and slowly blinked. Thank you again. I would tell you where to look for what you seek, but I'm unfamiliar with this cavern system. Everin raised a hand. It is okay. Just stick close to the group. Well, I never thought I would be traveling with a Drajan, said Silva, snorting. Azisaurus shook his head. Or me with Cregans.
a strange time. I'm sure it will get even more strange over time, said Rakar, with a chuckle. Everin extended his hand and projected the arrow pointer. It pointed in a direction that had a solid wall. He looked around the area, then pointed to a tunnel nearby. We can start from there. He waved his hand forward as he began walking toward the tunnel. Follow me. They walked through several tunnels and large chambers before arriving at a scene of carnage. Smaller, snake-like creatures with two arms and small wings on their backs were strewn out on the ground with holes in them. Blood was everywhere. A wooden defensive barrier hugged the walls a bit ahead of them, with the center blown out in an elliptical pattern. Dr. Snowden figured the structure was meant to be opened and closed like a gate, not that it would matter against an energy weapon. He noticed the creatures on the ground had on light armor, and primitive weaponry such as spears, swords, and shields lay around them. He pointed at one of the creatures and faced Isisurus. Friend of yours? Isisurus slid up to one of the bodies and scrutinized it. He shook his head. No, I don't know what they are. Everin scanned one of the bodies. They are sentient. This must be a guard post of some type. I suspect the carnage was done by Mutmut. Silva scrutinized one of the corpses. You think there is a civilization down here? The evidence speaks for itself. Ready your repulsing weapons, said Everin. He pulled his utility handle off and extended it into a staff, then walked through the destroyed post. They walked for a while down the tunnel until they came to a large chamber with a big stone fort in the middle. It had towers at each corner, with stakes sticking out at a forty-five-degree angle around the perimeter. The creatures they had shot at earlier were busy feasting on the carcasses strewn about the outside of it. The creatures took off after a car fired a few shots above them. Everin walked up to the perimeter and scanned the bodies and the structure. This race is not equipped to deal with someone like Mutmut. V. Scout mode. Acknowledged. Scout mode engaged, said V. He flew up over the fort wall and began scanning around the fort. After a few moments, V returned. Analysis. One life form detected. It is enclosed in a room. Location relayed. Everin looked at the group. We should investigate. He walked off to the arch doorway in the fort. Dr. Snowden interacted with his suit interface and could see V's analysis in the scan section. He selected it, and an image of the fort in a wire frame appeared. A red dot was highlighted in one of the towers. They followed Everin through the arch doorway into an open courtyard with ramps leading up the sides. They turned right and headed up a ramp and toward the nearest tower door. Everin knocked on the door. A scuffling sound could be heard from inside. Everin knocked again. We are not here to hurt you. He tilted his head as the scuffling sound faded, then took a step back and looked up. A creature similar to the ones at the guard post peeked its head over the edge. Its eyes widened when it saw a scissorous. It flew over the edge and landed in front of a scissorous and then splayed itself out. Everin accessed his ARI, causing the translation orb to float over to him. He then faced the creature. You should be able to understand our language now, and we can understand your language. The creature looked up and jerked its head back as it looked at Isisurus. We prayed, and you came. Isisurus narrowed his eyes. Prayed for what? The creature looked down. For you, our god. The two-legged demons attacked us, and we prayed for your help. Silva snickered. The Drajan are not gods. Everin knelt beside the creature. We are not here to harm you. We are looking for an item, but believe there is another group also looking for it. It appears they came through here. Can you help us? If our god wishes it, said the creature, looking up at a scissorous. I'm not a god. I'm flesh and blood, just like you, said a scissorous. The creature shook its head. You drove away the two-legged demons long ago. They have returned, as have you. It's referring to the colony ship, I think, said Silva, rubbing his chin. Isisurus's mane deflated a bit, then puffed back out. He glanced at Silva. We did destroy a Cregan ship here long ago. 
I knew it, said Silva. Everin extended a hand toward Silva. They must have ventured down here trying to seek refuge and clashed with them, said Andia, pointing at the creature. Isisurus turned toward the creature. I'm not a god. I'm just from another tribe, far away. We didn't even know you existed down here. Everin rubbed his chin. What do you call yourselves? We are Caesarian. My name is Cetacetus, commander of this fort. I assume another group similar to us came through here, asked Everin. Yes, a large, two-legged demon covered in hair with one eye on its head. It had three metal demons with it. They shot beams of colored light, destroying everything they touched, said Cetacetus. He pointed to a large tunnel off in the distance. That's where they went, to our city. We can't stop them. Rakar snorted. Perhaps it's time we introduce ourselves, then. Agreed, said Everin. He faced Cetacetus. Wait here. We will be back soon, hopefully with the situation resolved. Cetacetus looked at Azizarus. I have faith. With you on our side, I have no doubt. Silva shook his head. They exited the fort and headed to the large tunnel. I can't believe they think you are gods, said Silva, turning his head toward Isisurus. For once, I am in agreement with you, said Isisurus. After thirty minutes of walking past destroyed structures and corpses everywhere, they reached the entrance to a grand chamber. A large ramp descended from the entrance to a main pathway that led to a temple off in the distance. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened at the carnage he saw before him. Large, lightly glowing plant-like structures resembling trees dominated most of the landscape, with pea-shaped structures hanging off them. Some of the structures were smashed on the ground. Large chunks of the plants were blown out, and small fires raged everywhere. Smoke bellowed out from other domed structures on the ground. It was apparent Mutmut didn't go easy on the Zierians. Everin gestured at V, who flew off toward the wrecked city. How could anyone do this? asked Silva, shaking his head. Now you know why we hunt him. He has done worse among our more remote colonies, and continues to harass areas we don't have a strong presence in. Per our protocol, a response team is on its way to this planet. Given how remote this system is, they will be here in a few days, said Assisurus. I assure you, I will look into this when I get back, said Silva. Azizarus looked at Rakar. Do you believe that? I do, said Rakar, nodding. He glanced at Silva. One thing you can count on with Silva is if a law is being broken, he will investigate it. I hope so, said Azizarus. After fifteen minutes of waiting, V flew back. He projected a hologram of the city. There was a cluster of highlighted red dots in one of the buildings, with the rest of the red dots fleeing away from the building. Analysis. Three robots and a humanoid in the highlighted building. The other dots are Zazarian. Everin ran his hand across his mouth as he scrutinized the projection. He is waiting for us. The rest of you wait here. I will handle this. Dr. Snowden shook his head. Not a chance. We came as a group. We go as a group. Everin looked at Emily. I'm with Uncle Albert. You're not leaving us behind. Andia stepped forward. I think we are all in agreement that we do this together. Everin narrowed his eyes. Interesting. Off we go, then. Dr. Snowden's thoughts focused on Everin's reaction to the suggestion they go as a group. He knew Everin was observing something, but not saying. Could it be related to the issues he and Emily were having? He glanced at Emily and then sighed. Assuming this all got wrapped up, he was looking forward to figuring out what was going on with them. They walked down the large ramp and onto the main pathway. To their sides were pea-shaped pods crashed on the ground. 
Various household items were exposed. Charred corpses littered the ground. Dr. Snowden shook his head as he viewed the devastation up close. He could pick out the very small Zierians, and some that were slightly smaller than Cetacetus. He figured those must have been the females and the young. That would not bode well for Mutmut. They arrived at the building that was highlighted in the projection and then walked up the ramp. Upon arriving at the entrance, they saw that the doors were blown open. They advanced into the structure. In the middle of the structure at a circular table sat two Caesareans on waist-high pedestals, one in decorated animal shells, the other with a form-fitting robe with elaborate designs on it. Three humanoid robots stood around them with weapons pointed at the Zierians. To the side, sitting on a table with one leg on a pedestal and the other dangling off, was a male humanoid with strands of matted hair covering a majority of his face. He had on a lightly armored suit and held a large weapon in his lap. On his right forearm was a metallic band with a latch. A large eye protruded through the matted hair where two eyes would normally have been. He stood up. Welcome. I've been waiting for you. I'm Mutt Mutt. And those, he said, pointing to the robots, are my insurance that you won't try something stupid. Everin walked up a bit with the others in tow. I am Everin. I know who you are. Why do you think I'm here? You are here for me. And the plump old man and his niece... I read on the dark galactic net that you shook Creole Jewel. Not too surprising given he's a second-rate bounty hunter. I'm more impressed by what you did to Krakus debt. He's a heavy hitter. Even on my planet. Almost as good as me, said Mutmut. He raised a finger. Almost. Why did you harm the Zierians? Mutmut gestured at the two Zierians. Is that what you call them? I couldn't understand what they were saying. They shriek a lot, though. Ciro said that you were looking for a crystal of some type. He wouldn't say what it was, but it must have some value. I figured maybe I'd find it, but that is secondary. These pathetic creatures tried to stop me. Can you imagine such insolence? Everin licked his lips and ran his hand through his hair. You did not need to harm them. You're right. I didn't, said Mutmut. A grin crept onto his face. But I did. I see one of the Drajan escaped alive. I'll rectify that soon enough. He even brought two Kriegans. What a waste of flesh. Nonetheless, I've had time to think since you took your time. He pointed at Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia. Those three will come with me to my ship. The rest of you will stay here. Once those three are aboard, he said, pointing at Everin, my robot guards will escort you back. And if we refuse? Not a problem for me. Those robots are primed for explosion as a last measure. We can shoot it out, but I guarantee you there will be casualties. I suspect, though. You value these ridiculous creatures, even though you just met them. Dr. Snowden noticed V fade in behind Everin. V reached out with one of his robot tentacles, grabbed Everin's UIC, and then faded back out. What was V up to? Everin nodded. It appears you have planned this out well. He turned toward Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia. You should do as he says. Andia's face reddened. Excuse me? You should go to his ship. Who knows where it might be in this labyrinth, said Everin, as he looked at Dr. Snowden. Dr. Snowden nodded and put a hand on Andia's shoulder. It's okay. Andia shook her head. How's that okay? She looked at Emily. We've been in a rougher situation, said Emily, meeting Andia's gaze. Andia paused and then shook her head. Looks like there's no choice. You're right. There isn't. You three come over here with your hands behind your back, then face Everin. Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia walked over to Mutmut, then wheeled around. Mutmut placed high-tech handcuffs on Dr. Snowden, 
Emily and Andia. He waved at Everin, Rakar, Silva, and Isisiris. The rest of you, move over to that table with those things. He flipped open the cover on his forearm device. If you try anything, those robots will begin shooting. He tapped at a dimly lit interface on the device, then closed it up. One of the robots trained a weapon on Everin. They'll also let me know if you try anything. If you do, they start shooting, said Mutmut as he pushed his weapon into Andia's back. Then it's lights out for her. Hey, said Andia, shut your mouth. You're expendable. Andia shook her head. I don't like this. Everin gestured toward the table. We are going. Everin, Rakar, Silva, and Assisiris move next to the two Caesareans. Start walking, said Mutmut, as he jabbed Dr. Snowden in the back with his weapon. Dr. Snowden glanced at Everin as he began to walk toward the entrance. He was not sure what the plan was, but suspected it had something to do with V. Andia and Emily stayed close to his side. They exited the structure and walked up the main path to the ramp in silence. Dr. Snowden glanced at Andia and could see she was upset. He wanted to assure her it would be okay, but he was not sure it would be. He sighed as they walked up the ramp. At the top of the ramp, Andia broke the silence. So, you're a bounty hunter then? Mutmut laughed. No, I'm a mercenary. There's a difference. Seems like the end result is the same. Perhaps. But I do a lot more than hunt for scrubs. Plus, I am supplied with everything I need and given high information contracts. I don't scrounge around and hope for the best. That's for amateurs. Or the resourceful. I can see that is not your style. Mutmut kicked Andia in the back, causing her to fall forward and then to the ground. Watch your tongue for Dorian. Maybe that'll be the first thing I eat when we're off this wretched planet. Hey, said Emily. You want me to kick you in the back too? Said Mutmut as he pulled Andia up by her handcuffs. Less talk, more walk. He jabbed Andia in the back. Dr. Snowden gritted his teeth. He wanted to throttle Mutmut, but the handcuffs were on too tight to do anything. Mutmut really didn't like Andia for some reason. Or it could just be that she can be harmed while he and Emily could not. He thought back to when Mutmut used the forearm device to control the robots. If he could get his hand on it, maybe he could defuse the situation. He looked ahead and remembered coming down this path. It seemed to him that Everin wanted to know where Mutmut's ship was. Perhaps it was near the Torvada, based on the path they were taking. They walked for a while through various tunnels and chambers. They paused at the entrance to the chamber with the rock fort. Dr. Snowden surveyed the tower for Cetacetus, but did not see him. They walked around the fort and to a different tunnel than the one they had come in from before. It was sealed with a stone wall. Mutmut tilted his head. Stop! He rubbed his chin. Well, that's odd. He walked up to the wall and tapped it a few times, then stepped back. He walked around for a bit, then pointed to the tunnel that Everin and the others had come in from before. Doesn't matter. This should take us to where we need to go. After ten minutes of walking, they reached the ladder they had come down before. Mutmut pulled a device out and shot three times into the air. After a moment, three ropes fell down and dangled in front of them. He pointed to the ropes. Stand by the ropes. Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Andia lined up by the ropes. Mutmut walked behind them and tied the ropes around their waists, pulling them to ensure they were tight. He then opened his forearm device and pecked at its interface. A light blue glow formed around his boots. I'm going to pull you up once I'm at the top. So you know, those handcuffs can shock you unconscious. I wouldn't suggest anything rash. I really don't want to have to drag you. With that, he flew upward with a blue and red glow firing under his boots. Dr. Snowden glanced at Emily as they began to be pulled. Her lips were drawn flat, and her eyes were raging. He knew that look. It was evident by Andy's scowl what she thought of the situation. He looked up, but doubted Mutmut was pulling them all at the same time. The ropes must have some type of anchor that could reel them in. When they reached the top, 
Mutmut pulled each of them onto the ground. He then untied the ropes and pressed a button on the rope anchors, which pulled in the ropes and then retracted the spike holding them in the ground. He picked up the anchors and secured them on his belt, and then pointed to a tunnel on the far side of the cavern. Over there. They walked for another fifteen minutes and arrived at the entrance to the chamber with the hidden mesh pits. Dr. Snowden could hear the sound of something running behind them, as well as a buzzing sound. A Ziarian busted around the corner and flew past them. Mutmut fired at it, but missed. He screamed out in pain as one of the six-legged tube-like creatures chasing the Ziarian latched onto his leg. He turned to face it as Moore approached him. Dr. Snowden moved forward into the room a bit and whispered in a hurried tone, Let's go. Stick to the wall. Emily and Andia followed him along the wall until they reached the tunnel on the other side. A bright light beam engulfed them. Where do you think you're going? said Mutmut, walking toward them. I could just knock you all out, but everything is under control again. Those filthy creatures will think twice about attacking me again. They turned to face Mutmut. Andia whispered to Dr. Snowden. So what was the plan? You'll see. Wish these handcuffs were off. Would make things a lot easier. V appeared behind Dr. Snowden. Hold your hand straight out behind you. Everin can deactivate them from where he is if the UIC can connect to them. V, whispered Dr. Snowden. V placed Everin's UIC on Dr. Snowden's handcuffs, and after a moment, they fell to the ground. V flew over to Emily and Andia and released theirs. Dr. Snowden activated his repulsor and pointed it at Mutmut. Emily and Andia deployed theirs and did the same. Dr. Snowden tilted his head at Mutmut. One more step and you will be smeared against the wall. Mutmut laughed as he trained his weapon on them. The mesh-like substances near Mutmut began sliding back. One of the tubed creatures rose up and bore into Mutmut's leg, causing him to fall to the ground. He screamed out in surprise. Another creature emerged and engulfed his foot, inching its way up his leg with its inner mouth. Dr. Snowden pointed at Mutmut's arm with the forearm device. We need that device. Come on! They rushed over to Mutmut. The creatures now numbered four and were too busy biting and boring into a flailing Mutmut to focus on Dr. Snowden, Emily, or Andia. Andia grabbed the arm with the device as Mutmut was being dragged to one of the holes. She tugged at it. How do we get it off? A buzzing sound from above approached them. Andia looked up, then stepped back. Sita Sita swooped down. Hack! Andia fell down with Mutmut's severed forearm and hand. She screamed out in surprise in unison with Mutmut screaming out in pain. Mutmut was dragged until he was pulled down into one of the holes. His screams continued to echo out and periodically intensify as he got bit over and over. Several other creatures emerged from their holes and slithered toward them. A few repulsing blasts later, they skittered back to their holes. Dr. Snowden pointed to the tunnel leading back to the fort. Let's get to a safe spot. They hustled over to the tunnel entrance. Sita Cetus and V hovered near them. Dr. Snowden let out a quick breath. Sita Cetus, you came at the right time. He was the one who killed my brethren at the fort, said Sita Cetus, pointing to the hole Mutmut was dragged into. I shut off the tunnel to force him to come this route. The route he took initially didn't have rock worms. How is the city? Dr. Snowden licked his lips and looked down. Not so well. It's taken a lot of damage. Casualties? asked Sita Cetus. A lot, said Emily, with her lips drawn down. Sita Cetus blinked rapidly. I must head there immediately. He flew off toward the city. How could you understand what he was saying? There was no translation orb. It sounded like gibberish to me, said Andia. Dr. Snowden glanced at Emily, then back at Andia. Long story. Emily exhaled slowly from her nose. So what now? Per Everin, I need to put the UIC on the device, said V. Andia grimaced as she tossed the bloodied stump to the ground. Oh, I forgot I was even holding that thing. V placed the UIC on it, and after a few moments, it connected. He then flew up a bit and projected an image of Everin. Glad to see you are all okay. V relayed what was happening, 
said Everin. Emily half smiled. It got a little crazy. How's everything on your end? I have control of the robots now and have sent them back to their ship. They will fly off a safe distance from the planet, then detonate. Dr. Snowden nodded. Sounds like a good plan. I'm curious, though. What was the plan originally? The plan was to gain control of Mutmut's ship by V placing the UIC in a place it would not be detected. He would then fly to the Torvata, go into body mode, head back to Mutmut's ship, and then remove the device, with or without Mutmut's arm attached. Sounds elaborate, but I think it would have worked, said Andia. Yes, but with the help of Cetacetus and V, your plan worked as well. You adapted to the situation and improvised, said Everin, shaking his head with a half-grin. Well, I was just going to kick some rocks at Mutmut to get the worm's attention, but this works as well, said Dr. Snowden. Everin nodded. V will guide you three to the Torvada, and we should be back in an hour. What about the crystal? asked Emily. It is nearby. V will return once you are safe, and we will go from there. I suspect it won't take long. Sounds good. See you soon. Everin nodded as his image faded. They followed V as he flew off along the wall toward the Torvada. Rikar watched the robots drop their weapons and exit the structure. He moved closer to Everin as he bowed to the two Zierians at the table. My name is Everin. To my left. The two Zierians slid off their seats and bowed before Aziserus. Aziserus touched the lightly armored Zierian on the shoulder. Please, I am no god. I am just from a different tribe, far from here. My name is Aziserus. Who are you? The armored Zierian looked up. I am King Darasus. He pointed to the Zierian with the elaborate robes. She is my queen, Queen Zestus. We owe you a great debt. Aziserus shook a hand out in front of him while glancing at Everin. You owe me nothing. This was brought upon you by an unfortunate set of events. My tribe will help yours to rebuild. They will be here in a few days. We have knowledge and technology that will help. You can even live on the surface, if you wish. Rikar noticed Everin clenching his jaw. Something did not sit right with Everin. Darasus glanced at Zestus, then back at Aziserus. Any help would be appreciated. He bowed his head. Please, do not bow to me. We are equals here. As you wish, said Darasus. He looked nervously at Everin, Silva, and Rakar. They are friends. They help me, as they just helped you, said Aziserus. He pointed at Everin. That is Everin. He then pointed at Silva and then Rakar. And those two are Silva and Rakar. Durasus hovered and flew over to Everin and bowed. He repeated the same action with Silva and Rakar. We thought you were demons from our past, coming to avenge themselves. Everin nodded. It is okay. However, I do have a request. He extended his hand, palm up, as a projection of the crystal shot up from his ring. Have you seen this item before? The Zierians hovered back and put an arm over their eyes. After a moment, Durasus approached the projection and ran his hand through it. You possess the power of light? He hovered back. It is our god crystal. We have it embedded in the head of a statue in our temple. May we see it? Durasus nodded. Follow me. He took off toward the entrance, with Zistus and Everin in tow. Aziserus, Silva, and Rakar followed a bit behind them. Silva turned his head toward Aziserus as they walked. Giving tech and knowledge to a primitive species. Is that wise? What's the harm at this point? They've been exposed, asked Aziserus. Do you want my viewpoint? A Cregan viewpoint. Go ahead. I'm curious, said Aziserus as he narrowed his eyes. 
Freed from the restrictions imposed by influencing a native species, this planet will serve as a military outpost. Being as far away as it is, and bordering Cregan space, it can refuel ships and also serve as a launch board to respond to events in this sector. Yes, the Zierians will benefit, and maybe even dominate this planet, but firmly in debt and under Drajan rule. Azizarus looked at the ground for a few moments before speaking. That is one possibility, Silva smirked. You have a future in politics. Rikar scrutinized Azizarus as he listened. Azizarus was the Drajan equivalent of Silva, and he could see why they seemed able to talk with each other. If they had military roles, it would most likely be a different situation. It made sense to him that the scenario Silva described would come to pass. He wondered if that was why Everin was clenching his jaw. Regardless, all the slaughter and exposure to tech is not something the Zierians would just forget. It would shape their evolution. Finding out their gods are just flesh and blood would be devastating in its own right. He shook his head. They exited the structure and arrived at the temple, which was only a short distance away. Once everyone was assembled, Darasus led everyone inside. Zestus moved from corpse to corpse when they were inside, checking to see if any were alive. This is wrong. Darasus hovered over to her. Sound the meeting drums. Let everyone know I will be there shortly. Zestus nodded and flew out of the temple. Darasus sighed and continued forward, pausing occasionally to look at a dead body. Rikar struggled to comprehend what Darasus would have to go through. Darasus had the burden of an entire race on his shoulders. He wondered how they would react to this event. Darasus's leadership would be tested. Of that, he was sure. He looked around as they walked down the stone pillar-lined pathway to a large Drajan statue at the end. The temple was bare, with various waist-high pedestals scattered throughout, similar to the structure they were in with Mutmut. He figured they were a crude version of seats. They walked up to the statue. Darasus pointed to the head of the Drajan statue lying on the ground. The crystal was embedded vertically into the head of the statue. That's it. Everin walked over to the crystal and scanned it with his ring. He interacted with his ARI and then faced Darasus. This is the crystal we seek. I understand you place a high value on it, and I would be willing to trade for it. Darasus shook his head as he glanced at Azizarus. I suspect things will change for the better around here. We have no more use for the god crystal. You may have it as our thanks for helping us in our time of need. Everin bowed to Darasus, then pulled out his utility handle. He pressed a few buttons, causing the utility handle to extend into a prying tool. The crystal came out with relative ease and was placed in his belt container. He stood up and faced Azizarus. I assume you will stay here until your group arrives. Yes, I have a beacon but will meet them on the surface. Assuming the Zierians will guide me there. Darasus nodded. We will assist you in any way we can. Everin placed two fists together in front of him, touching at the knuckles and perpendicular to his chest, and then bowed at Azizarus. I wish you the best of luck. You show respect by your gesture, although I'm not sure how you knew it. I looked up Drajan protocols after we first met and am a quick study. Azizarus nodded and then faced Silva. Perhaps we are more alike than I thought. Silva replicated the same motions as Everin. My thoughts as well. Rikar figured it must be the Drajan version of a salute. He performed the same actions. They all bowed to Durasus and then exited the structure and headed toward the large ramp that led into the city. When they reached the ramp, Rikar turned his head toward Everin. You don't approve of the Drajans helping them, do you? Everin shook his head. I do not, but what is done is done. If it was a small token of help, maybe. 
but giving advanced technology and knowledge to a species that is not ready for it will speed them up to a filter very quickly. Filter, said Silva, eyeing Everin. One of many. Every civilization will come to a point where they adapt to changing technology and learn to live with it, or they destroy themselves with it. The ones who adapt typically go on to become star-spanning civilizations. Those who do not have their ruins researched by star-spanning civilizations. I agree that the Zierians are not ready, said Silva. Being a border world and near Exibia, relatively, how do you think an advanced Zierian race will interact with the Exibians now that they have associated them with this event? Silva rubbed his chin and narrowed his eyes. Under Drajan rule, that could potentially be explosive. I don't think the Zierians will forget this event. I concur, said Everin. Rakar thought of the Kriegans' rise to power. They had adapted every step of the way. Technology became a part of their culture and was widely regarded as essential to their way of life. But they had time to ease into it. The Zierians would be given advanced technology and would have to adapt. He understood Everin's concern. They reached the top of the ramp and headed toward the Torvada. Chapter 11 Dr. Snowden sat on the edge of his bed and rubbed his eyes. When Everin, Silva, and Rakar had returned, they had an impromptu meeting in the conference room over the recent Zierian situation. He did not like what happened to the Zierians, and his stomach churned at what they had to go through. They had no defense against Mutmut, and their peaceful city was ruined. He understood that the Drajan would now help them, but sensed that it did not sit well with Everin. He sighed and headed to take a shower. After Dr. Snowden was cleaned up, he headed to the conference room. He noticed they were in space when he looked up through the glass-like ceiling. When he walked in, he saw Rakar, Silva, Everin, and V in their usual spots. His eyes were drawn to Silva, who had a plate with green mush on it. He had never seen Silva partake in eating at these morning meetings. Maybe the recent experience made Silva more comfortable around the others. He nodded at Silva, and then went to get his usual coffee and breakfast. As he sat down with his breakfast, he glanced at Everin. Emily and Andia working out again? Ricard laughed and then smiled at Dr. Snowden. I'm sure they're working up a sweat. Dr. Snowden smirked. Running isn't all it's cracked up to be. Trust me. He finished his breakfast just as Emily and Andia entered the room. They were cleaned up and had big smiles. Andia took her seat while Emily grabbed drinks. She sat down, handed a drink to Andia, and then smiled at Everin. So, what I miss? Everin nodded. Nothing. I was waiting for everyone to come in. He raised a finger. There are a few things I need to discuss. Dr. Snowden tilted his head as he pushed his plate back. He knew when Everin raised a finger, attention was warranted. To this point, we have had mercenaries and bounty hunters show up wherever we go. I do not believe that is coincidental. Creel Jewel and Krikus Det were bounty hunters and worked directly with Ciros. I know that from the information obtained from Creel Jewel's data device and Krikus Det's ship. GJ-45, Delkis and his gang, and Mutmut and his crew were mercenaries that were contracted out. I know who contracted them, although with Mutmut he had offers from both the contractor and Ciros. He took Ciros's offer. The information these mercenaries and bounty hunters were receiving came from one source. He turned his head toward Silva and gestured at him. Your reports. Silva jerked his head back. Those reports are secured and only viewable by Senator Cross. Everin nodded. I agree that your report data was secure while it was sent, but when that data was stored on Senator Cross's end, it was accessed by others or given away. I suspect Ciro's had access to it at some level. However, 
The contractor's identity was confirmed by a visual recording of an exchange between Mutmut and the contractor. Although Mutmut took the contract initially, he ended up taking Cyrus's offer. I was able to get the first contractor's visual negotiation by initiating a ship-to-ship transfer of information using the device from Mutmut. He interacted with the table console and gestured at the projection that shot up. Here it is. The projection showed two screens. On one side was a rough-looking Cregan behind a desk, and the other was Mutmut in a darkened room. The rough Cregan's lips were pulled flat, and he stared intently at the screen. He pressed a button. Orata here. Have you considered my contract proposal? Yeah, I have. I see the three you want are also wanted by Ciro's. I ain't messing with that shit, said Mutmut. You don't have to. Deliver them to me, and I will handle that aspect. Considering how much that bounty is worth, and who I am going up against, I want fifty percent. Half up front, half delivered when you pick them up from Exibia. You want fifty percent? I can't do that. Look, you're a young bounty hunter. I'm a Grand Master in the Shylock Mercenary Group. I know you're operating as a go-between. Tell Senator Cross 50% with half up front, the other half at collection, or no deal. Tell her the fees have changed. Senator Cross, what are you talking about? Oh, I see. In that case, good luck, said Mutmut. He reached forward. Wait, said Arata. He sighed. Damn it. Ask her. Now. Orata glanced to the side, then back at the screen. She agrees. She also wants to know why you won't deliver to Kriegus. And have her wipe me out after delivery? Tisk, tisk, I don't think so. I have associates that have worked with her in the past. I know how she works. She provides cover for criminal activity and disposes of anything that might cause an investigation. Besides, I'm kill on sight on Kriegus. Maybe that was the plan after all, <laughs> said Mutmut, laughing. Look, said Arata, glancing off screen then back. You can make the pickup arrangements since you don't trust her. Now we're talking. Once the first half has been transferred, I'll be on my way. Fine. Any questions? Mutmut smiled. I do have a few, actually. How'd you get a hold of all this information? It's the most detailed contract I've ever seen. There is an inspector traveling with them. He sends reports and is unaware of their purpose. He is a bit simple, but would not send anything if he knew what the reports would be used for. Mutmut chuckled. Ha <laughs> ha, simpleton. Got it. I noticed there is also a Fredorian ambassador and a Cregan ranger. What do you want done with the inside person in those two? Orata sneered at the screen. I should have guessed. I'll take care of it. The projection shut off. Silva's eyes widened and his lips parted. He turned toward Everin. Senator Cross, she's corrupt. It would appear so. I suspect she thought she had a good chance at getting that bounty given her position. However, I think her motive was a bit bigger. She wanted to wait until you reported back that all three crystals had been obtained. Then she would collect them through another contract. She would then present the Acheron to the Emperor. The ploy to get Emily, I suspect, was to have a hostage in case she needed one. Andia jerked her head back. She was going to undercut Fedoria? That is my conclusion. Andia laced her fingers as she put her elbows on the table. Unbelievable. I sent the report on the third crystal to her this morning, said Silva. Yes, you did. However, it was not delivered. I masked it so it appeared it sent until I was sure. The report updating has served its purpose and we know who we are dealing with now. 
We should have some time for our next step without interference, and I do not think we should be giving Drajan information on gazes to the Kriegans. This has not been without consequence, of which the Zierians are a casualty. Looking back, I should have prevented this. I made a mistake. Silva drooped his head and looked at the table. You did what you had to do, and yeah, sending that last report would just stir up trouble. He pulled his lips in and through gritted teeth said, She used me. Ricard put a hand on Silva's shoulder. She used both of us, brother. Apparently I was a troublemaker and was sent on this trip to be eliminated. Silva shook his head and jabbed his finger on the table. This is outrageous. She will answer for this when we get back to Kriegus. Rikar nodded. I'm with you. Everin placed the three crystals on the table and then interacted with the table console. A projection shot up showing a galactic map. The projection zoomed into an area on one of the spiral arms. It then zoomed into a solar system and a planet highlighted with a red dot on it. It zoomed into the red dot showing a facility with the word Petraz listed next to it. The ancient Cregan homeworld. This is our next stop. The Cregans have a facility there built around the Archeron base. V, take us there, said Everin. Acknowledged, said V, as he stood and then exited the room. We should be able to go in and slot the three crystals, then activate the Archeron. I do not know what will happen at that point but we will find out. How will we get in the facility? It's probably protected, said Rakar. Everin gestured at Silva. Silva should have clearance. Silva nodded at Everin. Not a problem. It's hard to believe I will get to see the Archeron activated. It seemed so simple. Get the three crystals and slot them in the base. But it has been anything but simple. This could not have been undertaken without you and your ship's abilities. When this is over, you will be recognized for your efforts. Everin shook his head. It is best not to mention me in any capacity, or Dr. Snowden and Emily, for that matter. This should go down as a Fedorian mission with official Cregan support. A projection shot up from the table, showing a facility nestled in forest from above. A small square image of V appeared on the bottom right. We are above Petraz, said V. Silva, if you go to the command center, you can communicate with the facility. They will ask for identification before we can land, said Everin. Silva stood up. I'm on it. He exited the conference room. V, land us when we are cleared, said Everin. Acknowledged. The projection shut off. Everin stood up. I do not think we will need our suits here. However, I leave that for each of you to decide. Prepare yourself accordingly. He nodded and then walked to the conference room exit. After ten minutes, the Torvada had landed on a circular landing pad. A walkway ran between it and the facility. Everyone assembled outside the Torvada. Dr. Snowden noted that no one had worn suits other than Rakar in his regular Cregan suit. He figured since it was a Cregan facility, there would be appropriate security, and they might have issues with the suit. Mercenaries and bounty hunters would not be flocking to cause trouble there, he thought. He saw that Andia and Silva had sidearms, and Rakar had his usual weapon. V was in orb mode and hovering above. Everin gestured to V. V, stay with the ship in case we need it. I am not expecting trouble, but it does not hurt to be cautious. We should not be long. Acknowledged, said V, as he flew into the Torvada. Dr. Snowden walked alongside Silva as they proceeded toward the looming facility. Exciting moment. Silva's eyes sparkled. It is. I judged your kind unfairly. It isn't lost on me that this is being done by humans, a race we once enslaved. You have acted nobly, while it appears we are not immune to corruption as I once thought. It will sort itself out. Just think, no matter what happens, you are a part of Cregan history. Not once, but twice.
That I was, said Silva, with a half grin. Everin stopped and tilted his head. He then raised his hand at a ninety-degree angle. Dr. Snowden's heartbeat ramped up as he looked around. He did not see or hear anything out of the ordinary, but he could see Everin was sensing something. The look on Everin's face was not one of surprise, but one of concern. Everin accessed his ARI. I have instructed V to put the Torvata in stealth mode and keep it hovered over this spot. Andia faced Everin. Is there something we should be worried about? Everin drew his lips flat and shook his head. It is probably nothing. Dr. Snowden knew now that something was amiss. Everin would not speculate on it openly, but it was obvious that Everin heard or felt something. He knew from experience that Everin could sense things that he and Emily could not, even with the nanobots. After a few minutes of walking, they stood outside a rectangular door. A laser swept out from a device above the door. A red dot above it was lit, with a faded green dot to its right. After the laser scanned the group, the red dot faded, and the green dot lit up. The door made a whooshing sound as it slid up. A Cregan approached them. He wore a military outfit consisting of blue light armor with a forearm device. Behind him stood two Cregan guards in full green and silver battle armor, similar to Rakar's, but heavier. The Cregan in light armor stepped forward. I'm Administrator Jaws Turufulg, civilian attachment for this facility. I'm curious as to what business a Cregan inspector and ranger with humans could possibly have. Silva stepped forward and gestured at Andia. This is Andia Kiggs, Prime Ambassador of Fredoria. Rakar and I are providing official Cregan support for her mission, which involves access to the Archeron base. I see. What is your intent with it? asked Jastu. You're not authorized to know that. Jastu shook his head. Maybe not. But you know, allowing non Gregans near the base is considered blasphemous in some circles. Blasphemous or not, this is an official mission, and these non Gregans have proven themselves to be more than worthy as citizens of the Cregan Star Empire. Are you having difficulties with this? Or do I need to open an investigation? Jastu smirked and then wheeled around. Follow me. He walked ahead with the Cregan guards following him. Dr. Snowden noticed that Silva had to browbeat Jastu into compliance. He guessed if he had to administer a facility that probably wasn't visited much, he would be cranky too. Everin gestured for everyone to enter through the door. After everyone was in, the door slid shut. They hustled up to Jastu, who had begun walking ahead of them. The hallway they were in was fairly long. On the sides were various rooms. Dr. Snowden could see that there was a mess hall of some sort and several rooms with closed doors and tags on them. He figured those were the living quarters. He caught up to Jastu. Do you get a lot of visitors here? Jastu and the guards chuckled. Not quite. We get the occasional way of the great selector member. The military up the road also sends scientists to study a stone object said to have been from the mass exodus era. Stone object, asked Rakar. It is ahead, and we will pass by it. It is shielded and contained in a separate room, said Jastu. Everin narrowed his eyes. If it is from the mass exodus era, it should be destroyed if it is what I think it is. I agree, but the military doesn't. That doesn't surprise me, said Rakar. Oh, before I forget, there is the possibility there may be additional visitors, but they are hostile. We have run into mercenaries and bounty hunters everywhere we go, said Silva. Tough ones, too, said Rakar. Jastu smirked. They'd be foolish to try anything here. There is a military base not too far away. He raised his thumb and gestured backward between the two heavily armored Cregans. Besides, I have two Cregan commandos. I doubt they could deal with that. You also have a Cregan ranger with you. Fair enough. Just thought I would mention it, said Silva. They reached the end of the hallway, which ended in a T-junction. Ahead of them lay a massive door. Jastu gestured at the door. 
The stone object is in there. This is actually one large square room, with the room ahead occupying a majority of it. These hallways to the left and right are just the gap between that room and the overall room. I see. May we see the stone object? asked Everin. We can see it through the windows on the side of the room. Follow me, said Jostu, as he took the left hallway. After a minute of walking, they turned the corner to the right. About halfway down the hallway, they came upon a large glass-like window in the wall to the right. Jostu gestured at the window. Stone object is in there. Inside sat an obelisk-like stone structure, with a slight red mist engulfing it. A semi-transparent shield encased it. Around the shielded object was an array of slabs, each tilted inward at a forty-five-degree angle. Lining the walls was a series of workstations that jutted out, and various tables lay between the slabs and the wall. Ricard jerked his head back and widened his eyes. Malazim! Jostu extended his neck and peered at Rakar. Come again? That's the Malazim. It's what they call themselves. I've never heard it called that before. Where did you hear that? Up close and personal. Jostu eyed Rakar for a moment, then nodded. Yes, well, just sits there now, harmless while shielded. Aren't you worried what might happen if that shield goes down? asked Emily. Jostu smirked. For starters, it wouldn't get out of the room. If it did, the commandos would handle it. If they failed, the military handles it. Worst case scenario, the military destroys the facility. That sounds like it would handle it, said Dr. Snowden, glancing at Jostu. Jostu nodded and continued past the window and to the next corner. After another minute of walking, they came to a T-junction similar to the one they had used to enter the overall room. Jostu gestured at the door. And this is the door from the other side. He turned and walked down the hallway leading away from the door. They wound through several more hallways until they reached a larger-than-average-sized door. Jostu gestured at the door. The Acheron base is in there. He interacted with a console, and the door slid open. Silva nodded. We will take it from here and appreciate your hospitality. Jostu jerked his head back. You're saying I can't be here? Yes, it's classified. All monitoring for this room while we are in there is to be shut down. Jostu sighed. Figures. For the record, your visit here has been logged, even if I don't know what you are intending to do exactly. Noted, said Silva as he gestured for the others to enter the room. After they walked inside, Silva faced Jostu, then interacted with the door console, causing the door to close. Dr. Snowden looked around the room. It was large, with containers stacked in the corners. There were workstations near the front of the room, and the walls consisted of metallic panels. Up top, rows of luminescent rods spanning the width of the space provided light, in the middle of the room was a raised circular platform with guardrails. He saw the Archeron base sitting on a waist-high pedestal in the middle of the platform. Everin walked over to the Archeron base with everyone following him. Once there, he pulled out the three crystals from the tray container on his belt and slotted them into the Archeron. The Archeron pulsed a line of light on each side from the bottom to the top. Once it hit the top, a steady line appeared at the bottom. So what now? asked Andia. Everin narrowed his eyes and tilted his head, then raised a finger. Wait for it. Another line of light appeared on each side above the previous one. It is activating. It appears it will take some time, said Everin. They watched it fill up to about thirty percent when the overhead lights dimmed and a red ribbon strip appeared across the top of the sides. Within a moment, the lights returned to full luminosity and the red ribbon strip disappeared. Dr. Snowden sighed. That can't be good. That was an emergency warning. Something's going on. I should investigate, said Rakar. Everin extended his hand toward Rakar. We should wait until the Acheron is fully activated. We do not know what caused the emergency warning, or if it is even valid. Jostu seemed to have a grasp on what to do in case of an emergency. Rigar nodded. Okay. However, I think we should ready our weapons. A wise precaution. Dr. Snowden and Emily, 
Ready your stun beams, said Everin as he faced the door. He tilted his head. There is another presence in the facility. Dr. Snowden shook his head. Not again. Ciro stood on the deck in the command center of his ship with his hands behind his back. Yildaris turned to face Ciro's. This cloaking system is amazing. Why isn't it being mass-produced? The matter required to generate it is difficult to procure, and that's with my company's extensive ability for resource procurement, said Ciro's. He gestured at one of the screens. Did you find any traces with the modified scanners? Yildaris nodded. We did at one of the landing pads, but there is nothing there now. I see. Go ahead and land. I will secure our entry. I thought we were going to storm it. There is no need. As a Ciro's Industries executive, I won't arouse as much suspicion as five heavily armed Covendron mercenaries would. Bear in mind, there is a military base nearby. I would rather not have to deal with that. The ship descended and landed on the landing pad. Ciro's exited the ship and approached the facility. When he reached the outer door, a laser scanned him, and then a screen flickered on near the door. He walked over to it. Jostu appeared on the screen. We didn't see your ship approach. It is cloaked. There are no cloaking mechanisms that can avoid detection, says Jostu. It is a prototype commissioned by your empire. I am here to see Cregan Inspector Silva. Jastu looked down and then back up. Visual profile says you're Ciro's of Ciro's Industries. Ciro's nodded. That's correct. Jastu smirked. Well, they're in the Archeron base room now. They didn't want to be disturbed. Perhaps I can wait inside until they come out. That's fine. You actually have a higher authorization than Silva. Impressive, said Jastu. Number one supplier of technology to your empire will do that, said Ciro's. Jastu nodded and looked down, and the screen flickered off. After a few moments, the door slid up. Jastu approached Ciro's with the two Kriegan commandos in tow. With all this activity, I've alerted a nearby patrol. They're out in the field and should be here in about two hours or so. This will only take five seconds. What? said Jastu, as he went flying toward the wall from Ciro's left arm swing. Ciro's lurched forward and grabbed a commando's head and squeezed it until the helmet cracked and blood oozed out. The commando fell to the floor. The other commando backed up and unloaded point-blank on Ciro's, but the energy beams were absorbed by Ciro's's shield. Ciro's ran forward and grabbed the commando's head and then twisted it. The commando crumpled. Ciro's tapped at a button on his wrist device. You can come now. He watched the Covendron mercenaries disembark from the ship and begin to head over. He turned his head toward Jostu, who was fumbling with the device on his belt. The interior lights dimmed, and a red ribbon strip appeared near the ceiling. Ciro's rushed over and grabbed the device from Jostu's trembling hands. He looked it over and pressed one of the buttons. The lights came back to full power, and the red ribbon strip disappeared. Jastu trembled as he looked up at Ciro's. His eyes dulled, and his head swung from side to side. Why? Nothing will stand in the way of my vengeance. Jastu shuddered, then stopped moving. Ciro studied Jastu. He did not want to kill him, but unfortunately for him, he was in the way. After a few minutes, Yoldaris approached with four heavily armed mercenaries. He looked at Jostu and the commandos on the ground, then at Ciro's. That was fast. Yes. However, there is a patrol headed here in a few hours. I should be done before then. Get your men into position inside and secure the entrance. Yildaris jerked his head back. 
We're not going with you? Cyrus's eyes flared. I want their deaths to be by my hand and my hand alone. He took a deep breath. However, if anyone except me comes back, kill them. If I need help, I will summon you, but I do not believe it will be needed. As a reminder, the remaining owed on your contract will be released to you once I am safely off this planet. Yildaris nodded. As you wish. He turned away and began barking orders at the other mercenaries. Ciros headed into the facility. He passed the room with the Malazim obelisk. He had encountered them during the Cregan mass exodus. He was there to gather resources from the planet while it was in chaos. The transformed were no match for him back then, with his unique armor and powered suit, and the obelisks were crushed easily. He smirked as he remembered the Cregans feebly trying to defend themselves. They had prepared for the wrong invasion. As Ciros approached the door to the Archeron, images of his wife, his kids, and his culture flashed in his mind. He gritted his teeth. Everin would know the true extent of his rage. His blood boiled as he stood before the door, doing a last-minute check on his armor and devices. He rolled his head around, then kicked the door in. Dr. Snowden's heartbeat jumped as the door to the room crashed open. He swallowed hard as he imagined the strength needed to kick in the door. Rikar and Andia pulled their weapons while Emily tapped at her PSD. Dr. Snowden looked at the Archeron. It was still moving slowly. Why the heck was it taking so long? Everin snapped his head toward the door. Ciros. Ciros wore a suit made of several layers. The base layer was a red fibrous mesh. The layer above it was composed of a black light armor with silver lines connecting them. The third layer contained thick red armored pads with a ribbed texture that pulsed a soft red light. They covered the chest, thighs, upper and lower arms, shoulders, and the upper part of his boots. His pale white skin and silver hair stood out in contrast to his armor. "'What is the meaning of this?' said Silva. "'Silence, Cregan dog,' said Ciros, pointing at Silva. Everin put a hand out toward Silva with his palm down while facing Ciros. "'It is me you are after. Let them go without harm.' Ciros smirked. "'No. They are guilty by association.' and will suffer the same fate as you. Such is the danger of being around you. Besides, I have Covendron mercenaries at the entrance. If anyone except me goes up there, they will be killed. You can't take us all, said Rakar. I can, and will. However, this is the end of a long journey, I have a few words to say, and you will listen. I have been tracking Everin for over ten thousand years now, said Ciros. Everin glanced at the Archeron, then back at Ciros. Continue. Dr. Snowden's eyes popped. How could he live that long? He would have to be some type of cyborg. Maybe Ciros had nanobots. He shook his head. Ciro's gestured toward Everin. He probably has not told you why I hunt him. Guilt will do that. I was a family man and an awkward engineer, but the best at what I did. My race developed temporal shielding, and one day, while working on a ship outfitted with it, there was a shimmer. When I stepped outside the ship... My race was gone. My planet, a desert wasteland. Dr. Snowden looked at the Archeron. It was about 75%. It took me a while to piece together what happened. Another race called the Udol had outposts on my world. They were no match for my technology. I learned they had committed genocide on my people. I removed all of them from my planet. 
I then visited their home world and their colonies, and through the use of biotech, removed them from there as well. A genocide for a genocide. Dr. Snowden shuddered at the thought of Ciro's wiping out a race. What if he had done that to Earth? Ciro's raised a finger. What surprised me was that when looking through their historical records, I found a point in their history where they shouldn't have survived. But they did. You see... We knew of their homeworld before the timeline change, but there were only ruins there. I found out that the Hoxis, a vicious and aggressive species, should have wiped them out. Everin brokered a treaty with them somehow, changing the timeline, and they left the planet alone. The Udal advanced as a civilization until they spanned the stars— and then wiped my planet out. No doubt because we are driven as a people, and we won't back down from a fight. Dr. Snowden figured saving a planet would be something Everin would do. It appeared in doing so. There were consequences that Everin may not have foreseen, or did Everin know and still interfere. It took me a while to track Everin down to this region of the galaxy, to build an industrial empire and place sensors as far and wide as I could. I did run into Everin several times, but each time he was out of my reach. Not this time, said Ciros. He pointed at Everin. Your bumbling around and changing timelines made me lose my wife, my children, and my people. His voice rose. I will avenge them by removing you, here and now. He clenched his teeth. I got you this time. There is no escape. Silva walked towards Zeros. Everin grabbed his arm, but Silva shook it away. I have to say something, said Silva, as he turned his head to face Everin. Zeros took a deep breath and gestured at Silva. I'm morbidly curious. Go on, then. Silva faced Zeros. This is a Fredorian mission, with official Kriegan support. You are a well-known industrialist within the Kriegan Empire. You have an issue with Everin. This is known. However, if you continue down the path you have chosen... There will be ramifications. Everin had walked up to Silva and stood beside him. Ciros chuckled. <laughs> ramifications. By interfering with an official mission, your company could be penalized, and you could also face an investigation. Ciros put his hand on his chin and nodded. I see. He lunged forward and grabbed Silva by the neck with his right hand, then lifted him off the ground. Ciros's eyes flared and his voice rose. You compare your pathetic rules and regulations against what Everin has done to me? Everin reached out and grabbed Ciros's wrist. Ciros took a small step back, then lurched forward and, with his left arm, knocked Everin across the room. I'm tired of Cregan's. He flicked his right wrist. Snap! He tossed Silva's lifeless corpse to the ground. No! shouted Rakar as he rushed towards Ciros, unloading his weapon as he went. Andia had opened fire with her sidearm, and Dr. Snowden and Emily fired their stun beams. The energy blasts and stun beams highlighted Ciros's armor, but were absorbed by a semi-transparent shield made of hexagonal cells. Your weapons are useless! <laughs> Who do you think gave the Kriegans their technology? said Ciros, laughing. Rakar tossed his weapon to the ground and charged shoulder first into Ciros. He bounced off Ciros and fell to the ground. Ciros stepped forward and delivered a kick, sending Rakar sliding toward the containers. Rakar's head hit the edge of one of the containers, and he stopped moving. 
Rikar, shouted Dr. Snowden. Ciro's eyed Andia. You're next, Fridorian. Dr. Snowden had begun to head over to Rikar, but went back to the platform. Ciro's rushed over to Andia and grabbed her hand with the sidearm still in it. He squeezed. Crunch! Andia screamed out in pain and dropped to her knees. Emily and Dr. Snowden grabbed onto Ciro's hand to try to free his grip. Leave her alone! shouted Emily. Everin had returned and extended his utility handle into a staff. As Ciro's reached for Dr. Snowden with his left arm, Everin struck Ciro's wrist, causing him to release Andia's hand. He then hit him across the chest. Ciro's staggered back. Everin turned to Dr. Snowden. Check on Rakar, then bring him to the platform. He then turned to Emily and pointed to Silva. Get him to the platform. He placed his UIC on the platform console. Emily nodded and went after Silva, while Dr. Snowden went after Rakar. When Dr. Snowden reached Rakar, he put two fingers on Rakar's neck. He felt a pulse, but Rakar was unconscious. He grabbed Rakar's arms and began pulling him back to the platform. He saw Emily had begun to pull Silva back to the platform as well. Ciro shook his head and smiled as he pulled his weapon from his back. He fired a red beam at Everin, who blocked it with his shield. You've upgraded your shield. He tossed the weapon to the ground. Doesn't matter. He charged Everin. Everin sidestepped Ciro's and swept his legs out from underneath him. Everin then took a step back and stumbled while squinting hard. Ciro's jumped up and grabbed Everin's staff, pulling it out of Everin's hand, then used it to hit Everin away like a bat hitting a baseball. He held up the staff to his chest and placed both hands slightly apart on the middle of it, then bent it. The staff buckled and the ends dissipated. Ciro's tossed the now bent utility handle to the side. My weapon is useless, and now... So is yours. Everin grabbed three orbs off his belt and tossed them at Ciro's. The orbs stuck to Ciro's shield, then emitted a white cloud. Ciro's waved his hand through the white mist while laughing. You try to bind me. After a moment, Ciro's eyes widened as he fell to his knees. His pulsating red armor pads had faded out. What's this? Your palace and energy armor is now neutralized said Everin, as he ran up and kicked Ciro's, sending him skidding off into one of the containers. He walked over to the platform, which now had an unconscious Rakar and a dead Silva lying on it. He tapped at his ARI. I am going to shield the platform. Dr. Snowden swallowed hard with wide eyes and a shaky voice. What can we do to help? Just stay inside. A shield shot up from the base of the platform to the ceiling. Ciro smirked. You think that will protect them? I do, said Everin. Ciro stood up with his big armor pads on the ground around him, his black interlaced suit with silver lines pulsed. He pointed at Everin. You seem to be a bit stronger since the last time we met. He rushed over to Everin. Everin engaged him in a round of kicks and punches. He went flying past the shielded platform and into one of the containers, he shook his head and looked at Dr. Snowden, then stood up and rushed forward to meet Ciro's. He attempted a leg sweep, but Ciro's moved out of the way and kicked Everin's leg. Everin fell to the ground, but not before grabbing Ciro's leg and making him fall. They both jumped back and did several rounds of kicks and punches. Everin was able to avoid most of the hits Ciro's was dealing by simply moving out of the way, but when Ciro's connected, Everin went flying. After another few rounds, Everin waist-tackled Ciro's, who staggered back. In response, Ciro's hit Everin in the back, causing Everin to fall to the ground. Ciro's flipped Everin and straddled him, landing a big blow on Everin's face. Everin was trying to block the blows, but began to react slower and was unable to prevent the pummeling that followed. "'We have to do something,' said Andia, holding her crushed hand close to her chest. "'What can we do?' asked Emily, grimacing." Dr. Snowden pulled out his PSD and looked at it. He opened up the weapon screen and selected the stun beam. He looked at Andia and Emily. We're going to stun him. Emily shook her head. That didn't work. Dr. Snowden shook his head. No. Look. He held up the PSD and showed her a vertical line under a small circle on the stun beam PSD interface. 
That line is a charged line. We can do a one-shot. I think if we both fire at the same time with that, it might do something. Are you sure? asked Emily. I think so. I've never looked at the screen before, but I just know what it is, said Dr. Snowden. Emily nodded, then interacted with her PSD. She looked up. I'm ready. Dr. Snowden looked out at Everin and Ciro's. Everin had managed to kick Ciro's away, but Everin was not standing up, and Ciro's was coming back. He knew if he did not do something now, it was over. He pressed the shield release option on the platform console, causing the shield to go down. Emily moved to his side, and in unison, they raised their PSDs and pointed them at Ciro's. Ciro's! shouted Dr. Snowden. Ciro's turned his head toward Dr. Snowden and Emily. Ah, you wish to shoot me with those ineffective beams again. You shouldn't have lowered the shield. He glanced at Everin, who was struggling to get up. I think we know how this will end. He rushed over to them. Dr. Snowden and Emily fired their PSDs, and a larger-than-normal blue stun beam shot out from both of them. The beam had traces of red lines and green orbs floating in it. The PSDs fizzled out as the beams connected with Zeros. He flew backward into the wall. Zero shook his head and chuckled. <laughs> That's it? He stood up and began walking over to them. He clenched his teeth. This ends now. Tired of hearing about the great Dr. Snowden and his heroic niece, Emily. He reached them and extended his arm to grab Emily by the neck. Dr. Snowden's face turned red and his eyes bulged. No, he said in a guttural voice. He knocked away Ciro's arm mid-reach, then punched him, sending a startled Ciro staggering backward. Dr. Snowden rushed over and bowled Ciro's over, then kicked him in the stomach. Ciro's doubled over in pain. Dr. Snowden flipped Ciro's over and straddled him like Ciro's had done to Everin and began pummeling him. Ciro's tried to fend off Dr. Snowden's flurry of punches, but after a few minutes, he stopped trying. He felt a hand on his shoulder. Dr. Snowden, said Everin, standing with the support of Emily. Dr. Snowden stopped hitting Ciro's, and his breathing went ragged. His eyes flared as he clenched his jaw. Ciro's lay on the ground, blood oozing from his face. Dr. Snowden took several deep breaths, ending in a long one. He was not sure what happened, but Ciro seemed to have lost his strength after the stun blast. He looked over at Everin. Are you okay? Everin half smiled. I am, thanks to my bodyguards. He gestured at Ciro's. You shorted out his power suit which he not only relied upon for strength, but basic regulation of his internal systems. Impossible by normal weapons, but the PSD is not normal. I did not know the one shot would be effective. How did you know it would work? Emily shook her head. We didn't. But Uncle Albert seemed to understand that it might somehow. It popped in my head, said Dr. Snowden. I see said Everin. He looked at Ciro's. He is mostly machine at this point, and no match in his current state against a rage-fueled human with his family at stake. The nanobots might have helped, too. He tilted his head and then pointed at a device on Ciro's forearm. Dr. Snowden, please get that device off his forearm. Dr. Snowden walked over to Ciro's and knelt beside him, it took him a bit to get the forearm device off, and although Ciro struggled to prevent him, it was a half-hearted effort. He returned to Everin with the device and handed it to him. Everin walked over to the platform with Dr. Snowden and Emily in tow. He grabbed his UIC and placed it on the device. He then scrutinized his ARI. Ciro's had rolled over and rested on his arm. He began to laugh as he coughed up blood. You... <laughs> Won't make it past the Coventry mercenaries. Everin narrowed his eyes. Many have died in your quest for me. I cannot allow this to continue. He glanced at Dr. Snowden and Emily as he placed his UIC back on his belt. 
Wait here. He walked over to Ciros and grabbed him by the wrists. Ciros cried out in pain as he was dragged from the room. After five minutes, Everin returned. He pointed at Silva. Dr. Snowden, please pick him up. He walked over to Ricard and slung him over his shoulder, and then gestured with his free arm at Emily. Emily, please get the Archeron. Emily nodded and walked over to the now brightly lit Archeron and picked it up. Got it. Follow me, said Everin, as he walked toward the room entrance. They exited the room and reached the T-junction. They took a right and reached the window. As they passed it, Dr. Snowden looked in. He saw Ciro screaming as he lay strapped to one of the tilted slabs. The shield around the Molazim obelisk was gone, and a red mist was surrounding Ciro's. Dr. Snowden swallowed hard, as he knew Ciro's would be transformed. Otherwise, Everin would not have put him in there. Would the fact that Ciro's was part machine affect the Malazim? He figured Everin would let the military know, and they would bomb the facility from what Jostu had mentioned earlier. They reached the initial T-junction. They paused as Everin laid Rakar down and then placed his UIC on one of the consoles on the wall. He tossed an orb into the air, which situated itself over the center of the hallway door. He touched his ARI, causing a door in front of them to slide down, effectively sealing them off from the rest of the T-junction. "'What's the plan?' said Andia, grimacing. "'Time to call his friends,' said Everin, taking the UIC from the wall console and placing it on Ciro's forearm device. He swiped his hand across his ARI, then extended his left arm palm up. A projection shot out from his ring, showing the other side of the door. After a few moments, the Covendron mercenaries appeared and went right. Everin placed his UIC on the wall console again, and a door slid down on the other side of the T-junction, but not before Yildaris slid underneath it. He sighed. Almost. He tapped at his ARI, and the door in front of them began to slide up. When it was halfway up, he activated his left arm shield. Once the door was up completely, Everin rushed Yildaris, who had pivoted and fired. He grabbed the mercenary's gun, then kicked him against the door. The mercenary crumpled against the door. Stay down. Yildaris slid up the wall and rushed Everin. Everin sidestepped Yildaris and then stepped behind him. He grabbed Yildaris's shoulders and kicked out his legs, causing Yildaris to fall. Stay down. Yildaris gulped. What do you want? For you to stay right where you are. I will not be as generous next round should you stand up, said Everin. He gestured for Dr. Snowden to exit the T-junction into the main hallway leading to the front door. He then tilted his head to the side. Emily, please hand me my UIC and then drag Ricard to where Dr. Snowden is. Dr. Snowden walked behind Everin and into the main hallway. Emily grabbed Everin's UIC and handed it to him. She then grabbed Ricard's arms and dragged him to where Dr. Snowden was. Andia followed Emily. Everin stepped back into the main hallway and placed his UIC on the wall console. He narrowed his eyes at Yoldaris. So you know, I am letting you and your mercenaries live. Enough life has been lost today. What did you do to Ciro's? He is no longer a threat to my friends, nor will you and your friends be. Do not make me regret my decision. Yoldaris nodded with his lips drawn flat. Not a problem. This is just a contract. Nothing more, nothing less. Good. After we leave, I suggest you get as far away from here as you can, unless you want to feel firsthand the impact of the military bombing this facility, said Everin. With his free arm, Everin swiped his hand across his ARI. The door in front of them slid down. Once it was closed, he slung Ricard over his shoulder and nodded his head forward. Let us leave this place. Chapter 12 They walked in silence toward the main front door. Once they arrived, Everin laid Ricard down and placed his UIC on the door console. The door slid up, 
and V was waiting outside with the Torvada behind him. Everin gestured at Rakar. V, take Rakar to the medical lab. Acknowledged, said V. He walked over and picked up Rakar, then headed to the Torvada. Everin grabbed his UIC and walked outside, replacing it on the outer door console. He gestured for Dr. Snowden, Andia, and Emily to come out. Head to the medical lab. I will be there shortly. I need to open the doors in the facility and alert the Kriegans that containment has been lost here. We do not want to be here when the bombing occurs. Once they were out and walking up the ramp to the Torvada, Everin interacted with his ARI. He then boarded the Torvada. They assembled in the medical lab. Everin walked over to the sidewall near a set of rectangular panels. Each panel had a console in the center of it. He accessed the console on the one nearest to the room's entrance, then stepped out of the way as it slid out, revealing a capsule large enough to hold a humanoid form. He gestured for Dr. Snowden to place Silva in it. Dr. Snowden carried Silva over and gently laid him down in the capsule. His eyes misted. Damn. Everin touched the console on the front, and the capsule slid back into the wall. He then pointed at an adjacent slab to the one V had laid Rakar on. Andia, please lie down on that slab. Andia nodded and headed over to the slab, with Emily in tow. With Emily's help, she was able to get onto the slab and lie down. Everin walked over to Rakar's slab and accessed a side panel console that hung off it. A beam shot down from the ceiling for a moment, then faded out. Several three-dimensional holographic models of Rakar appeared above him, one stacked upon the other, with the lowest having the most amount of detail. Each model showed Rakar with his various biological systems. Everin studied the models, then attached several tubes to Rakar's arm. He then pointed to a machine at the other side of the room. V walked over to it and, after a few moments, returned with a nanobot syringe. He handed it to Everin. Everin injected Rakar in the neck and then glanced at Dr. Snowden. He had some internal bleeding and has a concussion. It should be repaired within a few hours. He then walked over to Andia and pulled up the same holographic models. Touching the crushed hand on the lowest model caused it to zoom in. After a moment of scrutinizing it, he faced Andia. You will need reconstruction. He waved off to one of the smaller rooms. V. Get the reconstruction glove. Acknowledged, said V, as he took off in the direction Everin had indicated. Dr. Snowden walked over to Andia's slab. He wiped a tear off his face and then smiled at Andia. Everything will be all right. Andia smiled back, then gritted her teeth and squinted hard. I hope so. This pain is killing me. V returned, carrying an oversized metallic glove. In his other hand was a syringe. He walked up and placed both items on a tray at the front of the slab. Everin nodded at V, then tilted his head at Andia. I am going to inject you with nanobots that will neutralize your pain sensations. Andia nodded and winced as Everin used the syringe on her neck. After a few moments, she exhaled slowly from her mouth. Oh, that is so much better. Everin grabbed the mitt from the slab and placed Andia's hand inside it. He pressed a button on it, and a holographic image shot up showing various options. Selecting the seal option caused the mitt to shrink, creating a form-fitting glove on Andia's hand. After a moment, the projection showed sealed. You will not be able to move your hand until the reconstruction is complete. Once the reconstruction is complete, the cover will fall off by itself. The cover will ensure your hand is rigid at all times. Andia raised her left arm and rotated her hand with the mitt. Once these nanobots are gone, will I feel pain? The nanobots will suppress all pain signals from your hand. Once reconstruction is complete, they will leave your body by merging into the mitt, where they will stop functioning. Emily chuckled. Sort of like a fire-and-forget cast. Yes, said Everin. So what now? asked Dr. Snowden. You should all get some rest. We can reconvene in the morning. V, take us to Kriegis. Acknowledged. At nine the next morning, Dr. Snowden awoke to his PSD chirping. 
He rubbed his eyes and thought about the previous day. A lump formed in his throat as he thought of Silva. His death was senseless, and Dr. Snowden had finally begun to bond with him. Although Silva was rough initially, he had shown himself to be a team player. He gritted his teeth as he thought of Ciro's. How much death had he caused? Ciro's had called him great and Emily heroic, and then mentioned meeting Everin in the past. Maybe it was related to that. He shook his head and went to take a shower. After Dr. Snowden was cleaned up, he headed to the conference room. He glanced at Silva's empty seat and drew his lips flat. He saw that Andia and Emily had taken their seats along with Everin, Ricard, and V. He saw the Archeron sitting on the table next to Everin. Sleep well? asked Ricard. Yeah, bit of a rough day yesterday. You look much better. This has been a rough mission, and we have lost Silva. But we made it. Dr. Snowden got a cup of coffee and took his seat. Everin nodded at Dr. Snowden. I have updated Ricard on the situation, and we are currently at the Fedorian Embassy now. Andia, what is our next step here? I need to get another senator, but that shouldn't be a problem with the Archeron in our possession. I will need the information on Senator Cross, and I need to update the Cregan authorities on Silva, said Andia, with her lips drawn down. She tilted her head toward Ricard and sighed. I will need your assistance to verify the events. Not a problem, said Rikar, as he clenched his teeth. I look forward to Senator Cross finally facing justice. Everin slid a small device toward Andia. Everything you need is there. It is formatted in a medium your system can understand. Andia picked up the device. Once everything is set up, we will head to the Emperor's palace. The Archeron can stay here until then. She gestured at Everin, Dr. Snowden, Emily, and V. I would request all of your presence when we meet the Emperor. You got it, said Dr. Snowden, with wide eyes. He had just wanted to see Kriegis, but to get to meet the Emperor was not something he had expected would happen. Everin stood up. Then we have a plan. Let us know when you are ready. Andia tilted her head at the doorway while looking at Rakar. Ready when you are. Mind if I come? asked Emily. Andia nodded. I would prefer that. I'll be in the planner cartography lab if anyone needs me, said Dr. Snowden. Six hours later, Dr. Snowden felt a presence in the planner cartography lab. He had been deep into looking at the nearest solar systems to Earth's. He tapped the console, causing the holographic display to fade, and the room lit up. He looked over to the entrance and saw Emily. I hate to disrupt playtime, but we're at the palace now and ready to meet the Emperor. Dr. Snowden chuckled. There is so much here. How'd everything go? He walked over to her and gave her a hug. Pretty good. We got the clearance to meet with the Emperor, and Senator Cross is being heavily investigated now. Silva was popular among the inspectors. What about Ciro's? Ciro's company has been ordered to Kriegis for an explanation of their possible involvement. Dr. Snowden shook his head as he exited the room with Emily. That guy was nuts. They joined up with Everin, V in body mode, Ricard and Andia at the Torvada ramp. Andia carried the Archeron, which had a royal Fedorian cloth over it. She wore a red and white royal Fedorian robe with elegant gold embroidery. Ricard had on silver and green ceremonial armor and a black cape with a gold border. Andia exited the ramp, with everyone else following her. They were met by black and gold armor-clad guards, with horsehair-like helmets and high-tech weaponry on display. Dr. Snowden had imagined a palace being low-tech, but this high-tech wonder was packed with technology everywhere. The palace was a torus-shaped building in the middle of a circular patch of land, with various pathways slicing up the land into various sections. A large partial dome covered the top of it, they had landed in one of the sections in a dedicated landing area ringed with turrets. The walkway leading up to the palace had various small guard towers lined up along the side. Andia looked at Dr. Snowden. It's my first time here, too. It's rare for anyone to be here. Dr. Snowden gulped. It's, uh, impressive. It's one of the most famous landmarks throughout the Empire. 
to be where we are is a great honor, said Rakar. I can see why, said Emily, looking around. They approached the palace. Dr. Snowden scrutinized the building. The tube-like outer walls were black with a gold pattern that danced along it. The sound of buzzing drones flying around caught his attention. The stairway had holographic statues at equidistant intervals. As they walked up the stairs leading to the inner circle, he noticed the two large robotic guards at the entrance. Rikar tapped Dr. Snowden's arm. Kriegen juggernauts, the elite heavy infantry of the Kriegen military. If they get involved in anything, something's getting hurt. They entered a long hallway that took them several minutes to traverse. They exited into a large circular room divided into two halves. The first half they entered was split up into three sections. Each section was lowered and accessible by a ramp. A walkway separated the sections. The second half was one large section with a visible grid on the floor. Centered along the back of the wall was a raised platform. A Kriegen in elaborate garb sat on a large throne, flanked by two Kriegen juggernauts. Various other Kriegens stood around the platform with blue and gold robes, holding intricately designed staffs. The guards led them to the center of the room and gestured for them to stop. One of the Kriegens in a blue and gold robe pointed a staff at the ground near them, causing a pathway to light up to the raised platform. They then pointed at one of the grid cells on the right side, causing that section of the floor to rise. A holographic projection of an elderly Kriegen appeared in a white robe. The Kriegen that had pointed the staff at the ground raised it in the air. A male and female Kriegen dressed in white and gold robes stepped forward. A flute-like sound echoed out into the chamber. Dr. Snowden looked behind him at the pits and noticed the Kriegens had stopped doing what they were doing and had faced the Emperor. He turned his gaze back upon the white and gold robe duo. A hypnotic drumbeat started up quietly in the background. The female began to sing, with the male beginning a short moment after her. Ricard tapped Dr. Snowden's arm. The Emperor's Hymn from Ancient Grigus. Dr. Snowden rubbed the goosebumps on his arms as the hymn caressed his ears. He took in the view as he looked around the room. It was hard for him to comprehend that he was in the room with probably the most powerful person in this section of the galaxy. Aliens were all around him, and he was witnessing a civilization that was far older than Earth's. This was more than he had expected to see on their first visit out. Emily grinned at Dr. Snowden as she reached over and gently squeezed his right arm. Dr. Snowden smiled as he turned his head toward Emily. He knew these opportunities were once in a lifetime, and having Emily around made it even better. He wondered what Dan would have thought about all this. The guards walked forward while gesturing for them to follow. They approached the raised platform and stopped about ten feet from it. One of the blue and gold robed Kriegans stepped forward. I am Hootis Tuwood, first advocate of the Emperor. This audience for Emperor Darius Tarivan is sponsored by Senator Banis Jugitka of the 114th Sector. Do you still wish to sponsor this audience? I do, said Senator Gitka. The purpose of this audience is the delivery of the Archeron. The court recognizes the bearer of the Archeron as Andia Kiggs, Prime Ambassador of Fedoria. Accompanying her are Ranger Rakar Hojidor, Dr. Albert Snowden, Emily Snowden, Everin and V. Andia Kiggs, please approach. Andia walked forward and then kneeled, head bowed. She removed the cloth over the Archeron and offered it up. Emperor Reven walked off the platform and placed his hands on both sides of the Archeron, then raised it to chest level. He closed his eyes and exhaled sharply. I can hear them. He took a deep breath and opened his eyes. Rise, Andia Giggs. I would speak with you. Andia stood up. You have done a great deed for the Kriegen Star Empire today. It will not go unrewarded. I have read your requests and will grant them. Thank you, my Emperor. 
Emperor Reven gestured at Rakar. Step forward, Ranger. I would speak with you. Rakar stepped forward and saluted with his arm across his chest, palm down. You represented our people well. Andia Kings has requested you implement a ranger unit on Fredoria. Under Kriegen protocol, this would make you a master ranger. Do you accept? Rikar jerked his head back and looked at Andia, who nodded at him. He then bowed his head at Emperor Reven. I do, my Emperor. It is done, said Emperor Reven. He gestured at Dr. Snowden and Emily. Step forward, Dr. Albert Snowden and Emily Snowden. I would speak with the both of you. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened as he stepped forward with Emily. He was only expecting to observe. You are human, but from Earth. It is unusual to see natives of a protected planet here, especially one from a civilization so young. Your role in this mission has been noted, and you have the appreciation of the Kriegen Star Empire. Do you have a request for Earth? Dr. Snowden swallowed hard and glanced at Andia, who circled her hand at him. He licked his lips. Um, well, I've heard of some illegal human trafficking from my planet. Not sure what can be done. But if it could be investigated, it would be appreciated. We will look into it. Anything else? Dr. Snowden looked at Emily, who shook her head. I think that will be it. Thanks. After an awkward silence, he looked at Andia and Emily, both whose eyes were widened. He gulped. Oh, um, my emperor. He bowed his head. Emperor Reven chuckled. It's okay. He gestured at Everin and V. Step forward, Everin and V. I wish to speak with both of you. Everin and V stepped forward. Emperor Reven gestured at Everin. There were some interesting accounts of events from the reports I read. The one event that stands out to me is that you spoke with the Great Selector, or one of them, according to the report. Yes, as you will be able to now as well. Emperor Reven scrutinized Everin. Your support in this endeavor has been noted, although I have a difficult time believing the accuracy of the report. However, the end result is clear. Do you have a request? I do. I request that I, Dr. Snowden, Emily, and V not be in the historical record for this. An interesting request. What is the reason? Everett nodded and glanced at Andia and Rakar. There was a bounty on us, and it may still be active. I do not want our names to be tied to this event to prevent future incidents with anyone else who might have been involved. Emperor Reven nodded. You wish to protect your friends. A noble gesture. He nodded at Hootis. Make sure these requests are fulfilled. Hootis nodded, then walked to the side of the platform. He returned carrying a tray with several rings on it. He handed a ring to Everin, Dr. Snowden, Emily, Andia, V, and Rakar. He then took his position by Emperor Reven. Emperor Reven gestured to them. These are Emperor Rings. They signify you have done a great service for the Empire. They come with the privileges and benefits associated with them, such as access to places like this. There are ceremonies to perform. 
Andia, recall. Your presence is requested at these ceremonies. Hootus will be in contact. Andia and Rakar bowed their heads. The guards motioned for everyone to clear a path down the center. Emperor Reven, Hootus, and the other blue and gold robed Kreekans walked down the center path, surrounded by guards. After a few moments, they had exited the building. Andia smiled. It's done! I can't believe it! Rakar shook his head. This is amazing! A master ranger! And I got to meet the Emperor! You know how rare that is? Everin half smiled. Congratulations to the both of you. Emily went over to Andia, who pulled her in and gave her a deep kiss. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened as his head jerked back. He looked at Rakar, who was laughing. He now understood why Rakar laughed every time he asked where Emily and Andia were. He shook his head and chuckled. Emily stepped back and stood next to Everin. Wow. Do I get one of those? Dr. Snowden asked Andia with a smile. Andia hugged Dr. Snowden, then pecked him on the cheek. That will have to do. Dr. Snowden shook Rakar's hand and then pulled him in and slapped him on the back with his left hand. You'll stay for the ceremonies, won't you? asked Andia. I'd like to. I also want to attend whatever funeral rites Kriegans do for Silva, said Dr. Snowden, looking at Everin. His throat tightened as he thought of how proud Silva would have been to have met the Emperor and partake in the ceremonies. Ricard nodded at Dr. Snowden, and Emily put her hand on his shoulder. Emily looked at Everin. We can stay for that and the ceremonies, right? Everin paused as he scrutinized his ARI. He placed his hand on his chin and then nodded. Of course. There is a matter we need to attend to, so we will have to make one trip sometime during our stay here. We can help with whatever it is, said Rakar, nodding at Andia. It is a personal matter. Dr. Snowden tilted his head, and then his eyes widened. He figured Everin was referring to the unusual behavior he and Emily had been experiencing. Oh, he glanced at Emily. Yeah, we will need to take care of that. Well, you can all stay at the Fedorian Embassy, said Andia. Rakar slapped Dr. Snowden on the back. You wanted to see Kriegis. We will show you Kriegis. He looked at Andia, who nodded. Great, I can't wait. Maybe this time we can do it without being hunted, said Dr. Snowden, looking at Emily, who wore a smile from ear to ear. Andia and Rakar laughed. Andia faced Everin. You know, we couldn't have done this without you, said Andia. Everyone looked at Everin. Everin surveyed the group. This is a very important milestone in human history for both planets, as well as this galactic region. The timeline has been stabilized, and the Fedorian destiny achieved. Everything is as it should be. The End Epilogue Dr. Snowden, Emily, Everin, and V had spent one week on Kriegis. They had attended the Cregan ritual for Silva, and the ceremonies were next week. Everin had assembled them in the conference room. So this next trip will take an hour? asked Dr. Snowden. Actually, more like five or six, but we can come back to this point in space one hour from now. Emily smiled. The advantages of the Torvada. Speaking of this trip, where are we going exactly? To see Jay. Dr. Snowden's lips parted and his eyes widened as he tilted his head at Emily. This is about the uncontrollable fear, right? Yes, but that is only part of it. It will be clear soon enough. I want to speak about it to all of you at once, said Everin. He nodded at V. Take us to Earth. Acknowledged. After a few minutes, the Torvada landed outside a trailer park in a nearby field. Everin, Dr. Snowden... Emily and V in orb mode exited the Torvada and walked toward the second trailer sitting nearest to the open field. 
a wooded area set behind the Torvada. They arrived at the steps to the front door of the trailer. Everin walked up and knocked on the door, then stepped back down. A voice rang out. Who is it? Everin. The sound of a tray hitting the floor and items being tossed about rang out. The sound of thudding footsteps approached the door. The front door swung open. Everin! Dr. Snowden! Emily! How the hell y'all been? asked Jay as he jumped down the steps and then shook Everin's hand. He pulled Dr. Snowden in for a handshake and a slap on the back and hugged Emily. We've been well. Your arm looks healthy, said Dr. Snowden. Jay waved his arm around. Ah, yeah. Glad to have this shit back, that's for damn sure. He cocked his head at Dr. Snowden. I wanted to come visit, but Everin said I should wait until he brought you all here. Who is it? said a female voice from inside the trailer. Those friends I told you about, said Jay, turning his head toward the door. He turned his head back around. That's Janet, my woman. Little one is tucked in for the night. Can I get you something to drink, a beer maybe? Actually, I require your presence for about one hour. Is that possible? Jay nodded vigorously. For you? Absolutely, man. Janet appeared in the doorway. She hesitated when she saw Everin. He does look like an alien. See? I wasn't making all that shit up. I need to visit his ship for about an hour. Everin eyed Jay. Hey, man. Apparently I talk in my sleep. It is okay. I suspected your wife would know at some point. Is she the only one? Yeah. Everin eyed Jay again. I'm serious, man. Janet peered out the door. Where's the ship at? Probably stealth in the field, right? Asked Jay. You are correct. Also, it is nice to meet you, Janet. Dr. Snowden and Emily waved at Janet. Nice to meet y'all. The place is a mess, but we have room if you want to come in. Can't, babe. They need me for something. Should be back in an hour, said Jay. Janet shook her head. Whatever. You better not be going out drinking. Dr. Snowden chuckled. We won't be doing any drinking. You have my word on that. Okay, said Janet. She drew her lips down and bobbed her head, then closed the door. Come, said Everin, as he turned and then walked off toward the Torvada with Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Jay in tow. Dr. Snowden and Emily filled Jay in on the Archeron, the events and their involvement in them on the way to the Torvada. They reached the stealth Torvada and walked up the ramp and then into the medical lab. Jay looked around. Ah, been a while since I've seen this place. Where's old Blue Ball? V walked in the room in body mode. I am here. Blue Ball, said Jay, as he slapped V on the back. You're looking all shiny and shit as always, Emily giggled. Everin had walked into one of the rooms and returned carrying a device. He placed it on the table and gestured for Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Jay to come over. They assembled around the table. This was given to me by the Crotivore. It is a nanobot extraction device. Jay smiled. So I can get these things out of me then? Finally? You want them out? asked Dr. Snowden. Jay nodded. Something weird, man. Can't put my finger on it. But every now and then, I feel off. Almost scared. Emily narrowed her eyes. Same for me and Uncle Albert. Everett also said that I will age slow. I don't want to outlive my wife and kid. Understandable, said Dr. Snowden. I can remove them from you, Jay. However, there is a reason you all have been feeling a bit off. When Sanjay was killed on the Crotovore ship, the nanobots, in an effort to preserve his consciousness, uploaded it to the nearest nodes, he said, pointing at them. You three. It split in evenly, a third to each. However, since it could not do a full copy, it has begun to deteriorate. I would say it is about twenty percent in each of you now. Why didn't you tell us this before? asked Dr. Snowden. I was not sure what the effect would be. I can remove Jay's completely, so he should be okay. But you expressed an interest in keeping yours. While this device can remove the consciousness, I do not know what will happen. Better to do it when we have time, and not in the middle of hunting the Archeron. So Sanjay has been lurking in us since his death? asked Emily. 
Yes, and it is about at the threshold where it will try to merge with the host's behavior. At that point, it would be permanent. Jay snorted. Fuck that shit. Dr. Snowden shook his head. So the fear, spicy food cravings and all that stuff popping into our heads was Sanjay. For the most part, yes. His consciousness acted like a second processing unit for your mind. You will retain the knowledge, just not the associated behavior. Jay tapped his arm. Let's get this shit rolling then. Everin nodded and gestured for Jay to take a seat next to the table. After Jay was seated, Everin attached a band around Jay's arm. The band was hooked up to the device by a tube. Everin interacted with the device, which lit up. After a few moments, it shut off. Feeling a bit lightheaded, said Jay. That is expected. The nanobots had become a part of your body. The ones that were free-floating have been removed. The others will be flushed out of your system in the next few days. Jay laughed. You mean my crap's gonna be shiny? Everin tilted his head. Something like that. He took the band off Jay's arm and then gestured for him to get off the chair. He gestured for Dr. Snowden to take a seat. After Dr. Snowden sat on the chair, Everin attached the band, then interacted with the device. It lit up and then after a few moments, it shut off. He removed the band. Dr. Snowden stood up and put his hand on his stomach. Oh, feel nauseous. That too will pass, said Everin. Emily, do you want the nanobots completely removed, or just the consciousness? Emily pursed her lips and glanced at Dr. Snowden. Just the consciousness removed. I see the value in having the nanobots now after this last adventure. Everin nodded. Take a seat then. Emily sat on the chair. Everin put the band on her arm and interacted with the device. It lit up and shut down after a few moments like with Dr. Snowden and Jay. He removed the band. You should all be feeling normal in a few days. Sanjay's consciousness is now residing on Jay's old nanobots in this device. It will deteriorate rapidly. Sanjay's gonna die again? asked Jay. It's technically not Sanjay in the flesh and blood sense, but an echo of who he was. I am going to tie it out to the hollow room and guide him to his final moments. Emily drew her lips flat. So, he will be going back into a virtual simulation? Dr. Snowden narrowed his eyes. Almost a reverse of our awakening. Everin picked up the device. I will be back. Wait a minute, man. I think we should see this. We can at least honor him by being present, said Jay. Everin paused and tilted his head. Very well. Follow me. They followed Everin as he exited the medical lab and entered the hollow room. Everin set the device on the ground, then pressed a few buttons on his ARI. I have set each of you as a non-interacting entity. He will not be able to see you. Emily grabbed Dr. Snowden's arm as the room changed into the medical lab. She inhaled sharply and her eyes misted when Sanjay appeared, lying on one of the slabs, with Everin standing next to him. Sanjay's eyes opened, and he squinted several times. He caught sight of Everin and sat up. He took a deep breath. Everin, what happened? Everin nodded. You got knocked out, but we were able to make it to my ship. Sanjay looked around. It's very cool looking. He narrowed his eyes. Where are the others? Did they make it too? Yes, I have taken them to Earth already. Good. I really like Dr. Snowden. I think we would be great friends. Dr. Snowden's throat tightened as he drew his lips flat. I think Emily and Jay will be good friends too. They were a bit rough on me, but I deserved it, said Sanjay. Jay was trying to tell me something, but I don't remember. He was apologizing for snapping at you. Oh, said Sanjay, bobbing his head. He didn't have to do that. He is a good man, I can tell. He protects others. Jay rolled his head back and forth while running a hand through his hair. He clenched his jaw. Sanjay squinted and took a deep breath. Feel a bit odd. It will pass. The Torvada is by your car now. The environment changed. 
Sanjay was dressed and standing by his car. Everin stood a bit off to the side. Sanjay looked around for a moment and scanned the environment while shaking his head. He exhaled through his mouth. Can't even remember getting here. I hope this isn't permanent. You will be fine in a few days. I will come to visit you in three months from this date. We can then catch up, and if you have any issues or questions, we can address them then. Sanjay nodded. I'd like that. Looking forward to seeing the others? Give it three months so I can make sure they are okay first. We can all meet up afterward. Okay, said Sanjay as he shook Everin's hand. He got in his car. The environment changed. It showed Sanjay driving his car and then parking in front of a house. He ran up to the door and rang the doorbell. A middle-aged Indian man opened the door. Sanjay rushed forward and hugged the startled man. Dad! Son! Is everything okay? Asked Sanjay's dad. It is now, said Sanjay, as he cried into his dad's shoulder. Tears ran down Emily's face as her lips drew down. Aw, oh, shit, man, said Jay as he ran his hands over his mouth. He rubbed his wet eyes with his forearm. The environment changed again, showing Sanjay and his family at the dinner table, laughing and having a good time. The environment changed again, showing Sanjay playing peekaboo with a little girl in the living room. Dr. Snowden took off his glasses and rubbed his puffy eyes as his chest tightened. The environment changed to a college building with steps on the outside. Everin sat on the steps as Sanjay sat next to him. I was wondering what time he would come, said Sanjay as he sat next to Everin. He squinted and then took a deep breath. Been having a hard time focusing. I don't think I'm getting better. Give it time, said Everin. Sanjay nodded. So tired. His breathing went ragged as he leaned against Everin's arm. Feel like I could just pass out. I will be here for as long as you need me, said Everin, putting an arm around Sanjay. Jay shuddered as tears streamed down his face. Sanjay smiled. Thanks. I owe you. He began to fade, then dissipated into a cloud of nanobots. The environment changed back to its default white walls and flooring. Dr. Snowden trembled as he put his right hand on his forehead. Emily put her shaking arms around his waist and buried her face in his chest. Her breathing went haphazard as she let loose a river of tears. Jay walked over and hugged them both. Everin, with narrowed eyes and lips drawn flat, walked up and put his arms around Dr. Snowden. Emily and Jay. This has been The Fredorian Destiny, Book 2 of the Everin Chronicles, written by Adair Hart, narrated by Michael Pauley, copyright 2015 by Adair Hart, production copyright 2016 by Adair Hart.